Okay, um, let's go ahead and get started while, while we're waiting. Um, if you haven't turned your papers in, yo, hey, so if you haven't turned your papers in, there will be a chance to do it after class. Don't panic. Um, and uh, this is Jack's, this is Mark's, and this is Nina's. Okay. Um, congratulations, first paper done. Yay. Um, there's some announcements that people wrote up on this far end about fraternities. I don't um, allow announcements of that sort to be in class because they proliferate and we end up spending more and more time on that. Um, but it's fine if you have something you want to write on the board up in this corner. You're always welcome to do that unless that gets out of hand. So, um, Nina, do you have any announcements? Yay, yay, everybody's settled. Okay, um, today what you'll see up on the board, this is just for your information, it's also in your book, but it's just to get a sense of when things were written that I'll either be referring to or that we'll be reading. Um, and then today, I've reversed things a little bit, down here is the actual outline for what I'll be talking about. So today we, we will move from Tocqueville to Marx, and I promise you that if you are feeling sick of Tocqueville, you'll miss him soon, <laughs> because he's very pleasant to read. Even if it was a lot of reading, it's really easy to, you know, be with him. He says a sentence, he writes a sentence in French, it's translated for you to English, you pretty much know what he's talking about, you might have to read it twice, it might be great depths and ramifications, but you get it. With Marx, it's going to be trickier, and I'll talk today about why. It may feel in our move from Tocqueville to Marx that we're literally reading in a different genre, that, that we've just gone from one extreme end of the field we call political theory to the other. Tocqueville writes in large, sweeping, unspecified terms about democracy. Equality, liberty, power, and much more. He doesn't stipulate his terms very often. He doesn't define them very often. He doesn't tell you with philosophical precision or propositional forms of argument what he's doing. On the other hand, what Tocqueville does do is treat all of these things, liberty, equality, democracy, power, and much more, as political values or practices that have to be finely tuned and delicately balanced. As if one was scoring a difficult piece of music or putting together an incredibly complex and perfectly balanced dish or meal where everything has to be prepared and attended to with great care and precision and precise intermixing. So there's in Tocqueville, what one might call a sociological but also a literary quality, there's a tendency to be evocative and be concerned with affect, with feeling, with emotions, with orientation, with pathos, with the making of people and their concerns. There are subtleties in all of this in the quality of his thought, but also subtleties of this sort in political life as he understands it. So the way that he thinks and what he's trying to tell you about politics mirror each other to a certain degree. As we move to Marx, we are in a radically different universe. Marx will be, among other things, attending very closely to that capitalist organization of society that I said last time Tocqueville has trouble specifying, has trouble naming. He knows it's there, he's wrestling with it all the time, but it's not front and center in the theory. It will be front and center eventually in Marx's theory. Moreover, 
Marx is writing about thinkers and conversations, especially in this first piece that we're reading by him. Thinkers and conversations that we don't know very well, if at all. He's inside a discourse and a set of arguments that is not ours. He's going to carry on about Hegel and the young Hegelians and Bruno Bauer and St. Max and German ideology and critical criticism and all kinds of other things where we will have no clue what he is talking about. I'm going to try to help you with that, and so are your GSIs. I've long thought it would do a great service to undergraduate life if we could take the essay on the Jewish question, which by the end of this week I hope to convince you is really worth the slog, and just transliterate it into contemporary, straightforward concerns, keeping Marx's points, but sort of trying to get rid of wherever we could the uh, stray references and um, arguments that don't make sense to us. Hasn't been done, or at least hasn't been done well yet. There's another feature of Marx worth noting, which is that he all argues with a ferocious logic and inside of a philosophical set of terms that will be very unfamiliar and maybe off-putting at first. He's pounding away at something, but you don't even know what he's pounding away at, so you kind of want to just step away from the fight. It's important also to realize that Marx's initial aim, what he's initially doing in the piece that you're reading first, is offering critique, not prescription, and not description. And I'm going to say much more about critique in a few minutes. So a very different enterprise than what Tocqueville was doing. He's offering critique, not prescription and not description. He's trying to think through a problem and think through what the problem represents about the world as a whole and think through the way others have thought about the problem and get at something. He's trying to do that kind of work. So, more generally what I'm trying to get at is there are some initial difficulties in reading Marx that we really have to just name and struggle with. There's the intrinsic difficulty. He's writing from and against a very difficult philosophical tradition, which I will introduce you to very briefly today. That tradition is best known as German idealist philosophy. And I'll explain idealism as quickly as I can in a little while. German idealist philosophy, at its head stands Hegel. So he's, he's, he's wrestling inside this, um, this philosophical tradition. And that tradition itself is full of obscure terms and dense formulations and lots of unknown references. So we've got layer upon layer. Marx is fighting with people who in turn are fighting with people or who in turn are wrestling with terms that just aren't ours. A second intrinsic difficulty with Marx, though, takes us in a very different direction. We mostly think we know what Marx stands for. He's the thinker in this class that if somebody said, oh, you're studying Karl Marx, you're going to be reading communism. You're going to be studying communism. You're going to be studying violent revolution. And we bring those presuppositions about communism, about somebody we imagined advocated violent revolution, we bring these to our reading, and we expect to find them confirmed there. And the first thing you're going to experience when you read the Jewish question, you were supposed to read it already, but let's face it, you are finishing your papers. When you read the Jewish question today, right before section, you will um, not find that stuff there. So it's going to be very bewildering. That said, it's important to note why Marx looms so large in our consciousness. Marx had possibly more influence than any other single thinker in modern history. The Communist Manifesto, the Manifesto for a Communist Party, which we'll be reading next week, follows only the Bible in terms of the number of the people in the world who have read it. That's quite a thing to comprehend. Moreover, versions of Marxism, not necessarily Marxists, have formed the basis for governments and societies and economies of over one-third of the world's people for over 50 years during the 20th century. 
obviously in Eastern Europe, the area we used to call the Soviet Union, Russia and many nations to the south, but also China, Cuba, but also various nations in Africa, certain nations in Latin America, and South Asia. In addition to forming the basis of government and society and economy for all these places, Marxism has had enormous influence in non-communist spaces and places, affecting everything from politics and political parties, communist parties and socialist parties, alive today, for example, in most nations in Europe, but also affecting things like literary criticism, religion, journalism, and also affecting some very concrete gains or concrete, let's call them, uh, features of our daily life today that we sometimes forget are the product of socialist agitation and or direct communist um, organizing, including social security and pensions and paid holidays and the five-day work week or what we call the weekend. Now all of this all of this history and all of this presumption that we know what's here and that we know what Marxism is and that the world has tried it and it has been a disaster or a totalitarian failure or it never was tried right, but that's another matter. Whatever your presumption, this can be problematic for our reading because we bring all this presumption and assumption and impulses that I want to suggest you do your very best to clear away as you read him. Not because the point is to just submit to what he thinks, but because it won't help you in your reading of him. It would be best to just push it off the table if you can and just try to figure out what he's doing. The last intrinsic difficulty I want to mention in encountering Marx before I talk a little about his uh, biography is that his thought changed quite significantly over the course of his own life. And I've given you a little bit of a sense of what gets called early Marx and late Marx. Um, the extreme is what we're reading this week, and Das Kapital, his opus on um, capitalism that he writes in the last quarter of his life. And he's, a, he's, a, he's not a radically different political person across that time, but his own thinking about what's important and what to emphasize and what um, counts in understanding political life really does shift pretty significantly over those times. So I'll be trying to mark this as we go. I will do my very best to teach him by opening, by, by opening the work up, by, by assuming that you don't know him and um, trying to help you understand uh, what, what, what it is that Marx thought and what of his thought might be um, useful in, in thinking about political life today, just as we did with Tocqueville. So, Marx was born in 1818 in Trier, Germany. His father was a pretty well-off lawyer. Uh, the family was a family of assimilated Jews, that is Jewish by birth but not by practice. Marx was sent to study law, as almost all assimilated Jews and fairly rich sons of lawyers were, um, in Bonn. He hated it or just wasn't very serious about it. He drank and caroused a lot in college. Um, so there's a future for you if that's been your past. Um, then he went to Berlin to finish his degree because um, he did, did kind of get interested in a few things toward the end of the Bonn period. Um, and Berlin was a very exciting place then as now. It was just rich with new philosophical and religious ideas and debates and these began to engage him. Well, he came back to Bonn to teach, but by then he had become known as something of a radical and an atheist, and so he couldn't get a post. Still very young, he began, still living off his father, to study philosophy in a serious way. And this is where he did begin to get kind of serious about um, becoming a thinker. And this work was going to shape his intellectual life. He focused on Hegel and the Hegelians, more about them shortly. Um, and this was a period of real radicalization for Marx. He hung out with a bunch of young Hegelians, as they were called at the time, 
Uh, but he wasn't entirely at ease with them. He thought there was something kind of armchair intellectualish about them, that they had a lot of criticisms and a lot of opinions and a lot of views, but he wasn't really convinced they were getting to the nub of the matter. In 1842, at the age of 24, he took a position with a left-wing newspaper, and this was going to become routine for him to try to kind of get by as a journalist, and he soon became the editor, and he devoted himself in the paper to, to disseminating some um, kind of left-wing uh, ideas of both a philosophical as well as political sort. The paper was shut down after about a year of Marx at the helm um, by the government. And that, too, is going to become routine. In 1843, he married uh, the daughter of a rich Prussian family, and he moved to Paris and there co-edited another left-wing magazine. Um, and you can see the intellectual motivation and idea for that magazine in the very first little three-page thing you were assigned called The Letter to Rouge. He's describing what he's hoping for in, in that magazine. That job didn't work out so well either. They, they never did for Marx. But in Paris, his radicalism be continued to deepen as a consequence now of his engagement with some French socialists and also some Russian anarchists. So those became his kind of compatriots and interlocutors in Paris. And in, in Paris is also where he met Friedrich Engels, who would become his lifelong collaborator and friend. For the next five years or so, Marx really was hounded from one place to the next. The Prussian government, pressured France to expel him, which it did in um, 1845. And um, he went to Brussels then, where he lasted about three years. And then he returned to Germany during the revolution of 1848. And he set up another newspaper, the New Rhenish Gazette, with Engels. And at the same time was commissioned by the Communist League to write the manifesto for a communist party. That is what we call the communist manifesto. In 1849, though, at the age of 31, he was expelled again, this time as a stateless person. At this point, Marx went to the one place that would have him, namely England, London, um, where he pretty much remained for the rest of his life. He was extremely poor. Three of his children died for lack of medical care or medicine. He had no real steady income producing work. Uh, he was largely supported by his journalism, a combination of his journalism, a little bit of inheritance from his parents, and Engels. He tried to get a job with the railroad, um, but this was not successful because of apparently his miserable handwriting. We're just going to wait for that to go away. It's going to go away in a minute. <laughs> it went away. She's embarrassed. OK. So what did Marx do? He spent his days reading and writing at the British Library. You can go to this day in the British Museum. I'm sorry, British Museum Library. You can go and see where Marx sat and wrote his commission journalism as well as worked on Capital. He spent the last quarter of his life writing the three volumes that we have today as Das Kapital. He died at the age of 65 in 1883. Okay, now we need to back up a little bit because we have a picture of Marx writing the Manifesto for a Communist Party at the age of 26, developing a career that, that can be understood as the unfolding of left-wing and more specifically communist ideas throughout his life. But now we need to grasp the specifically philosophical development of his ideas through a little bit of a different trajectory, that of Hegel and the Hegelians in his youth. It's this encounter that we can hold responsible for the extremely difficult character of his <coughs> writing in the early essays. Uh, and for the particular nature of his critiques of, his, of society, his obsession with a critique of religion, 
a critique of the state, a critique of what he will call bourgeois constitutionalism, what we might call emerging liberal democracy, his critique of thought and ideology. He's going to do critiques of all of those things before he finally gets on to the idea of capitalism as the really important object of critique. He's going to make his way, in other words, toward what will eventually be a wholesale engagement with political economy. But in what you're reading over the next week and a half, which is really interesting material and really useful for political theory, he's not there yet. He's, 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 he's engaged in critiques of other things, the state, rights, religion, and so forth. And as I'll say in a minute in more depth, by critique I don't mean rejection. I mean, he's trying to understand them. He's trying to get at the premises of them. He's trying to understand their manifestation in his time. Put this point another way, Marx is wrestling with concepts in the early years, like property and freedom and the state. But he's doing so in language that he's eventually going to abandon. It's a Hegelian language, a language of estrangement and consciousness and alienation, species being, and other terms that we'll have to try to figure out as we move along. Moreover, he's struggling with these things, the engagement with consciousness and religion and the state and its relationship to civil society, the limited nature of what he calls political emancipation or political freedom his critique of rights, he's struggling with all of these things without a clear alternative. As we're encountering him in these first couple of essays, he's not a communist yet, and he's not just a, 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 a clear opponent of capitalism. That has not happened. And instead, what Marx is doing with regard to communism is kind of keeping his distance a little bit. There are a lot of communist ideas circulating in Europe. He didn't invent it. And he mostly thinks that they're onto something, but in a kind of misguided way. So he's keeping his distance. He doesn't think they're really resolving the lack of freedom or equality or the alienation and the exploitation that he's trying to specify in his critiques. So what do we mean by critique? What does it mean to say that instead of formulating a prescription or a description, Marx is engaged in the work of critique. This is a huge topic, um, one that I'm only going to give you a minute on. Um, it's one I happen to be particularly interested in because I'm writing a book on it right now, but I promise I won't lay all that on you. Um, what, we're, what we just need to know is this. Marx is going to offer critiques both of modes of thinking, modes of representing problems, and the problems themselves. And he's going to relate all three. He's going to relate certain ways of thinking, certain ways of representing problems, and the problems themselves. And these will range from why democracy can't live up to its promise of true equality, true universality, true liberty for all human beings. Or the failure of the political revolutions, for example, in France, to deliver real emancipation when that's what they were supposed to do. Or the place and play of religion in society Why, how and why freedom of religion is often proclaimed but can't really made, be made true, or why there are states that still call themselves Christian states, why they can't live without that supplement in Europe, or why those Christian states aren't really representing Christianity as such but something else. And he's also just going to try to get at the question of freedom what human beings are asking for in the way of emancipation in this incredibly heady period that we've just seen Tocqueville also try to grapple with, and what they can't quite grasp, what they can't quite get. These critiques, these engagements with freedom and religion and the state, 
many more things. Help Marx figure out what the current lay of the land is, what current political, economic, and social life consists in, what, what powers constrain and limit democracy, but also, in his view, what real democracy might consist in, what, what might be the stuff of real democracy. So let me say a little more about critique itself. This is a practice that he borrows from the Hegelians. It's a strange lecture. I have to keep backing up into my next topic. So we haven't gotten to the Hegelians yet, but I'm going to. But first, I'm going to tell you something he borrows from them. So he borrows this from the Hegelians, but he makes it his own. And this practice involves thinking through a problem, first of all, by thinking through the limitations of how others have thought about the problem. So part of what he's doing in On the Jewish Question is saying, OK, this Bruno Bauer guy, how does he think about the question of whether Jews should be enfranchised in a Christian state? OK, this other guy, how does he think about it? Or popular opinion, how does it think about it? So thinking through a problem by thinking through the limitations of how others have conceived it. And it involves thinking about the reason that a particular problem manifests itself when it does. Part of what Marx is asking about the Jewish question is, why is it emerging? What's the issue? Why, why now, why here, are we wrestling with the question of whether Jews should or should not be enfranchised as full citizens in a European state? Why is that our question now? What does it signify that is broader than the question itself? And why can't we resolve it? What's the contradiction in the existing nature of political and social and economic life that keeps us from being able to settle it? Now, importantly, what I've already tried to suggest is that critique is not mere criticism or rejection or debunking. It's not. So to critique something, and Marx doesn't use it as a verb, but to engage, it, engage in a critique, to do a critique, is not the same thing as criticizing, despite the fact that it's tr translated sometimes as criticism. Rather, it's a close and systematic analysis of a theoretical formulation or a social formation or a political problem, or a political debate, to try to get at, so it's a close and systematic analysis of one of these things, to try to get at the premises and the predicates, presuppositions, the premises of this social formation or political problem that, that others may not be aware of. It's to try to get at what's producing the thing, what the thing is standing on, what, even if it's wrong, its wrongness may symptomatize or represent. So I've said a mouthful, and I'm just going to say it again. Critique involves a close and systematic analysis, for Marx, of, of a theoretical formulation or a political problem or a debate or something like that, to try to get at the premises and the predicates that it's standing on that may not be available within its ordinary self-description, to understand what those premises and predicates are, what they tell you about the problem, but also to understand what the problem symptomatizes or represents that is larger than itself. And I'll be saying this a number of times. Marx finally isn't that interested in the Jewish question as such. He's really excited about what it's teaching him about constitutional democracy. Why constitutional democracy cannot easily make good on its claim to be universal, to grant equality and freedom to all. It's teaching him about that. It's teaching him about the political state. It's teaching him about the relationship of the state to civil society. It's teaching him about the relationship of religion to modern political life. It's not that he doesn't want Jews enfranchised. He probably does. But that's not what's driving him. What's, what he's interested in is how this debate represents a larger problem in 
political life. And I would say, you know, on some level, all of us who are interested in politics do this to some degree. I don't know how many of you followed the uh, big retrospectives on 9-11 over the weekend. It was pretty hard to miss. Um, and the New York Times had just pages and pages in everything, and it's New York Times Magazine, and it's Week in Review, and so on and so forth. And I, you know, it was one thing to read those retrospectives. It was another thing to read those retrospectives as a certain kind of commentary on who we are now that they couldn't always themselves manifest. And I'm suggesting that's partly what Marx is doing with critique. He's always trying to read beyond the way the world presents itself to the question of what premises, what predicates are presenting a problem and also what contradictions the problem itself might manifest that are larger than the specific issue. I want to push this point just a little further. Marx is convinced very early on that there's a crucial link between the way a problem is posed and the problem itself. And it's a link that only critique can reveal. So he's going to treat the way that the Jewish question is posed, about which more shortly, as, as, a, as a crucial part of the problem he wants to study. He doesn't think problems pose themselves in just one way. They're posed through a particular language in a particular frame, and that is, for him, something really important to watch out for. He also believes something else about critique, and this is his progressivism. He is another one of our guys who believes the world is progressing towards something better, more rational, more free, more equal, and so forth. He believes that there is a relationship between a particular problem or contradiction, let's say the question of whether Jews should or shouldn't be included as citizens in a state that proclaims universal equality and freedom and enfranchisement, he believes that critique will reveal the world that is straining to come into being. Now, if you really do critique right, you'll be able to see what we're trying to become that we can't always see for ourselves. Now, I'm emphasizing all of this because among the other presuppositions that we often bring to Marx is the idea that he's a dogmatist that he has really dogmatic views about things. You know, let's have violent revolution, let's have communism, smash the state, imperialism's bad, the proletariat's good, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, dogma is, for Marx, what critique must open up, what critique must explore, and do so in an undogmatic way. As Marx says, and I'm just quoting from one little passage of the letter to Rouge, page 13, Rather than attempt dogmatically to prefigure the future, we must find the new world only through critique of the old. That's just page 13. So we must find the new world. What world is trying to come into being? What world is straining against existing constraints by class, by state formation, by something else? What world is trying to come into being? Critique as he often puts it, helps us see how the existing state of things is in contradiction with itself. For example, how proclamations about freedom and equality and their universal reach can exist side by side in liberal democracies with lived unfreedom and inequality. That contradiction really interests Marx. He's really interested in the claim of constitutional democracies to provide universal freedom, to provide universal equality, to include all human beings by virtue of their simply being human, and yet to manifest inequality and unfreedom throughout. He's not condemning them for merely being hypocritical. He's interested in what it is about constitutional democracy that, that holds that contradiction, structures that contradiction, and he also believes that the proclamation of the yearning for freedom, equality, universality is what we really want, is what human beings are really straining to fulfill. So the question here would be, what would eliminate this contradiction? What would get rid of the fact that a liberal democratic society proclaims universal equality and, and features rampant inequality Marx is trying to figure out what holds that contradiction together and what would solve it. 
Now, these convictions about the relationship of thought to world, how we think and how the world's organized, and these convictions about studying contradictions in thought and world, exciting as I'm trying to make them seem, they're also what make his work so hard going at first. Because he's working through dense philosophical formulations. It's not like he just believes that what the person on the street thinks is important. He thinks what Hegel and Bauer and all these other guys who are talking in what will sound to you like nonsense, what they think, he thinks what they think represents some manifestation of the world as it is. And he's, he's struggling through their dense formulations to understand what they're reflecting about the world and what finally has to be done to and in the world to make it come out as the world that is being yearned for. Okay, so that's my introduction on critique. All I really wanted to say here was don't treat it as rejection, don't treat it as debunking, don't treat it as, 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 as um, mere criticism. It has these important features of being both a way of trying to get to the premises and the predicates of things, of trying to relate thought and material reality, and of trying to identify the world that's straining to come into being, the, the, the progressive future. Now what I need to do is talk more specifically about Hegel and the Hegelians. We don't read them in here. Um, for various reasons, we have so many other people to read. But let's start with George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Who was he and why is he so important? He is, I think, without question, the most important philosopher of the modern period in European history. He was brilliant. He was erudite. He was conservative. He was very original. And he was very, very difficult, even in his own time. I mean, just difficult to read. He was the reigning philosopher of Marx's time and place. You couldn't do philosophy without engaging or encountering the work of Hegel. He had enormous influence, and he had a range of intellectual offshoots, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. They ranged from political right to political left. So even though my own reading of Hegel is that he's a fairly, what I call briefly, conservative thinker, there were left Hegelians who found ways to make him into something else. You can't capture his arguments in a few minutes. What we can do is characterize a couple of elements of his thought really crudely that intrigued Marx and that Marx is going to rework and make into his own. And I need to identify these for you. They are first dialectics, second idealism, and thirdly, nothing so short, really, the belief that the world can be accounted through these two notions, through the relationship of dialectics and idealism. Okay, so what do we have here in really synoptic terms? Dialectics. Dialectics has many meanings across the history of political theory and philosophy. Above all, for Hegel, importantly, it's opposed to metaphysics. Oh, the terms we will learn in here. And metaphysics, of course, literally refers to a scheme above the physical world. Your most <coughs> frequent encounter with so-called metaphysical reality is in things like metaphysical bookstores that are spread around Berkeley and other places like this that refer to astrological or spiritual ways of understanding what the world is. But before that particular incarnation of metaphysics, we're just talking about a schema, a conceptual schema, above physics, above the physical world, that explains its order and meaning, explains what we are and who we are and why we are. Now, Hegel's problem with metaphysical accounts of human reality was above all that they are usually inherently unchanging accounts. 
metaphysical accounts don't usually have a principle of change. They usually can explain how things are, but not how they change, or how that change is itself part of what things are. So Hegel really chafed against metaphysics and instead seized upon the idea of dialectics, which comes to us from the Greek dialogue, meaning to argue or to contest or to contend between two, usually, and so to arrive at the truth. Hegel believed that what makes humanity develop, what makes history happen, is the struggle between opposites or contraries. And the opposites or contraries that he had in mind were big idea formations, especially religions and other reigning systems of ideas. So, for example, Christianity and Judaism, or Italian Renaissance humanism and French Catholic Tudor monarchy, and what he called simply the Orient. So he's not talking about the struggle between rich and poor, or colonized and colonizer, or women and men. That, that's where Marx is going to enter. He's going to take over this idea of struggle as moving history, but with, with Hegel, it's struggles, the struggle that moves history is between ideas. Ideas that challenge each other. And some of you may know there's a famous Hegelian formulation, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. I don't want to go too much into that because it's, it's very easy to turn it into um, a, a wrong version of what Hegel's up to. But, but, but the basic idea is that there's an idea, there's a counter idea, and then there's a third <coughs> possibility, a synthesis that takes and incorporates those two contraries into a new order of ideas, a new reigning idea. Now, to see the implications of this, we need to get the second concern of Hegel's that I said we need to talk about onto the table, namely ideas themselves or idealism. So we've talked about dialectics, struggle between contraries, contradiction between them or the contrast between them produces a struggle that produces uh, another possibility forward in history. Idealism. Idealism here is not utopianism. It's not what we mean when we say, oh, she's such an idealist. She believes in the goodness of humankind. It rather is a philosophy which holds that ideas are what create, order, and move the human world. Ideas affect changes in history. So, was that a hand? Yeah. It's a philosophy that holds that ideas are what create and order and move human history. Ideas change the world. On some level, we all believe this. Hegel took it pretty far, but on some level, for example, we'll say, oh, yeah, people used to believe in slavery. We know better than that now. We don't do that. Or, yeah, until, you know, sometime you pick your favorite benchmark, there was a pretty common belief in the natural superiority of men over women or the natural separation of spheres that kept women in a subordinated place. That's been rejected, at least by some, and so we have different ideas now. And that is why we have a different looking classroom than we might have had 100 years ago. So this idea is not so foreign to us. But Hegel had a fairly extreme notion of it. Most ordinary liberals, I'm saying, uh, liberals in the, uh, in the big classical sense, subscribe to idealism in some way or another. We, we, always, we all believe that ideas are what motivate and change and form the basis of human organization. So, so we do tend to subscribe to the idea that, you know, better ideas replace worse ideas, that's progress, democratic belief replace non-democratic belief, secularism replace the idea of religious orthodoxy in politics. All of those are formulations that place the emphasis on a shift in ideas 
that shifts history itself, that changes history. Now, if we stay with this idea for a second, it means when we, when we think of ourselves as idealists in that sense, if we find something wrong in society, a prejudice or a convention that we dislike, we often rely on some combination of argument and education as a counter idea to, to change it. So we worry, for example, about say, racism or bullying or homophobia in the elementary schools. And so we bring people in to teach the kids that all those things are wrong. We're trying to change their ideas, and we imagine that will change the way that people act, conduct themselves, and change, in turn, history itself. Or, to just push this level up a little, uh, push this up a level, when we have a practice or an idea or, or a practice in society that we object to, we sometimes think we need a different law for it. So um, whether it's desegregation or whether it's um, progressive taxation or going another direction, deregulation, we imagine that what we're doing is changing history, changing society by changing the law, which embodies a different idea. Okay. So we have a sense of idealism. Now we need to put idealism and dialectics together, Hegel's idealism. Hegel's idealism depends upon treating conflicts between ideas as producing world historical change. I'll say it again. Conflicts between major regimes of ideas, as I said before, like Judaism and Christianity or various um, or, 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 or various uh, different practices in Europe or outside Europe, major regimes and ideas, conflicts between them pr produce world historical change, making new orders, like the order that follows the French Revolution. People got, get the idea that Tudor monarchy and feudalism and aristocracy is no longer acceptable. They, they have that idea in their head, they fight for it, they bring about a new order. Successively, then, the idea is this brings about new orders of ideas, whether between monarchists and aristocrats or monarchists and democrats, and that makes a new political, social, religious order on earth. So Hegel's philosophy of history tracks the emergence of opposing ideas and their effect on human, social, political, and religious development. And Hegelians often understood themselves as needing to engage in the practice of criticizing existing ideas, including existing laws embodying ideas, in order to bring about political reform. All right, so from Hegel we have this formulation. Again, I told you it was like the crude, crude, crude sub-Wikipedia version of it. It's a brilliant system that Hegel's developed. He offers a brilliant application of it. He's, his erudition is unmatched. He incorporates everything into it. It's worth a read if you ever have a year or two. But what we need to do is now talk about, it is, now what we need to do is talk about what Marx is going to do to it. Marx is a student of Hegel, not a direct student, but a student of the order in which Hegel is the dominant philosopher of the age. Marx is going to take a lot of Hegel's view over, including the notion that history progresses and that this progress is the result of dialectical conflict between opposites, including the idea that something moves history, in other words, that has to do with this uh, conflict between opposites. But he is going to challenge Hegel's idealism with materialism. And again, you have to throw out everything that you might think idealism is. I'm sorry, materialism. <laughs> We're done with that. Um, he's not referring to the fetish of things, material girl. He's not referring to um, obsession with goods, love of money, etc. 
Now we have another philosophy of history in which what moves history, what makes history, has to do with the organization of what Marx will call the material order of human existence, how humans actually live. Political economy or an economic order is its most reduced way of speaking about it. But what Marx wants to talk about is a larger, a larger way of thinking about this, which is the concrete organization and production for human existence. And we'll be studying this in detail when we get to the German ideology. And what Marx is going to argue is that changes in this material order, which will also have certain conflicts in them, there'll be class conflicts, will produce a new order of existence. But they also produce everything else about our existence. The way we think, the kind of family form we have, the social uh, organizations and relations we have, and our ideas. So what we have is a um, related but absolutely opposite way of understanding what generates history. An idealist philosophy that says ideas posit everything from the way we think to what we do to how we form families to what our religions are, to what our social practices are, to what we value, what we esteem, what we care about, who we educate, and so forth. All this comes from ideas. And then we're going to have a thinker who say, mm, mm. it's all actually, history is moved, history is developed, and human history is, um, can be charted through the way in which human beings organize and arrange their mode of subsistence their economic life. Now, I don't expect you to buy either one yet, so I hope you haven't, because I'm trying to give slight caricatures to both, and all of you, being good Berkeley students, are saying, I want to hang out right here. This is where I want to be. <laughs> and that's not our challenge. Our challenge is to try to figure out what Marx is taking over from Hegel and what he's going to do such that you can read him when you start trying to read him this week. So Marx's position isn't going to make complete sense until we actually read the German ideology next week where he lays out materialism. But here's the preview. Marx thinks Hegel was really on to something with this dialectical account of history, the idea that the movement of history occurs as the result of opposites, of conflicts, that, that come directly into conflict with one another and then overthrow each other, essentially, and become something new, dragging bits of both along with them. But he thinks Hegel got the whole thing upside down. Rather than material existence being created by ideas, ideas are created or generated by specific material arrangements of life. So what Marx is going to try to do is, as he puts it, turn Hegel and Hegel's world right side up. He's going to reverse the relation that Hegel establishes between concrete human lives and social formations and political institutions and ideas. In idealism, ideas make the world go round. In materialism, material life makes the world go round. Marx, for example, will see constitutional democracy liberal democratic ideas about equality and freedom and everything else as emerging from the nature of contemporary capitalist production. That doesn't mean they're terrible. It just means that that's where he sees them coming from and what he sees them reflecting. So I'll just say that again because it's going to be important for you to understand the Jewish question. Constitutional democracy and liberal democratic ideas more generally about equality, about freedom, about universal inclusion, about representation, about rights. All those things he will see as emerging from a capitalist organization, an emerging capitalist organization of life. That's what brings those political forms into being. And that's what those political forms also reflect. Again, that doesn't mean Marx condemns those political forms out of hand. He's just trying to read them. He's trying to understand why they carry some of the contradictions and the 
possibilities that they carry. Similarly, Marx will see things like prejudice against the Jew, for example, not simply as bad attitude or anti-Semitism. He's going to see it as the expression of certain social relations, certain formations of the state and civil society that haven't yet realized the universality they claim they want to realize. One last point about Hegel and the Hegelians before we move into Marx. I'm going to give you a little introduction to Marx himself, and I want to make one last point about the Hegel, H Hegelians here. There are right Hegelians and left Hegelians. Hegel himself argued that human history's project of freedom, he believed that human history was driven by the project of freedom, it was just really slowly getting there, and of realizing freedom through this dialectical unfolding of reason on earth that was taking the form of various idea regimes clashing, he believed that that project of freedom had finally arrived, and where had it arrived? In the Prussian Empire and Christianity, the Christian state, his historical moment and place. There were Hegelians, though, who weren't quite so convinced of this, and that led to a split in his followers. So the right Hegelians believed that the existing world was true and rational and the completion of the project of history. For those of you interested, contemporary right Hegelian, self-identified as such, is Francis Fukuyama, end of history, believes we've arrived. Liberal democratic values are the truth of human history and the project of freedom, and they're finally, in the falling of, of, of the Berlin Wall and the end of, of the Soviet Union, they're finally conquering the earth, and that is where we are today. We have finally arrived at the end of history and um, the truth of human beings. Left Hegelians worry. Maybe the project of human freedom hasn't been completely realized. Maybe the rule of reason hasn't arrived on earth more development is needed, and they're busy still criticizing existing formations. Left Hegelians are the people Marx is hanging out with. They include Bauer, Feuerbach, other people he's talking about. They're the kind of hip political intellectual circles of Berlin and of Bonn. Marx starts as a left Hegelian, but he's also a little irritated by them. He knows there's something, as I said, a little bit overly clever and very intellectual about them. They don't really seem to get down to the nub of things. The right Hegelians are committed to the idea that the existing state, especially the existing Prussian state, makes you free. And if you don't feel free in it, if you're like, Jewish in a Christian state and that's making you a little nervous or deprivileged or maybe even overtly oppressed and excluded, that's a problem of consciousness, your consciousness, your religious belief and identity, and it's your problem to fix it. Get with the program. Become a Christian member of a Christian state. Get your head straight. Give up your religion. Give up your difference. Become Christian. And there were obviously views of that sort in debating about the Jewish question. Said, that's the problem. There shouldn't be Jews. There, there's some archaic, old, particular parochial religion. And we're, we're Christian states now, and that's what needs to happen. But left Hegelians had a different view. I said, look, a state should not be discriminating against people of different religions. The state needs to be reformed so that it is free of consciousness of religion, its consciousness needs to be fixed. It needs to make all men free. So, if you're experiencing discrimination or marginalization, we need to fix the state. We need to fix the ideas of the state. Make it indifferent to religion. Then, then the unfreedom that you're feeling will disappear. So, Let's go a little deeper into the Jewish question itself. 
That's our last move here. I'm not going to make it to number four today, but I, we need to go a little deeper into the Jewish question itself. What is the Jewish question in Europe at the time that Marx is engaging it? It's ubiquitous in Europe in the 19th century. And the question everywhere is, what should be the standing of Jews in European states, whether they are identified as Christian states or, as they are in the case of France, as secular states? If they are to be citizens, what kind of citizens? If Jews don't recognize the state's God, how can they be oath swearers? And if they don't recognize the state as something like a substitute for God, if they don't recognize the state as the rule of law that is first, foremost, primary, or only, and instead have a separate code of law that is the law to which they uh, have fealty, what do we do with them? How can they be citizens? If they recognize law that is higher than or other than the states, can they be citizens? Or the question we asked today, can they be president? That was a ubiquitous question when Joe Lieberman was a serious candidate for president. In the 19th century, there were basically three common views on these questions. The first, and th these are all the views in Marx's time, Jews can't be citizens. Why? Because they're not really universal men in the rights of man sense. They're Jews. They identify as Jews first and and not as humans or men first. In that sense, they represent something partial and parochial and particular. They're not citizens. They're not, they're not part of the rights of man. So how can they claim to be enfranchised in a state that is enfranchising on that basis? Second popular answer. They can be citizens if they'll give up their Jewishness as a public and political identity. That is, they have to give it up in the same way that we would ask anybody today to give up religion as a public political identity, except Rick Perry, which is reduce it to a private matter, a civic matter, a, a, a personal matter. Don't bring it into the public sphere. You are first an American, first a French person, first a German, first a Prussian. You have to adhere to state law over Jewish law wherever there is a conflict. Your first order of law must be the nation, and that means getting rid of the very idea of the Jewish nation and of, of Jewishness as a saturating identity. We call this today assimilation or um, simply adhering to a secular public-private split. So what do we have? First answer, can't be citizens. You're per particular and parochial and provincial. You can't, how can you be citizens if you have your identity as a Jew in a state that says you either have to be Christian or you have to be nothing if that's your first priority. Second, yeah, you can if you'll just like chill a little, give it up, make it, make it less important and stop being so um, Jewish about it. And the third, <laughs> my family crawls into these lectures sometimes. Um, <laughs> my mother used to say that. You don't have to be so Jewish here. <laughs> That was the assimilated anxiety. Okay, so the third, the state should give up all concern with religion, and especially it's Christianity, but also all concern with religion. The religious, then religious membership simply won't matter. So we have three possible positions. There's subsets of each of these, but those are the three possible positions. Now, let's go back to our left and right Hegelians. Bruno Bauer, the first guy that Marx takes on in your um, essay that you're going to read right after class, um, is a left Hegelian. And he, he kind of combines a couple of these that I just gave you. He combines two and three. He says, the state... It has to be secularized. It has to be divested of its religious position or affiliation. It shouldn't be in the business of being a religious state. But Jews also must give up Judaism as anything other than a private religious practice. Better, he says, they should give it up altogether because it's irrational, it's 
non-reason. There's a whole strain of Hegelians who believe that religion as a whole, the left Hegelians all believe that religion as a whole was really left over from an, an, a, a, an irrational era. But what do we have here? The state must give up its prejudice, its idea, and the Jew must give up her or his idea of being Jewish. State must give up its preoccupation with religion. In short, humans have to overcome or reduce, radically reduce the meaning of religion to be free in a free state, and the state has to do the same thing. And that's more or less where we are today with secularism, right? That's pretty much what we have. We have a formally secular state that officially does not care what religion you are and has no religion of its own. Those are the two constitutional clauses that matter in this business. Now, of course, we've got that under God stuff in the Pledge of Allegiance, and born-again Christianity is not widely viewed as incompatible with holding high office, whereas every other religion is. And we have a pretty big anxiety paroxysm going about Islam and so forth. But formally, we've got a secular state. And formally, religion is a private matter. It's up to you. It's not up to me to ask you about it. It's not up to you to have to put it out in the public life. It's something you pursue privately. Conflict, of course, comes about when this deal breaks down, not just when the state is engaged in something that looks a little more overtly Christian than it's supposed to, or when all school holidays fall on Christian holidays, but all other holidays, um, Muslim, Jewish, and others, are just incorporated into the regular public higher education school calendar, exams fall on them, and so forth. But also we have the problem when the Amish don't want to send their kids to school or when Muslim girls in France want to wear religious dress and the schools forbid it and so forth. At that moment, presumably, not only do we have the individual asserting more religious identity than this deal is supposed to permit, but the state is also revealing itself as more Christian than it's really supposed to be. So that's where the deal starts to not hold so well. Anyway, Bauer's position, which perfectly believes in that deal, state, give up your religion, individuals give up any public identity, or better, give it up altogether, just give up religion, get rid of the question. Bauer's position is where Marx begins with critique. He's what he's, it's what he starts by taking apart. When you read those first four or five pages, it's going to be all about what Bauer says and what Bauer gets wrong. Again, this is not because Marx cares passionately about the Jewish question or question of Jewish suffrage. It's not because he cares passionately about Bruno Bauer. It's because he sees the debate about the Jewish question and the dilemma over it as some, a symptom of something much larger. And to conclude, what is that much larger thing? He sees the debate about the Jewish question as revealing the limited character of freedom, or what he calls emancipation, and inclusion in the modern constitutional state or liberal democratic state. He sees the debate as real, revealing something about the limited character of freedom, what he will call mere political emancipation, which he's going to contrast with true human emancipation. He's going to see it as, a, as, as revealing something about the limited character of freedom, and he's going to see it as revealing something about the limited character of reforms based on changing ideas, reforms based on just changing attitudes, the attitude of the state toward religion or the attitude of the individual toward the state or toward its own religion. So he's going to see it as revealing the limited character of freedom in liberal democracy and the limited nature of liberal reforms, and he's going to see it as revealing something about Hegelian philosophy as bound up with all this. So we've got a lot of balls in the air. I don't expect you to be able to track every single one of them. I'm just trying to give you the frame for what you're going into. And what we'll do next time is you've got to bring your books. 
because we will be working through the arguments piece by piece by piece. I'll be walking you through it. However, we have seven minutes, so sit tight for a second and let me just answer questions about the introductory material I offered today. Yes? The question is a really great one. Is there any relationship between idealism and constructivism? So constructivism is a much later term. It comes to us really rather recently. It has lots of different meanings, but it generally does refer to the idea that things are not just sitting there, but are actually constructed, and, not only const and that people as well as states are not only constructed through um, concrete forces of power that are very material, but also constructed through language. So, actually, what you'll see in really good constructivism is that it's going to pull from both idealism and materialism. It's going to say, yeah, language and meanings really do shape how, we, how, how, things, how things materialize in the world, but so also do economic forces and political forces. So it's going to be sort of a third term. It's going to come way later. Others? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I went through that really quickly. The right Hegelians are a scream. They're really fun to read. Nobody reads them. The right Hegelians, <laughs> the right Hegelians believe that whatever appears on earth at this point is rational. And if you can't see it as perfectly rational, that's your problem, and you need to be taught to see it. So they believe that the real has that, 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 that God and the divine and reason and truth have all manifested on earth at this time and that it is, it is your task to see the rationality in any practice, whether it's slavery or Christian exclusion of Jews from a European state or Napoleon. Left Hegelians believe that there is still a task for criticism, that the, that the world has not yet been made fully rational, that reason does not yet reign on earth, that history has not come to an end, that there is still critical work to be done, and therefore that if you see what appears to be irrational, phenomenon, phenomena, or an irrationality or a contradiction somewhere, it's your task to point it out. It's your task to engage in criticism in it. And I could give you a longer explanation in May next time of how Hegel could have made it possible for people to have these two different ways of taking his view, but it all came from one simple sentence where he said, the real is rational and the rational is real. And so what? Why do you need that sentence? In the real is rational, but in the sentence, what happened is that some people said, well, he must mean that all that is real is already rational. And others said, no, he must mean it's our task on earth to bring rationality forth as a reality. So that's the left and right. Did I get near your, did, did that make sense? Okay. More Hegel than you wanted, probably. Okay, who else? Yes. I'll come to you next. First her. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to get so much on that next week. So I won't do much more on materialism on Thursday, but Tuesday is materialism for an hour because it's a really rich notion and it's often reduced to determinism and determinism is not the way to think about it. He's not saying that, you know, what you eat determines who you are. That's Feuerbach. Um, Marx is not saying how we grow and how we organize ourselves economically determines everything about how we think and how we govern ourselves. It's a more complex order than that, but there is, for him, the push from the material to everything else, the political, the social, the relational, and the ideational. And I will spend all of, a good deal of Tuesday on that. Sorry.
Great. Okay, so I need to correct myself. Thank you. Fukuyama, uh, we have from the front, um, had a recent interview in which he said he's rethinking the end of history. He's not so sure about it now. And was that based on what's happened since 9 11? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So instead of imagining, as he did post 89, and he wasn't the only person, he just happens to be a card carrying Hegelian. He was a real one. I mean, he really studied Hegelianism and, um, with, and you know, as a Kojevian, and he was a real. He, he, Hegel really mattered to him, and he really believed there was going to come a time when the real and the rational would come together, and he believed they came together in liberal democracy, and at the, at, with the fall of the wall and the end of the Soviet Union, that what you had was finally truth spreading over the earth. And it makes sense that in the post-9-11 period, he would say, whoops, um, doesn't look like it's spreading over the earth. We have some new conflict between major warring ideas hopefully truth will still out. But yeah, that makes sense that he would be rethinking it. So I take it back, I'm not picking on him. Um, well, I am, but I mean, I'm not. Uh, he, he did, everyone gets the right to revise their opinions, always, everywhere. Okay. I know some of you still need to turn in your papers. So um, if, if people who need to turn in their papers can just come down this way and do it down here. And I'll see you all on Thursday. All right, let's, um, let's get started. So um, I promise to try my very best today to teach you this impossible to understand essay. And um, I wouldn't assign it if I didn't think it was worth it. I'm not just assigning it to torture you or because you, know, you need to study something really hard. Um, just as I think Tocqueville has something to teach us about democracy, to, to think about whether democracy really does come down to elections and rights and liberties or whether there's something else uh, at stake in, in a notion of the people ruling themselves. Um, I think Marx has something to teach us in this essay about democracy, uh, namely that it makes a series of promises that it can't realize and he's going to try to explain why and how it doesn't realize those. And it's buried, as I warned you on Tuesday, in very arcane language. Um, and that has to do with the context, the philosophical context in which he was writing, and the political context in which he was writing. Believe it or not, people understood him then, because <laughs> they were reading the same stuff and thinking about it in similar ways. Um, but it's hard for us. So I'm going to try to bring it out of that language and, and teach it to you. Um, don't worry about the things on the board yet. I will just say this is what I'm going to try to get through today. If I don't get through to number four, we'll take that up on Tuesday. Um, our goal is to understand these pages. And um, these are really the pages that are just the nub of the essay. It's not that there aren't other things going on in the essay, but if you can understand what's going on in pages 32 through 35, which we're going to work through in part today, and 42 through 46, you'll, you'll really have the heart of the argument. So you probably want your book at your feet. <laughs> um, we're not going to start with it right away, but eventually I am going to really be just taking us through sentence by sentence and explaining sentences. Uh, so just go ahead and get it out now. OK, so let's remember where we were. We started with Hegel, who was no easier to make sense of, but at least I'm not making you read him. And what we, what we did with Hegel on Tuesday was consider Hegel's, a dimension of Hegel's philosophy called um, idealism, um, or Hegel's development of idealism. Um, the idea that ideas are what generate history and what make material reality, that consciousness and um, ideas more generally uh, dominant ideas in particular historical moments and the way that they're codified in law and in values, that those are the things that make history. And we begin to get an idea of what Marx's critique of that would be. That won't be full-blown until next week. But we saw just at the very beginning that Marx is going to be challenging this notion. He's uncomfortable with it, with a different notion, the idea that it is material life, it's how life is organized, especially at the level of the economy, that will generate history and will generate ideas themselves. Now that's not going to make too much sense until we get a little further. That's where we left things. We also um, touched on the idea that there are right and left Hegelians, um, Hegelians who believe that 
everything that exists in the world as it is right now is already rational and true and godly and simply needs to be explained correctly. Right Hegelians. And left Hegelians who believe, no, the world hasn't yet developed to a point of uh, rationality and truth and godliness. And there are still criticisms to be made of existing ideas and existing <laughs> laws. And those things need to be changed in order to bring the truth out. And a lot of those left Hegelians I suggested believed that religion as such was, was false. That is to say that religion as such was hiding uh, uh, or, or obscuring rationality and, and, and reality, which is a, a view shared by, by uh, many Westerners today. Um, that, that you really need to get at the, the real truth of life in non-religious ways. And as I suggested at the outset of introducing the Jewish question, Bruno Bauer is one such Hegelian. He is a left Hegelian who thinks religion is itself a sign that, of, of unfreedom and of, of being enchained in some ways to the old world. And that only when all religion is thrown off by the state and by individuals and by others, will we really have arrived at a rational, free, true world. Now, Marx is uncomfortable with this position. It's not that he's a big fan of religion. It's that he can't really believe that religion itself is the problem. So that's where we're going to begin entering this essay. That is, Marx is going to start by taking apart Bauer's position that the Jew is not yet an emancipated or free or rational human being because he's Jewish, and the state is not yet an emancipated, free, and rational state because it's Christian, Marx is going to take apart Bauer's view, that view, not because he cares passionately, as I said before, about the question of enfranchising Jews. He's for it, but that's not his big issue. But because he sees this debate about the Jewish question, and he sees Bauer's own position as a symptom of something much larger. And that's what we need to get at today. What's the much larger thing that Marx sees the, the debate over the Jewish question? Should Jews be enfranchised in a Christian state or in, even in a non-Christian state if they hang on to their Judaism? He sees the debate over the, Judy, over the Jewish question and he sees Bauer's response to it and other responses to it as revealing something about the limited character of freedom in a modern so-called democratic state. Now, the Prussian state is not overtly democratic. It's a Christian state. It still has privileges. It still has different classes in, ensconced in the state and so forth. But that's why Marx starts touring around until he gets to the United States and says, look, this is a state that's formally free of religion and formally indifferent to the question of religion. He sees all of these states as in some ways emerging as modern democratic states and still thinks that you don't really get freedom and equality in them. So Marx is going to treat the Jewish question as just a way in to revealing the limited character of freedom and equality in modern states and modern liberal democracy. He'll never say that word liberal democracy. He doesn't name it as such, but that's roughly what he's talking about. He's also going to treat the Jewish question as revealing something about the very limited nature of reforms centered on the state. He doesn't have a good language for this yet, but he's trying to figure out, through arguing with Bauer and through arguing about the Jewish question itself, what the limitation is of focusing on law and legal reform or changes in the question of who can belong, who can be voting, or who can be uh, elected. He's going to he's going to try to get at what he thinks the limitations are of that for what he's going to call human freedom and true equality. 
So Marx is going to contrast political emancipation, which I'll just specify very briefly, political emancipation being that moment when the state says, I don't care if you're Jewish or Christian. I don't care if you have property or don't have property. I don't care if you're black or white or some other color. I don't care if you're male or female. You're just a person. That is a moment that Marx understands as political emancipation from a particular form of power. When the state says, I don't care, you're all my children. You're all equal here. You're all equal in the eyes of the law. That is what Marx calls political emancipation from a particular category or, or operation of power. And it's not trivial for him. It's not nothing, but it's not enough. It's not trivial and it's not nothing because it's a stage, it's a step on the way to realizing what the state etches in at the level of an ideal. The indifference, the unimportance of, I've added some categories, but of Marx's categories, of property, of education, and um, of status. The unimportance of that to being a true human and the unimportance of that to equality and freedom. So Marx says, you know, what we get at this moment is an ideal that's a really important ideal compared to what we had in feudalism, <coughs> where you're born a serf, you're born a peasant, or you're born an aristocrat, and that's who you are, and that saturates your life, and that's how you're treated politically and legally, and that's how you're treated in every way. So we have an advance here that Marx notes, but he doesn't think it's fully realized. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but what I'm trying to do is kind of adumbrate the argument, get, give you the outlines of the argument so you can begin to inhabit it. Okay, so let me, let me do that just a little bit differently this time. I'm going to give you the outline again. So give, uh, this, this whole lecture is going to be like this. It's going to be, I'm, I'm going to kind of just keep circling around the same points, but going into the text as I, as I um, keep circling around them. But let me do it once more before we enter the text. Marx sees the Jewish question as revealing something really important about the way that freedom and equality are being debated in democracy and negotiated in democracy that doesn't get to their root. He also sees it as revealing something really important about idealism itself. That is, Marx, through this essay, is beginning to make a connection between the dominant form of thinking in his time, German idealism, the emphasis on ideas, the belief that consciousness is everything, that attitude is everything, that ideas make the world go round. He's beginning to put together a connection between the dominance of German idealism itself as a way of thinking, and idealism more generally as a way of thinking, the way most of us think in liberal democracies, and the formulation and, or formation of political life in the age. He's beginning to see that what happens in this time is that people concentrate more and more on how things are talked about or described or positioned in law than they do, than they emphasize the question of how they're actually lived in material life. And what he sees is that there's a growing split between those two things. That what you had in this old era, I never, I usually try to stay away from diagrams because when I stare at other people's diagrams, I have no idea what they're doing. And I think that's probably the same with mine. But what you have in this old era, Tudor monarchy, feudalism, whatever you want to call it, is a monarch and lords or aristocrats, priests, guilds, all of these are represented in what were called estates. They had representation if of one form or another, and then the masses were just serfs and peasants. Now, they, they, they don't figure politically, they don't have rights and liberties, they basically belong to um, a subtenant of one of the aristocrats. And what Marx sees is that in this phase, who you are materially, where you are in material life, is directly represented in political life. There's no gap between them. 
but what happens when you get over here and the state says, oh no, you're, you're all equal and you're all free. You're all just individuals. Is that what you get is an order here in which there's plenty of division between us as individuals. There's plenty of powers organizing us by class, by property holdings, by wealth, by, by we can add today, gender, race, whatever you want to say. There's plenty of powers organizing our possibilities, our aspirations, our access to education, our access to wealth, our access to um, various forms of power and possibility. But the state abstracts from that. It represents us as if we're just mere persons. So what Marx is beginning to understand through this text, through this work, through this critical work that he's doing, is that the, the, the split you're starting to get in this era between an abstract representation of us and the reality of our material differences, the powers that actually organize us and our possibilities, that split that you're starting to get is perfectly commensurate with the emphasis on ideas of German idealism. That German idealism is always looking here. It's always looking at how are you represented? How do we think about um, each other? How do we think about political life? How does the law operate in declaring us who we are? It says we're all free and equal, so we must all be free and equal. So what Marx is beginning to also put together in this essay, in addition to a critique of political emancipation, is, is the connection between the, the, the predominant way of thought in this world that he's in, which includes the predominant way of thinking in the academy, but also the predominant way of thinking everywhere, the emphasis on ideas, prejudice, attitudes as the most important thing in life, he's beginning to put together that that emphasis with, this, with, with the emergence of this particular form of political life. A form of political life, let's try this one over here, in which all we're concerned with is political emancipation. We don't want the state to discriminate against religion anymore. We don't want the state to discriminate against the propertyless masses anymore. We don't want the state to discriminate, in this case of the US, against um, those of a post-slavery existence anymore. So once they're politically emancipated, we call them all free and equal. And that's, that's, that's a way of thinking that emphasizes ideas and law and um, the question of the state's attitude toward us. And what Marx is going to substitute for this is staring hard at what he calls civil society a funny term because today we use it a little differently. By civil society, Marx really means the domain of the economy and society. And look hard at what's really coursing through that, that, that domain. What powers operate and separate us and organize our possibilities in that domain and leave us unemancipated and unequal. And that Marx is going to call material life and for that work, he's finally going to have to develop a new theory, a materialist theory rather than an idealist theory, to be able to bring forward what's really going on in society. He thinks idealism masks it, and he thinks liberal democracy and the ideology that it generates is purely idealist. Okay, that's the synopsis. If you got half of it, you're doing great. Did you get half of it? Great. OK, so now I'm going to show you where it is in the text. I don't want the graduate students nodding. I want the undergraduates nodding. <laughs> um, I, if, if you got half of it, you're doing great. If you got a quarter of it, you're still doing fine. Or as they used to say in my child's preschool, you're emerging. <laughs> I was, they didn't have grades. You know, it's Berkeley. No, you, you, were either, you were either doing very well or you were emerging. So we used to now and then. <laughs> refer to things we cooked at home as mm, emerging. <laughs> okay, so those stray things that come out of the unconscious. Okay, so if, if you got part of that, you're, you're doing fine. I am going to say the same point now much more slowly by showing you where it happens in the text, okay? I would invite questions right now, but I think it might be better. I will definitely stop today 15 minutes early. It will be better if I just keep trying to immerse you in the argument 
and then take your questions when we're done. So I'm, I'm blocking you a little bit. Okay, where am I in relationship to this? Okay, so let me, let me just say one last thing here, which is that Marx is using the Jewish question to investigate then a variety of things. He's trying to investigate the relation between state, civil society or economy, and between what he calls political emancipation and what he will then call true human emancipation, not yet specified. Don't expect you to know what he means by true human emancipation, but he wants us freer and more equal than he finds us in the deal that, that constitutional democracy offers. He is also using the Jewish question, it's a really packed piece, to try to understand the relationship between religion and Judaism and Christianity in particular, between religion and state and society. And we'll try to tap into some of that argument, but we might not get to all of it. This is a very, very layered essay. Part of the problem is Marx is young, he's excited, he thinks he's on to something, he's stuffing everything he's thinking into one short essay. Exactly what we tell you not to do with your papers, dissertations, etc. he is doing here. Okay. He is also trying to figure out, as I just said, the relationship between idealism, German idealism, that, that notion that ideas are what generate history and what matter in changing things. He's trying to figure out the relation between idealism and state-centered reform. He's making a connection. He's spying a connection between those two. He's also trying to get at the limitations of what he calls political emancipation and understand why it occurs when it does. Why we get this particular form of emancipation that we get, for example, from the French Revolution or that we get, as Tocqueville describes it, in Democracy in America, where we're all declared free and equal, where there's a formal abolition of class at the state level, where the class says, where the state says, I am above class and there is no class. I simply am here to represent all human beings equally. Why do we get that when we get it in history? He's, he's trying to figure that out. Let's see if I want to add anything else. No, that's, that's, a, that's enough. Let's see. Um, I guess I, I want to add this. He doesn't quite know where he's going yet. This is a work of critique. He doesn't, he's, he's trying to take things apart and understand them, but he hasn't yet discovered the thing that he will call capitalism. You won't find that word anywhere in this text. He hasn't discovered political economy itself as, as, as the domain of material existence. He keeps reaching for something, but he can't quite grab hold of it yet. So he doesn't have a critique of capitalism in this text. He doesn't have a deep and pervasive materialism. He refers to only to property and civil society. Those are the little mm, flags for what will later get deepened into an understanding of capitalism. <coughs> what he knows, what he's sure of, what's, what's, what's egging him on in this essay is that politics and power are not where the Hegelians say it is, and is not where the constitutional state leads you to think it is. That is to say, politics and power, their most important domain and operation, Marx does not believe really occur at the level of the state. He's got a hunch already that they're to be found in modernity, down in the domain of the economy of civil society. That's not to say he dismisses all political life. He doesn't but he knows that it doesn't harbor the whole and most important story about freedom and about equality. So what we're going to try to do next is discern Marx's critique of, of constitutional democracy, because it's a very powerful critique, it's worth encountering, even if you finally don't accept it. We're going to discern as well 
how this critique sets up Marx's future work, which we're going to turn to next, his work on political economy. And we're also studying, in a way, how Marx thinks, not just the complicatedness of it, but, but how, his, uh, how he operates as a, as, a, as a scholar engaged in critique and what his fundamental touchstones are. Okay, so let us now take the text and look at a few lines in it. Let's start at the very beginning, where Marx starts. Page 26. The German Jews, Marx says, seek emancipation. What kind of emancipation do they want? What is he doing here? He is reminding us already, assume no terms. Assume no content to familiar terms. Assume nothing about the meaning of freedom. You have to ask what kind of emancipation or freedom is being sought. And then he proceeds over the next several pages to show how Bruno Bauer, in failing to ask that question, can't get the question right. Because what he suggests is that Bauer is so focused on the question of whether a Jew can really be free as long as they're still Jewish and whether the state can really be free as long as it's still Christian, He's so focused on the question that religiousness itself is somehow um, a sign that one isn't really free, and so you have to drop religiousness if you want to be free, meaning that Bauer's solution is that the state has to stop being a Christian state, and the Jew has to stop being Jewish in a political sense, and in a public sense, the Jew has to just go be privately Jewish at best, like every other religion. And really what he wants is that you just stop being religious altogether. And at that point, Bauer says, you've solved the Jewish question, which is indeed how most secular states solve the religious question. State becomes formally secular. Each of us make an agreement, however religious we are or aren't, that it's a private matter, that we don't make claims in the public sphere and we don't make claims on the state about it we just agree to leave each other alone. The state gets out of the religious identity business, and we are supposed to do the same. So it's a, a, a separation of the two that produces freedom. What's Marx's problem with this? Well, there are a couple of problems, but above all, what Marx is concerned with is, first of all, that he takes religion from another source that we're not going to get into here, to itself be a sign that human beings aren't actually living lives in common with one another where they control the powers that organize those lives. So Marx takes religion to not be the problem, but to simply be a sign of a larger order of unfreedom one in which human beings aren't in control of the powers and the dependencies that they experience in everyday life. But that's not the big issue for Marx. The big issue for Marx is what happens when he takes the Jewish question and he moves it over to some other categories of analysis. He thinks about the way that the state is making itself free, not just of religion, but also of concern with who has property and who doesn't? Who has wealth and who doesn't? Who has education and who doesn't? And what Marx says is, at that point, it becomes clear that this move of the state to divest itself from these problems or these issues and leave them to us individually has actually not freed us at all. All it's done is free the state from being responsible for or involved with them. Let's see how he proceeds here in his own words. The way Marx gets at this problem is by going, let's look now, he's, he's sort of taken Bauer apart on pages 27, 28, 29. Bottom of 29, he says, very bottom, it was by no means sufficient to ask 
who should emancipate and who should be emancipated, the critic, the one he wants to be, should ask a third question. What kind of emancipation is involved? What are the essential conditions of the emancipation which is demanded? What are the essential conditions of the emancipation which is demanded? The signal here that Marx is giving you is that you can't just think about emancipation as a concept. You have to think about it as something that is conditioned, lived, material, historical, practical. Put another way, emancipation for him is not just a relationship between who and whom, who should be doing the emancipating and who needs to be emancipated. It's not just a, 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 an individual relation. And it's not just a relation that happens at the level of ideas. Rather, he's moving to an appreciation of the idea that emancipation has a lot of different forms. It's not just one thing. And it's conditioned, neither of which concepts ever are. There's a certain critique of merely conceptual practices here. Don't get me hung up, he's saying, in the question of the concept. Let's ask what the conditions are of emancipation. He's moving toward an understanding of emancipation as lived, as practical, as material, as historical, rather than as merely an idea or a concept. One of Marx's premises for critical theorists, and he offers it on this very page, is to formulate a question properly is to resolve it. To formulate a question is to resolve it. And if you don't ask, what kind of emancipation, and what are the conditions of emancipation, you'll just end up wandering down a bunch of false paths. You'll just get yourself tangled up in conceptual silliness. Remember, what Marx is going to try to distinguish himself in, in significant ways is political emancipation from what he will call true human emancipation. And he's also going to now distinguish a criticism of religion and a criticism of the state as religious and a criticism of individuals as religious. He's going to try to distinguish all of that from a critique of the state as such. He's going to start moving away from a preoccupation with whether the state is religious or not to a question about what the modern state itself is premised on. And we don't know the answer to that yet, but we will in about 10 minutes, so hang on. Okay. What Marx tells you is that you can see the limitations of Bauer's preoccupation with who should emancipate, who should be emancipated, who's Christian, who's Jewish, and so forth, when you get to the United States, and he, he, he suggests at the bottom of page 30, that when you get to considering the US, what he calls a fully secular state in his time, the Jewish question disappears, and he says, Bauer's criticism is no longer critical, by which he means Bauer's just done with the problem of, of, of criticizing the state. But, says Marx, in the US, it would seem that the state is still an instrument of inequality. It still entrenches privileges of some over others. It can even be said to privilege some religious beliefs over others. So something's wrong with this picture. If Bauer runs out of steam as soon as he gets to the US, where we've got a formerly formally secular state, and everybody's more or less adhering to the deal that they privatize religion, and yet the state is still an instrument of inequality, and it still entrenches privileges, and it still even privileges certain religious beliefs over others, and, says Marx, religion itself is still very vigorous, as everyone's noting that it is in 19th century US life. It's still very vigorous in the sense that it's a very religious country which is a sign for Marx of some larger issues of unfreedom or failure to take 
the powers that organize us onto ourselves, to, to, to be in control of them, then that means that that form of emancipation, political emancipation, is a really limited form. Again, political emancipation for Marx means, and I'll, just, I'll probably define it differently every time I get there, but each one of these adds up to a definition, the state ceasing to discriminate on the basis of a particular status the state ceasing to discriminate on the basis of a particular status, whether that status is one that has to do with wealth or education or property or color or religion or gender or something else. And again, what Marx is going to argue, and we're about to really dig into this part of the argument, is that the state ceasing to do that is fine, but it doesn't, it doesn't free human beings from the power or the effect of these forces. It doesn't really emancipate us from the power or effect of wealth or race or gender or religion or property or educational access. What it does is emancipate the state from being concerned with them. It gets the state out of culpability or preoccupation with them. The state now appears universal, neutral, indifferent to the question of how these powers actually operate. And individuals, Marx will say, now have to navigate all these powers, but in what he will call a depoliticized way. And what he means by that is that we have to now navigate these powers, for example, differences of wealth, or education, or racial privilege, or something like that. We navigate them without them being politically named as such, because we're all declared free and equal. We're all universal citizens of the state. And that's the political articulation or enunciation of our status. So now, as the state emancipates itself from those things, which is what happens in political emancipation, we have to navigate the problem. We could even just go back to religion. We have to navigate the problem of managing Muslim holidays or Jewish holidays or other such things in an unpolitical way in a supposedly secular state that is actually still a Christian state, just as we have to navigate the problem of wealth and poverty and differential access to education in a way that simply makes it your own individual problem. It simply makes it your particular problem, your individual or contingent or accidental issue. So Marx summarizes this point by saying the state can liberate itself from a constraint without man being liberated. The state can liberate itself from a constraint, religion, property, something like that, without man being liberated. And he goes on, you can have a free state without man being a free man. You can have a free state without man being a free man. And again, uh, they, we can pull examples from U.S. history that I think are, are, are familiar enough to everybody that they'll, they'll, they'll make sense. We could say the 13th Amendment or Brown v. Board of Education, important as they were in bringing a formal end to slavery and a formal end to segregation, do not bring an end to racism. They end formal discrimination, but they don't end the powers of racism that course through civil society and the economy, that link race to class, that produce access or foreclose it, and so forth. Similarly, female suffrage, important as it is, nobody would throw it back, presumably, does not address the substance of women's inequality in a male-dominated order. It addresses political standing, the question of citizenship, and it liberates the state from being implicated in women's inequality. So political emancipation is, again, important not to be thrown away, but it mostly emancipates the state from involvement in um, these powers as they're set loose in civil society. So one side of Marx's complaint against Bruno Bauer, one side of the complaint against Bauer, is that Bauer's criticism only asks the state to remove itself from the fray. But it doesn't resolve the fray. It just gets the state out of the picture. It asks the state to feign neutrality. 
And Marx does think it's a feigned neutrality, as we'll see in, the, in a moment. It's not like it's a real neutrality. The other side of the complaint against Bauer, let me just repeat the first one. The first complaint against Bauer is that all Bauer's doing is asking the state to remove itself from the fray, not to resolve the fray, and, and asking the state to feign neutrality without actually becoming neutral. But the other side of the complaint he has against Bauer is that the kind of emancipation that Bauer is seeking involves, and I'm quoting from him, page, oh dear, forgot to write the page down. I think it's 31, but I can't find it right now. He's, he says the kind of emancipation that Bauer seeks involves, quote, man freeing himself from a constraint in a narrow and partial way. Man freeing himself from a constraint in a narrow and partial way. It's actually page 32. So what does he mean here? What is he talking about? Well, what he's saying is human beings, translated as man here, are still enmeshed in the particular constraint, property relations, stratification according to education, inherited wealth, religion, so forth. But in order to become represented as free and equal in a democratic society, we abstract from that constraint. We abstract from it. We, we, we free ourselves, we become freed from that particular constraint, or we could call it a power. We become freed from that power by pretending that it doesn't matter to our civic standing. We're just persons. We're all just persons. Thus, Marx concludes, and I'm now at the very bottom of 32. Four lines from the bottom. Second to last sentence. The state is the intermediary between man and human liberty. The state is the intermediary between man and human liberty. And he compares this to Christ being the intermediary between man and his own divinity. Again, what does Marx mean here? He means that the state and Christ both become a repository, an ideal repository, of our human freedom and our divinity. That is, we imagine that the state confers freedom upon us by agreeing to treat us as if we weren't enmeshed in all of these powers and forces, but are just persons. And we imagine that Christ confers a blessed status or grace upon us, we imagine that both are the source of our freedom and our blessedness. That is the state and Christ, respectively. But in Marx's view, the very fact that there is such an intermediary, state, Christ, etc., already indicates that we're not really free, not really blessed. Because what he sees us doing is conforming Conferring or transferring or relocating the source of what is actually a humanly generated thing. Freedom, human blessedness. He sees us conferring or displacing or transferring this onto some other entity. So human beings make God who then gives them blessedness. Human beings make the state that then gives them freedom. What Marx sees here then is that we must be deprived of freedom and human and, 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 and grace or blessedness by some force of history itself that has to be overthrown, has to be taken on. There's a sign here that there's something that we can't yet do for ourselves that we must be able to do for ourselves if we are really finally going to be free and equal. Okay. What I want to do now is take you step by step through pages 33, 34, 35, so that you can see this on the page. I keep giving you the argument, but now you're actually going to see it on the page. I promise. Or at least 
you'll see the words on the page, and you have to believe me that they mean what they say, what I tell you that I say, they say. Okay, so we're at the top of 33, and if you don't have the text, the person next to you might let you look at the text with them, um, or might not. Um, <laughs> the political elevation of man above religion, that is, let's remember what he's talking about here, the political elevation of man above religion, that is where we're, 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 we're technically um, freed by being politically emancipated from the relevance of religion. We, religion doesn't matter. We're just people in the state with religion as our private matter. He says, the political elevation of man above religion shares the weaknesses and merits of all such political measures. And then he immediately switches to private property. For example, the state as a state abolishes private property, that is, man decrees by political means the abolition of private property when it abolishes the property qualification for electors and representatives. Let's translate this. What Marx is telling us is that when we officially declare that whether or not we own property is irrelevant to whether we can hold office or vote, at the political level, private property has been abolished. That is, it doesn't matter. That's what he means about it being politically abolished. Okay, so the state as a state abolishes private property. It declares it irrelevant to its concerns when it's irrelevant to whether or not we can stand for office or vote. Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, interprets this phenomenon quite correctly from the political standpoint, saying, the masses have gained a victory over property owners and financial wealth. He adds, is not private property ideally abolished, abolished at the level of ideas, when the non-owner comes to legislate for the owner of property. So when you get a worker elected to Congress legislating for the one who actually is wealthy, something Marx is registering has happened. You've, you've, you've actually abolished the political significance of private property. And then he adds, the property qualification, the idea that you have to have property in order to stand for office, which, of course, was the story for most of human history, until the democratic revolutions that Tocqueville is celebrating, the property qualification is the last political form in which private property is recognized. So when that, when that qualification is gone, it's been abolished at the political level. But now we're going to read the really key paragraph. Marx is going to tell you where private property then goes. But the political suppression of private property not only doesn't abolish it, it actually presupposes its existence. Okay, so this we have to follow really closely. Marx is telling us when, when, when the state officially declares that property or race or gender or any other power doesn't matter, you can vote, you can stand for office, you can exist, you can be subject to the same laws. When it declares that, it's actually presupposing the existence of those powers. Otherwise, it wouldn't have to declare them. Okay, and then he says, the state abolishes, after its fashion, the distinctions established by birth, aristocrat or peasant, whatever, social rank, education, occupation, are you, a, are you a lawyer, or are you a worker, or are you a janitor, or are you a professor? They're getting closer. When it decrees that birth, social rank, education, and occupation are non-political distinctions. So the state abolishes the, the, the distinctions that all of those categories have historically entailed. When it says that those don't matter politically, when it proclaims without regard to these distinctions, that every member of society is an equal partner in popular sovereignty. And that, of course, is the democratic moment. That's the one Tocqueville's staring hard at and Marx is staring hard at. That's what's going on in, in, in the 18th and 19th century. When every member of society is simply declared an equal partner in popular sovereignty, at the political level, these distinctions have been abolished. 
and when the state treats all the elements that compose the real life of the nation from its standpoint. Then he adds, and this, this sentence probably could be said to be the key sentence in the whole essay. So this is the moment to, to, to mark it. If you don't have your text with you, it's dead in the middle of page 33, so just put that in your notes and go back and look at it. Then he says, but the state, even after it's done this formal declaration, none of these distinctions matter, I don't care what you are, what you do, how much money you have, what color you are, or anything else, but the state nonetheless allows private property, education, occupation, to act after their own fashion. Namely, as private property, education, and occupation, and to manifest their particular nature. So the state says, I don't care about these things. And when, he's, when Marx says it allows them to act in their own fashion, he means that they go from being categories that qualify you for various standing in the state to now just operating in civil society. Not as political forces. We don't talk about, in this country in particular, class as a political force or education or occupation. Those things are just up to you. They're up to individuals. They're accidents. They're contingencies. They're the result of hard work. They're the result of whatever they are. They've lost their political status. So what Marx says is the state allows these things to act after their own fashion, namely as these various forces. And then he adds, thus the state, far from abolishing these differences, exists only only, only exists so far as they are presupposed. Why do you need the state in the first place, Marx says? Why do you need a domain that proclaims itself to be universal and above these particular differences? Because these differences actually operate in society, separate us, produce conflict, and require something to mediate that conflict and to represent us in another way, to represent us as if we are free, equal, and universal. Even if these powers have all now been dropped at, into civil society to operate in an officially unpolitical fashion. Marx adds, it, the state, is conscious of being a political state and manifests as universality only in opposition to these elements. Why does it have to go around proclaiming universality? Why does it have to go around saying we're all free and equal? Because we're not. That's, that's what Marx is saying. You don't need a state representing that freedom and equality and universality over and against our particular differences if you don't have the particulars. You don't get a universal unless you've got particulars. I'm almost done. And then I promise I'm going to take a break, and you can breathe, and you can ask questions. I just want to take us through the rest of this. Drop down to the bottom, skip the Hegel, bottom of that paragraph, still on 33. It's only in this way that the state, above the particular churches, has attained to the universality of thought. Only above the particular elements can the state constitute itself as universality. Now, we have one more little bit we've got to get through to see what Marx is now going to do in connecting this condition, this new condition, this new emerging democratic life with a constitutional state, universality, equality, liberty, proclaimed at the state level but not lived at the material level. We now have to see how Marx is going to connect this up to religiosity. Okay? Marx is going to connect this up to a certain Christian orientation on the part of the modern constitutional state, whether it claims to be Christian or not. So we're going to see Marx now in the next movie he's going to make show us how there's, there's a disseminated Christian orientation to existence long after the state has formally given up being a Christian state in any official sense. Okay, so flip the page over. We're on page 34. <clears throat> Second full sentence. Where the political state has attained to its full development. That's, 
like the U.S., where it's really, it's all there. It's, it's, it's not still kind of half-baked like it was in Marx's uh, Prussia. It's not sort of, um, you know, kind of half there as it was in some other parts of Europe. It's like France or it's like the U.S. It's, it's, it's declared freedom, equality, universality for all. It's not quite there for women. It's certainly not there for slaves. It's certainly not there for others, but it has that declaration. Where the political state has attained to its full development, man leads, not only in thought, in consciousness, but in reality, in life, a double existence, celestial and terrestrial, earthly and heavenly. Okay, so what's this double existence that we all lead? He lives in the political community. That's, that's his, mm, by political community, Marx means um, the, way, the way we're represented by the state. We, we live our, 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 our citizenship identity in the state, who the state tells us we are. Okay? So he lives in the political community where he regards himself as a communal being, a U.S. citizen or a French person or whatever, and in civil society where he acts simply as a private individual. There you're just a baker, a worker, an engineer, whatever, and treats other men as means, use others, you might employ them, or um, you might, uh, in one way or another, um, you know, regard them as tools or obstacles to your existence, degrades himself to the role of a mere means, and becomes the plaything of alien powers. Degrades himself to the role of a mere means, and becomes the plaything of alien powers. So what Marx is trying to get at here is that in Grading ourselves to a mere means, we just understand ourselves as the, as, as the vehicles for survival, for, for, for existence, for, for what we might call today self-investing um, in order to get ahead in life, but also experience ourselves as the plaything of alien powers. That is, there's all kinds of forces and powers that we're not in control of. We're in an economy, there's a jobless rate of this, there's a need for that kind of sector to develop. Um, there's various forces that keep us from being able to do what we want to do or not do. We, we don't have control of those powers. So here we are, as citizens, having popular sovereignty, being people who are a member of a community, and then as private individuals where we're separated from each other and we don't experience ourselves as in control of the powers that organize our possible ways of life and our fortunes. Okay, let's keep reading. <clears throat> the political state in relation to civil society, okay, so the state in relation to the economy or society, is just as spiritual as is heaven in relation to earth. The political state in relation to civil society is just as spiritual as heaven in relation to earth. Marx means here is that this place where we are free and equal and universal and um, connected to others is, is, is a kind of heavenly other world. We have to abstract from our reality, our everyday reality, our existence in material life in order to get there. It's not, it's not who we really are. It's a representation of us, just as Christianity represents us as all being God's children, all being the same in the eyes of God. What Marx is drawing on here is the picture of heaven as the place that, of course, is supposedly redemptive of all our sufferings and differences, but also as the place where we experience ourselves at, or, or anticipate our existence as that in which our differences, our struggles, our bitternesses, our troubles, our, 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 um, our divisions from one another vanish. So instead we have a community of angels, we're all God's children, we're all the same in the eyes of God, and so forth. What Marx is suggesting then, and he goes on and says exactly this, man in his most intimate reality in civil society where we actually live every day and navigate our way and where we're actually existing, is, he says, a profane being. We're not, we're not 
spiritual there. We're, 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 we're not free and equal and universal and communal. communal. Here, in, in civil society, where he appears both to himself and to others as a real individual, he's an illusory phenomenon. That is, we're not represented by the state in the way that we actually live everyday life. Those powers that, that, that have now been sunk to the level of civil society that no longer have any presence in the state. Those, those powers are the ones that actually organize us and, and make who we are and make what's possible for us. But we have no name for it. We have no political enunciation of it. We have no political understanding of it. So in fact, here we appear as illusory, as, 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 as phantoms. We can't, in, in, in our everyday reality, we don't have a way of naming the powers and the, and the modes of organization that actually produce our existence. In the state, on the contrary, last sentence we're going to do today, in the state, on the contrary, where he, man, is regarded as a species being, and that's a term he's borrowing from Feuerbach, another thinker, and, and it refers to our sense of ourselves as being in common with other human beings, being part of the species man, being part of um, and, and sharing in the capacities and the powers of the species, having that collective possibility of a species. Here, um, in the state where we're regarded as a species being, we are man, we have the rights of man. That's, that's, he's drawing on that notion as well. In the state, you, 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 you exist as someone who has the rights of man, according to the French Revolution. But here, man is the imaginary member of an imaginary sovereignty. We, we, we don't really have power, and we don't really have equality and freedom and universality, but we are represented that way at the level of ideas. Here, we are divested of our real individual lives. We're infused, he concludes, with an unreal universality. Okay, I promised to give us a good 15 minutes to ask questions. Let me conclude this part of the lecture then with, um, there's a whole bunch more um, we need to do and we'll do it next time. But, because um, we're, let me see how far we got. Oh, yeah, we got through three. You might not have known it, but we got through three. We just have to do four. Um, so, um, what, what I just want to note is on the next page, 35, Marx does say, look, this is a great progress. To get from this where we're all politically named according to our status, and most of us would have just been this, serfs and peasants, and had no political status at all, no political rights, been literally owned by others. It's a great progress to get from this condition to this condition where we formally all are represented by the state as human beings, recognized as human beings, and recognized as formally free and equal. It's a great progress, but it's not yet freedom. It's not yet human emancipation. Why? Because we haven't really been emancipated from the powers that the state has been busy abolishing. It's abolished private property, no longer is relevant for belonging. It's abolished the question of educational status or occupation, no longer is relevant to whether or not you can run for office or be a citizen. It's abolished some more things since Marx's time, racial and gendered qualifications for voting. It's abolished just about everything you can think of for you to be a person, no matter who you are, in the eyes of the state. But it hasn't abolished the way these things operate as powers that divide, name, and limit, and constrain us in civil society. So what it's done is push unfreedom and inequality into this domain where it's not named as political, it's just named as natural. It's just the accident of the market, or hard work, or luck, or some other things. But it's not political. So what Marx is fighting for here is a, an, an appreciation of the way that this new vocabulary of democracy takes the, the zone of the state 
as the zone of power and political life, and then proceeds to naturalize and depoliticize what happens in society and leaves it to us as individuals to struggle with and um, to navigate. Okay, let me just stop there and we'll pick up the rest of his argument next time and let me just take your questions. So, so, so don't put your stuff away yet. Just, just take your time, yeah. Great question. So he's not focused on politicians. He's actually focused on popular sovereignty and the claim that popular sovereignty makes that we, the citizenry, we may not be in charge. We may have representatives, politicians, who are actually making law, but that those laws are made for us as equals. So what he's suggesting is that our representation, our political representation before the law is as equals and as free. So let me put it a little bit differently. When he, when he talks about the domain of the political being um, the place where our species being is re represented, he's talking about the citizenry represented as a, 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 a body in which every one of us is supposed to count the same as a person. Every one of us is regarded by the law as, as just, as, as entitled to rights and liberties as everybody else. Nobody gets special privileges. Leave for the moment the corporations out. Just, just think about our understanding of what, what we think is right about liberal constitutional democracy, that it does not make distinctions between you know, lords and aristocrats on one hand and serfs and peasants on the other. We all are, so, so that's what he's referring to. He's not referring to politicians. Now, what would he have to say about the self-interested politician? Um, I'm not sure in some ways he'd have a lot to say because he's really thinking about how uh, at a, at a mm, how do I want to put it? at the level of principle, how democracy is supposed to work and, and what it's supposed to embody. And that what it's supposed to embody, what liberal democracy is supposed to embody, is, is that uh, shared liberty, shared equality of all human beings. Did I, did I come near your question? Yes. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so um, it's a good question. If, 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 if Marx is claiming that what you get in the modern constitutional state is the state just emancipating itself from these issues, what about the possibility of um, both a judicial system, but let me just strengthen your question a little and also say, you know, political claims that we're not done with these divisions. They still are very active. They are, and we, we could use affirmative action as an example. Of, of one that obviously tried to redress certain powers. We could also use um, certain kinds of progressive labor legislation that says, uh, no, you've got to be able to um, support uh, uh, workers organizing because that's the only power they have against um, property, wealth, and so forth. So Marx is on to that. He's not on to affirmative action, obviously, but he's 
uh, he's aware that there, there will be claims, but I would say that the, the, the right part of your question as a challenge to Marx is that he can't see much at this point between a, an organization of political life that explicitly names classes and forces uh, where there's power and privilege and, and depowerment and, de and, and lack of privilege associated with them. He can't see much of, of, a, of a gray area between that old system and a system in which we simply are dealing with uh, universal representation before the law and the depoliticization of these forces. So you are absolutely right to say, aren't there ways to make these forces appear in the court system or in political life? That said, um, I think probably where his critique does have bite is that it's pretty hard to make them appear. Um, I mean, think about the history of affirmative action, for example. I mean, it's abolished in California in the name of exactly what Marx was describing, which is, um, if you think back to um, you know, the, the measures that, that got rid of it in the 90s, um, it's the, 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 the campaign against affirmative action was that the state must be colorblind and it must be indifferent to the particulars of a, of a, of a person's history and existence and, and race and all the rest of it as it chooses for jobs or for educational access and so forth. And that that blindness is the commitment of the modern democratic state. And the, the initiative that overturned um, affirmative action was called the Civil Rights Initiative to establish the state's blindness to those particulars. So I'm not, I'm not arguing that you can't push those things into view, I'm just saying that what Marx is probably onto is that it's pretty hard in a constitutional democratic ideology that says true justice is recognizing persons as persons by the law and at the level of representation in the state without regard to their particulars. And, and, and so, so I'm, your point's exactly right, and then I'm also saying I think what Marx would come back and say is, it's not easy. You've already got something of a critique when you try to do that. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. Great. So um, the question is, when, when Marx gets to the rights of man, which we'll get to much more um, in detail next time, and he says things like, liberty is only the right to private property, and equality has no political significance. What he's, I'll just give you the preview. What he's really saying about equality is that all equality is in a constitutional state is the guarantee that you will all be equal in the eyes of the law. It is not a claim that you will be made substantively equal in relationship to the forces that organize society. All equality is, when he says it has no political significance, he means all it's saying is you, I officially declare you equal. I don't care how many jobs you have and how few you have. I don't care where you come from and where you come from. I don't care what prep school one of you went to and um, what homelessness another person had. I don't care um, about anything. All I care about is that you're all equal in the eyes of me. Now, again, Marx says that's a great advantage. It's really nice to be counted as an equal if you've been disenfranchised, if you've been thrown out, if you've been counted as a not human, if you've been in some way marginalized, particularized, stigmatized, or something else. He's saying that's a great advantage, but it doesn't make you equal. So that's what he means by, by the lack of political significance. But we're going to hit that point hard next time. Yes? Hmm. 
Yeah. Right. And it still is recognized in like civil society. Right. Like the state just turns a blind eye to it by using these vocabs as like sovereignty of the people and that like you're like this like sense of equality. Okay. That doesn't actually so did you all get her question? Do you want me to repeat it briefly? Just really briefly? Okay. So the question is, does does Marx really think this is an advantage to have moved from a place where you formally have where you it's always hard to say formally because it sounds like formally. Um, where you where you actually have your status enunciated in the state, where it actually has political visibility. You know you're a serf. You know you're a, you you know you're a worker. You know you're a priest. You know what you are, and you know what you what goes with that politically. You know what you can and can't be. You don't get this mystification. That's that's what he's challenging here. And your question is, does he really think that like there's progress or advantage to this state where things are more mystified? including, remember, I'm trying to keep a lot of balls in the air at once, by idealism, by a whole idealist way of thinking, a non-materialist way of thinking that has become our way of thinking and that he thinks is no accident becomes the pinnacle of philosophy in, in 19th century life. Well, the reason Marx thinks it's a great advantage is because he's a progressivist. And he believes that this, this declaration at the state level is us yearning to be free. We've, we've, we've fought a revolution. We fought a bunch of revolutions for that. And then something, we're going to find out what next time, came along and kind of messed it up and pushed all this stuff down to the level of civil society. Didn't really free us. It's got a bunch of tricks and ruses in it and so forth. But, but we've articulated the desire. And if you... All right, let's go ahead and get started. It's really hot. It's a much better day to be at the beach. We all know that. But here we are. Um, I want to start by uh, inviting, um, oh, I forgot your name already. I'm sorry. Thank you to make an announcement that he's also posted up here. You can, you can stay right where you are. OK. So normally I, I um, don't encourage, um, especially fraternity, sorority uh, announcements in here, and it's not because I'm against them. It's just it gets out of hand. Um, but when it's political science related, you can. And then you know there'll be other political announcements as tuition goes up. We'll have lots of political announcements. <laughs> sure. Okay. So. Whew, it's hot. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of review and then um, try to take you through the rest of the Jewish question today and then get us a good deal into the German ideology. So we have lots to do. So let me just remind you of where we were last time. So this first part will be review. Last time, we considered the fact that Marx argues that whether a state is formally, officially religious or not is really irrelevant to what he calls the religiosity of the modern constitutional state form. And that's because he sees us as religious in the dualism, the split that bourgeois or modern constitutional orders produce between individual life, ordinary life, our daily life, and what he calls community life or the life of the citizen in the state. So he sees a split there between civil society and politics, between who we are in civil society, where we actually live our real life, our everyday life, our ordinary existence, and live it in ways that have to do with being produced and conditioned by particular powers and the, what he calls the otherworldliness, the celestial nature of our representation in the state. 
And it's celestial precisely because it doesn't connect to who we really are and what the powers really are that are organi organizing us in everyday life. So he sees us, first of all, as religious in the sense that we live ordinary life, which goes unrecognized by the state, the particulars of our ordinary life, how it's conditioned, how it's, what its possibilities are, what the powers are that organize our limits and our potentials. And it's religious also because it, 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 um, the, the, the state literally remains religious because it addresses us in an unreal way. It frees us at a formal or abstract level rather than actually freeing us from the powers that organize everyday life. I'm going to die in here. Is there a way to actually open these windows or are they like sealed like a Hilton hotel? <laughs> Anybody? It, the people who are sitting right there by those windows, they're sealed. Thank you. That's what we needed to know. Okay, I think we must have this door open. <laughs> no matter what's outside. If you don't mind just figuring out how to prop it open, that would be great. Okay, so, so, so first, first point. Whether a modern state is really religious or not is irrelevant to the religiosity of us in living this split life between our unreal representation in the state as free, as equal, as universal, as in community with one another. And it's irrelevant to the religiosity that attends upon the state itself because it addresses us in an unreal way without regard to our actual existence. Put slightly differently, we're religious in Marx's view, whether we're formally religious or atheist, Jewish, Christian, or anything else, because in this kind of state, the kind we have, we treat our legal freedom and legal equality our standing before the state, our standing in the eyes of the law, as if it were our true life. Even though it has to abstract from our everyday life in order to declare us free and equal. So we ourselves treat our legal freedom and equality, our standing in the state, as if it were our true life even though the state must abstract from our everyday life in order to render us free and equal. And conversely, it has to treat, the state has to treat what happens in civil society, in our ordinary life, where we might be rich or poor, we might be, um, uh, we, 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 we might be educated or not, we might have access to certain powers and privileges or not. It, this, State treats our everyday life as if those things were simply a matter of our own doing, accident or caprice or hard work. Unimportant, unpolitical, unreal, insignificant, not organized by power. Okay, so that's what makes this organization of things in, in the contemporary constitutional state and, and our own orientation toward the state religious in Marx's view. But what we also saw last time was his argument that the abolition of the property qualification, or let's add again the race or gender qualification, for citizenship, the claim that we can all be citizens regardless of whether we're property holders, black, white, any other color, um, male, female, any other gender, it, it, in abolishing those qualifications for our equal standing before the law, Marx says this is an idealist religious move. That, that abolition of that qualification for our equal standing before the law is an idealist or religious form of emancipation. It's what he calls political emancipation. Why? Because emancipation occurs only at the level of our standing in the state, our standing before the law. We're not actually emancipated from the powers of property or race or gender or educational level or anything else. We're not actually emancipated from those powers and emancipated from the ways those powers divide and separate us. Rather, what Marx says, and I'm still just reviewing, 
is that the state exists and posits itself as the universal, as the thing that's indifferent to those powers, as the thing that is beyond or transcends those powers. The state posits itself as the universal precisely because those social powers exist and do divide us. It is the, it is, has the status of the universal and the emancipator precisely because we're unemancipated and not universal, because we're not really living together in the way that we're represented as living together in the state. Moreover, Marx adds, the state is not really free of those powers, and its apparent freedom from them, its claim to be free from them and to free us from them is part of the ruse, the trick of the modern constitutional democratic state. The way that works, we've just seen, it makes social powers. Marx focuses on property. He will later focus more directly on capital and on other elements more familiar to us. He focuses here on property, rank, education, and so forth. It makes social powers appear unpolitical, natural, contingent. Things that exist in civil society don't have political status. They don't have political articulation. They're just there. They just are. In the way some of our parents would say, oh, the poor will always be with us, or there will always be inequality, or it's just a matter of good luck that some are um, better off than others. So this ruse of the state freeing itself from these powers not only makes us appear free and equal and in community with one another when we're not, it makes the state appear to be an absolutely neutral state, not invested in any side on these powers, not invested in particular social powers. We could add this point. We could, we could stretch Marx to, to add this point. To say that the state, as the supreme power of the people, is just indifferent to the social powers that actually organize us in civil society, powers of property, wealth, education, class, race, gender, to say that the state is indifferent to these things is actually to take a side in these powers. It's to side with the status quo. It's to side with the working of these powers by those who have the most access to them. This is the ruse, for example, and I mentioned this last time, that you could see involved with something like California's Prop 209 and 54, which both um, together eliminated affirmative action in the name of equality, in the name of colorblindness. It was called the Civil Rights Initiative, and its premise was a very sound one in the terms that Marx is criticizing. That is, the premise was, we as a state committed to equality and fairness must be indifferent to race, class, gender, and other social powers. But Marx's claim is that to be indifferent to these powers is actually to consecrate them as they are. It's to indirectly sanction their effects and the effects these powers have on access to institutions like education. To say you all have the same rights and we're gonna treat you all the same doesn't, again, actually make you all the same. It only says that what makes us unequal is of no relevance to the state's concern, or in the case of Prop 209, to admissions considerations. It's simply irrelevant. So colorblindness, which is what the Civil Rights Initiative was promulgating, sounds prejudice-free. You're not going to be looked at in terms of your race. But if race is, among other things, a site of social power, if it's not just an indifferent marking, but if it is that through which the social organization of access to a range of institutions wealth, health, education, and so forth have been historically organized, 
then for the state to insist on its blindness to it is actually, again, to consecrate that power as it currently operates. For the state to insist on its neutrality is actually to take a side. Now, that's not Marx's main focus. It's an implication of his argument, I think. But it is what he means by political emancipation. Political emancipation is the state's announcement through law or decree that the social powers that organize us and separate us from one another and produce conflict are of no political relevance. They're not relevant to our standing before the law. Political emancipation is literally to be politically emancipated from being positioned by the state in terms of your class or property holding or wealth or education. It's instead to make law equal to all. Now Marx contrasts that political emancipation, which he's in favor of because it's progress. It's better than not being politically emancipated. It's better than being excluded from standing before the law because you're poor or because you're black or because you're female. It's better than that. But true human emancipation, which I'll try to talk a little bit more about at the end, would have to reach into the place, into civil society, where Marx argues these powers are operating. It would have to reach in there and transform them. Or as the translation goes, abolish them. It would have to eliminate their dividing, alienating, and stratifying effect. True human emancipation would have to not just eliminate their, their significance at the level of the state, how the state regards you, how the state turns away from them, it would have to reach in and really make them not matter. And that Marx doesn't know how to do yet. That's going to happen in the coming readings that we're looking at over the next week. But here, he's identified the problem. And remember, Marx told you that to formulate a problem correctly is to begin to be able to get the solution to it. And he doesn't think the Hegelians have formulated the problem correctly because they're always working at the level of ideas. They're always working at the state level. They're never thinking about where these powers actually operate. OK, that was all review. <laughs> and I'm going to try to move now to um, the critique of rights. But let me just see if there are any questions right there. Besides, why aren't there windows in here? <laughs> That's a good material question. OK. Let's go on. Imagine doing this every day, like being students in the Caribbean or something. There must be a way. You just handle it. And it probably helps that you have that azure sea right out there that you can go to afterwards. OK, here we go. Marx then proceeds to a different part of Bauer's argument and a different but related dimension of constitutional democracy, one he hasn't dealt with yet, which is the criticism of the rights of man. Why? Well, remember that Bauer argues that the Jew can't claim the rights of man. Why? Because as long as the Jew is really invested in his, and it's his in Bauer's case, Jewishness, as long as he is a Jew first, as long as he is a member of the abstract Jewish nation in Europe or anywhere else, as long as Judaism is his supreme identity, he has not made himself part of mankind. He's made himself a Jew first, and then there's the rest of mankind over there. If he's a Jew first and foremost, rather than a part of the universal that the rights of man are supposed to extend to, then he can't be emancipated. So Bauer says, no, he's got to get rid of that. He can still be Jewish in some way. He has to assimilate, though, and he has to be part of mankind and subscribe to the universal laws and rules of mankind as they are embodied in the state. And the state, in turn, has to do the same. It has to give up its religious identity and become fundamentally about these universals. Now, the rights of man, we need to remember, are really sacred things to all 19th and 20th century progressives. 
They're the rallying cry of the French Revolution. In our context, in the US, they're given the clearest voice by Tom Paine. They are encoded, in some ways, in the Bill of Rights in our Constitution. They're defended passionately today by the ACLU, but also by all of those deeply invested in human rights campaigns internationally. They are at the basis of the Declaration of International Human Rights. Marx subjects them to critique, not as bad in themselves. He's not against them. He's not trying to throw them back. He doesn't want to reject them. But remember, critique for him is always trying to figure out what the premises of something are, what the structure of something is that's presenting a problem that it can't quite resolve. And he wants to read rights as, in some ways, a symptom of a society not yet free. Humans who are not yet in collective control of the powers that organize them. Humans who are not yet emancipated, but rather have to defend themselves against one another and defend their particular holdings in society against one another. He sees above all that rights are objects which we use to defend ourselves against certain powers and against each other. They are not actually powers that we have in common. They're kind of the opposite of what the state is representing us as being. So how does Marx do this? At the top of 42, and I'm going to do this kind of quickly, not so much by reading, but I'm going to give you markers where, where this critique of rights happens. So um, at the top of 42, he begins with the right to liberty. And he's, he's using a kind of amalgam of various constitutions and proclamations of rights of man. He's using the Declaration of the Rights of Man of 1793, but then he also goes to various uh, constitutions to, to, to get at some of what, how, how the rights of man manifest themselves. He says the rights of man at the top of 42 are fundamentally equality, liberty, security, and property. The right to equality, the right to liberty, the right to security, and the right to property. We could add private property. He starts by talking about liberty on the top of 42. And he reads um, from Article 6 of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. And it says, liberty is the power which man has to do everything which does not harm the rights of others. Liberty is the power to do everything which doesn't harm the rights of others. So we're far from Tocqueville's idea of freedom to govern in common through a certain kind of Republican participation and so on and so forth. Marx renders this liberty, as he puts it, as the liberty of man as an isolated monad withdrawn into himself. Liberty, he points out, is not founded upon relations between man and man. It's founded upon the separation of man from man. And this is our own intuition about liberty. Leave me alone, that's my right. I, I assert my right to separate myself from you. But remember the, the prey Marx is chasing here. Are the rights of man really an embodiment of our universal uh, participation in the idea of humanity. And what he says is, with liberty it's clear that's not true because all it is is really a right to separate from one another. Property, he calls, the practical application of the right of liberty and further specifies it as the right of self-interest. It's the right to do what one wants without regard for others as long as it doesn't trespass on their property. Liberty and property together, he says, and I'm still on 42, lead every man to see in other men not the realization but the limitations of their own liberty. So property, too, is simply the right of self-interest. It's, 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 it's um, a way of navigating or seizing upon a, a particular element of that power that is now circulating through civil society. Equality, he declares, has no political significance, quite a claim to make. Why? Because he says equality is nothing more than the equal right to liberty. That's all it is. That's all equality is in, in, in the constitutional democratic state. It's the right to be treated the same way everyone else is by the law, which is to say you get the same liberty everybody else gets. 
And that, he says, in turn, means that everybody has the same right to be a self-sufficient monad, to be an atomistic individual. To be equal before the law is not substantive equality in, in any sense. It's not equal power. It's just the right to have the same access to the liberties that everyone else has. Whether you're a, a, a homeless person or a billionaire, you get the right to private property. And then security. Security, he refers to as the supreme concept of civil society, the concept of the police. What does he mean? Security, which remember from Hobbes to Locke and forward, has been the promise of the state that, that if we'll give up all our unlimited rights, we'll get security ensured by the state, is to be secure in one's rights, in one's individualistic, monadic behavior. This right, he points out, doesn't raise society above its egoism, it assures it. It consecrates that egoism as preoccupying, as what all of us are invested in. We each lock up our own stuff, our own house, and, and our own things, and expect the police to help ensure that we are all taking care of our own um, existence. So what's happened here? Well, according to Marx, the rights of man establish man as an individual separated from others, withdrawn into himself, wholly preoccupied with his private interests. That's drawn from page 43. I'll read it again. The rights of man establish man as in an individual separated from others, withdrawn from himself, and wholly preoccupied with his private interests. So that to the extent that there is a community a political community in the state, it exists, Marx says, only to secure these rights. It turns out now that the political community, the place where we have universality, liberty, equality, fraternity, has been turned into a mere means for our individual pursuits. The political community, the, the togetherness we have through the rights of man, is a mere means to individual ends. There's no man, there's no collective man here. In any sense, there's only individuals chasing after their own desires in the context of powers that they don't control. We're chasing after our own desires in a domain, the domain of civil society, where we now have these nameless, depoliticized powers, stratification by wealth, by education, by rank, and we, we've added in some others. We can't name them because they've been depoliticized. They no longer have formal standing in the state. But all we're doing now is zealously pursuing our own desires in the context of this society, rife with stratifying, atomizing powers, in which we can't name the powers, we can't argue with the powers, we just, as Marx says, experience them as whim or caprice, or um, a way of being kind of buffeted about. Now, in the course of this critique, what Marx is also doing is developing his own philosophy of history to counter Hegel's. And I want to turn to that very briefly before turning to human emancipation and then moving on to the German ideology. Marx agrees with Hegel that history progresses dialectically toward a realization of human freedom, that that's where history is going, that we are creatures driven by history in one way or another to become free. But he disagrees with Hegel about the character of the dialectic, the opposites that are producing the conflict and producing new possibilities. And he disagrees with Hegel on the character of the freedom that we are bound to achieve. In Marx's view, what's happened is that the powers or forces, or as it's translated in your text, elements, distinguishing groups of people from one another in feudalism, in the old regime, in the old society, those elements that distinguish groups of people from one another are being thrown off 
in this new society, in, in constitutional democracy. He can't yet name it capitalism, but he's describing that. These elements that distinguish us from one another are being thrown off as political identities, but they haven't yet been revolutionized, as Marx will say it, at the level of material life. They haven't been thrown off or transformed materially. They've only been thrown off at the level of state proclamations, laws, and identities. As he puts it, Marx puts it, political revolution, the, revolu the French Revolution, other revolutions, even the German one, dissolves civil society into its elements. That's on the one hand individuals, and on the other hand all these forces or material, bits of material life that, that, that have been thrown off as, as identities in the state. It dissolves civil society into its elements without revolutionizing these elements or subjecting them to criticism. So, concretely, property and class no longer determine your political standing. You're just a citizen, like every other citizen. But they continue to operate as social power. They determine your possibilities in life. And frankly, they even determine your true standing before the law. If you can afford to lawyer up to the tune of several million dollars, if something happens to you versus having a public defender assigned to you, your fate is probably likely to be a little different depending on the crime. Now to see how this argument unfolds, Marx's argument about the transition from feudalism to capitalism, not yet named capitalism, just kind of named constitutional democracy or sometimes bourgeois society, how this argument unfolds, um, you should look closely at 44 to 45. I'm not going to take you through every detail right now, but it's one of the more readable parts of the essay. And what Marx will say is that what you see in feudalism is everywhere our political standing in feudalism directly correlates with our social or economic standing. So if you're an aristocrat or if you're a serf, that's known and named politically, that, has, that corresponds to your actual political existence. What changes in this new society is that that's thrown off. Now we're all just declared equals in the abstract. And Marx considers this, again, a great emancipation, a great forward step, because, as he says, every emancipation is a restoration of the human world and human relations to man himself. So it's a step. It's a step of recovering the powers that we really, that belong to us, that are really human powers, that are humanly generated things. It's a step of getting this, toward getting this stuff back. But it's not yet a complete emancipation. Complete emancipation, Marx tells us on the very last paragraph of the section that we read, which is page 46, very last paragraph, will only be, will only be accomplished when there's no longer a split between political society and civil society. When you no longer have this universal set of proclamations about who we are abstractly that is utterly at odds with who we are concretely in civil society. Once who we are concretely in civil society really does amount to equality, freedom, universality, and community, once that happens, you no longer need a separate state proclaiming these things in contradistinction to who we actually are. Now, that doesn't mean that at this point Marx is saying the state has no other function, but it certainly doesn't have that function. It, is no longer the f it no longer has the function of being the political enunciator of what we are not. It no longer has the function of transcending our actual existence and representing us at odds with how we really live and what the powers are that really organize us in everyday, ordinary life. Now again, Marx doesn't have the language he needs yet to explain how this is going to be pulled together. What he's doing, remember, is critique. He's trying to figure out why the Jewish question comes up as it does, what it symptomizes, 
what the various attempts at resolving it miss, and what it tells us about the larger issues of the current state civil society relationship. On the Jewish question in itself, he has come to the conclusion that there's no reason whatsoever for Jews to be excluded from citizenship because they are in just as much a state of particularity and egoism and self-interest as everybody else is. That's the nature of this civil society. There's absolutely no reason to say they don't belong in this order. But that's not really his interest. His interest became, as this essay progressed, entirely the question of the state civil society relationship, what it told him about where real politics and equality have to be addressed, which is precisely not in the state, not at the level of ideas, not at the level of changing laws, but in the place where, as he puts it, the real elements organizing the lives of everyday lives of human beings can be found. Those real elements, which he'll call later social powers, are found in civil society. You're not going to find them at the state. The state's just going to keep making proclamations about how it doesn't discriminate. But that does not remove the structural powers that stratify, separate, isolate, and pit us against one another. OK, I am going to stop with this text here and then move to this one. So I just need to know if you have questions at this point. Okay. Either you're too hot to think or <laughs> it's perfectly clear. I'll go with the fantasy that it's perfectly clear. I know better. Yes. Thank you. Not in this essay. Marx never concretely sets out how to reach true human emancipation. He can't get there in this essay. He doesn't have the categories he's going to need. And the fundamental category that he's going to need is, well, a couple of categories, but he's going to need what it is in civil society that is for him the most importantly structuring social power that separates and isolates us. He will find it soon. He's going to start chasing it down in his next writings through the idea of labor and property, and he'll eventually arrive at capital. When he gets at that, he's got it. Then he's going to tell you how to get emancipated. But it's frustrating. It's like, um, well, just think of it as a sequel, you know, like where you have to wait a whole season for the next, you know, to figure out who shot JR. Okay. a great question. I think the benefit, it's a, it's a question we have to speculate about. I think the benefit is that we now have the idea of the value. We now subscribe to the value. We in this room, for the most part, could agree that human beings ought to be treated equally, that equality and freedom, let's just put it this way, that equality and freedom ought to be generalized, that it's not that this half ought to be equal and free and this half ought to be indentured servants or serfs or, or bought or unequal or subordinated or something like that. It's that we have that articulated as a political ideal and that that political ideal will come into direct contradiction or conflict with its, with its unrealized state in, in our everyday lives. And that's hopeful. So I think, I think that, but I don't think it's that we'll hash it out ourselves so much uh, individually, but that we have an idea of a, a, a generally shared idea and ideal um, inscribed in the state that is contradicted by everyday life um, that will force us or, or provoke us to realize it. But he doesn't quite work that out in this essay either. It's a progress because he thinks it's better than the idea that we are naturally born to place in a hierarchy, that some are free and some are not, that we are naturally unequal, that there's only a few people who really qualify for the status of man, and that everybody else is subhuman or non-human.
and, and, freeing and, and freeing us all and making us all genuinely equal. And by genuinely equal, we also don't know what he means yet. But yes, by freeing us all. That, that it's, uh, it's articulating the idea of universal emancipation. So it's making us one, but it's also freeing us all. Then I think it's important to hold both of those because remember when I said at the beginning, we already have an idea of what Marx is and we think it's communism and we think communism is a certain bunch of things. And one of the things a lot of us think it is when we just are asked to say what it is, it's everybody being made one. Okay, so Marx is interested in the fact that all these theorists in his era are articulating the oneness of humankind, the universality, the political community of humankind. And Hegel in particular is talking about the political community in the state. So he's interested in that, but they're also all talking about freedom, and Marx is also interested in that. How do you really free a human being? Hegel says, well, you free them by declaring their freedom at the level of the state. And Marx says, yeah, but that doesn't seem to free them. They're, they're, like, they're declared free and they're still living in this world in which they're all um, um, suffering the, the, the organization of their life by the conditions that the state just freed itself from. The state just freed itself from private property, but human beings are still bound to a world completely organized by it. So he's also, it's not just about oneness, it's also about this business of getting free. What does it really take to free humanity? Right behind you. A little louder for me, please. Great. So the next thing Marx is going to do is ask a version of that question, which is, what is human nature? What is the nature of human beings? in relationship to what we imagine to be our essential attachments. And we're going to look at that very question in the German ideology. So we're going right to the question that you're posing. So shall we go? No, let's have one more question. Yeah. The question was, could I clarify the difference or the relation or the identity between communal being and species being? Species being is a weird term, comes from this other guy that Marx was really attached to, named Ludwig Feuerbach. Um, it was Feuerbach's idea that we humans have not just a sense of ourselves as individuals, but our sense of ourselves as a species, as man. We understand something at the level of consciousness about who we are as a species. But, argued Feuerbach, we don't really live that. We have that idea, but we don't really live our species being. We don't live our collective capacity and potential. We live in a certain estrangement from that. That's enough Feuerbach from, for now. Marx takes over the term He's interested in this idea of species being as our lived experience of being part of the species mankind as opposed to just being individuals all antagonistic to one another and in competition with each other and trying to survive alone. It's not a claim about whether we're fundamentally gregarious or not. It's rather a claim that he's drawing from Feuerbach and a bunch of others really in the 18th and 19th century about our mm, collective capacity as a species and our consciousness of that and our desire to realize that capacity. So uh, periodically he talks about the political community, which is why I put communal up there. And I probably should have just put political community. As in, for the Hegelians, the realization of that species being. That's where we know we are part of man. We have the rights of man together. We are a, a people together. It's not quite that we're the whole species together, but we're at least the US together, or we're the French together, or we're the Germans together. We are a people together. And also, in the very idea of popular sovereignty, we are ruling and, 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 and uh, controlling our existence together. 
So the relation between species being and political community is a little watery, but let's call them affiliates. Let's call them cousins. And if we had a whole seminar, we could get it tighter. Yeah. So we had one of those questions that I sometimes put in a bottle and take out of the class. I'll just tell you what it was. Is it kind of close to Heidegger's Dasein? Everyone else is going to what? Who's? So <laughs> um, it's kind of close to the idea of being, um, but it's a little different. And I'm really happy to talk with you about it in office hours. And I'm not forbidding such questions. I'm just saying when such questions like that come up and, they, and we don't have a common text, I'll take them and invite you to discuss them with me outside. OK. That has that old ring of the Western. You've come outside and talk with me about this. <laughs> OK. So let's go on to the German ideology. I need to get you started on it. As we leave the Jewish question, there are some big things Marx has introduced that we haven't understood yet. And we just talked about some of them. First of all, what's the relationship between Hegelian philosophy, idealist philosophy, the emphasis on consciousness and ideas, as that which makes the world go round? What's the relationship between Hegelian philosophy and the self-representation of the constitutional state? That is, this idea that the state is what makes us free and equal and brings us together in universal ways. Put another way, Marx is working with the hunch that both that Hegelian philosophy and the self-representation of the state are wrong, but also that they're conservative in some ways. They're conserving something about the status quo that needs to be freed. And we need to know what the relationship is between idealism and the ideology of the constitutional state. We also need to know the thing we just talked about. What is really required for true human emancipation? How are you going to get there? What do you have to do? And what Marx has been able to identify as a problem but not answer is what is the larger theory of history needed that the, going to be that's going to replace an idealist account. How did we come to this pass in the first place? How did we get to this place where we have this organization of things, a very abstract formulation of us in the state as free and as equal and as brothers, sisters, and at the same time, a reality in civil society that contradicts that? And more precisely, a question several of you asked on the very first day we studied Marx, what does his materialism consist in? What's he, what's he going to stuff materialism with that, that, that will produce a, a counter to idealism? So these are the things that we will learn in the German ideology. We need to start with what it is. It's a text, but what does Marx mean by it? It has both a philosophical and a political dimension as he is thinking about the, the phenomenon. German philosophy, idealist philosophy, we already know a tiny bit about. We know that in it, consciousness creates the world. And consciousness and ideas have a kind of independent existence or development. So the history of ideas for Hegel is kind of the history of the world. That's the irony and the joke of the first paragraph in Marx's own attack on the German ideology. The idea that everything, everything important in the world happens at the level of ideas. Even the most critical Hegelians, even the most lefty of the left Hegelians, believe that you change the world by changing consciousness or phrases or representations of things, ways of things, talking about things. So, for example, to make the example modern, we would address sexism in society by simply speaking always of persons rather than women and men, and talk about everyone in society as if they're just persons, and thereby end sexism, end um, identification of, of humans 
in sexed and gendered ways and that that would bring an end to sexism as such. Now, Marx's view is that this is an a philosophy that is replicated in German politics itself. Because, as we've just seen in the Jewish question, the tendency is, he thinks, to try to fix social and political problems by talking about them differently or thinking about them differently or by emphasizing changes in the law or changes in consciousness rather than reaching into the conditions that produce the problems in the first place. So what Marx does in the German ideology is try to, among other things, show why you get idealist philosophy, Hegelian philosophy, when you have this particular kind of state society relationship. That is, he's trying to show why and how idealism as a way of thinking about politics and thinking about history why it arises out of the ground of what he's now going to start being able to call bourgeois capitalist society. Why you get idealism when you get this particular form of society. Let me put it another way. Marx is, at the same time he's developing a materialist philosophy of history, going to give you a materialist explanation for why you get idealism in philosophy and in the state when you do. He's going to try to explain why you get this belief in the power of ideas and the law as an historical force. Why you get this belief that they lead an independent life and that they fix problems. That's why he refers to the connection of German philosophy with German reality. But at the same time, what Marx is going to try to do is show you the right way to think about history and reality. And that's where he will finally satisfy, to some degree, those of you who've been waiting to find out, well, okay, if this idealism stuff is nonsense, then how do you be a materialist? So let's find out how you be a materialist. And that's what we'll do for the last 10 minutes today, or 15. The discussion of how to be a materialist starts on page 149. And here you probably will want your texts out, so just grab them if you don't already have them. Marx tells you on 149 that to be a materialist, or the way he's going to develop materialism, involves starting with premises. You always have to start with premises. There's no other way for human thinking to begin. But he says at the bottom of 149, second to last full paragraph, the premises from which we begin are not arbitrary ones. They're not dogmas. They're real premises. And what does he mean by that? We start with real individuals, with their activity and the material conditions under which they live. So that's where we're starting. We're not starting with how we think about people, ideas we might have about the nature of man, are we naturally competitive, are we naturally attached to private property, are we naturally moral, good, evil, bad, religious, rational, etc. We're just going to start by figuring out what human beings do. How they live. How do they live? What does he mean by that? We're going to start with the existing of re existence of real individuals, what we do, our activity, and the material conditions under which they live. And then he adds, both those which they already find existing and those produced by their activity. So we're, we're, we're born into a world, there's already some conditions around for our survival, and then there's some that we add to the mix. Okay, so far it's a little vague going to get a lot of specificity and you have to think about each premise as it builds because within 10 minutes we're going to have full-blown if elementary materialism okay so the first premise of all human history bottom paragraph is of course the existence of living human individuals human history can't move if you don't have live humans 
Thus, the first fact to be established is the physical organization of these individuals and their consequent relation to the rest of nature. Okay, again, the contrast here is with abstracted individuals, the idea of man. We, rather than starting with what we say or imagine or conceive about ourselves, Marx wants to begin with the content and relation constitutive of our survival. And, and this is a pretty radical move, because in political theory, it's not just the Hegelians who start out with the idea of man or the consciousness of man. Almost everyone in, in, in the history of political theory who's reflected on human nature starts out with some attributes they give us. Aristotle, man's a rational animal, born to live in the polis. Hobbes, man is by nature desirous, self-interested, diffident, anxious, etc. Rousseau, we're naturally self-sufficient, but we're also compassionate. We have pity. We're, we're easily corruptible, but we're born free. All of these things are ways of describing us at the level of a kind of moral bearing or intellectual capacity or religious development, but they're not focused on what we actually do, how we live, how we survive. So Marx asks, not what's our idea of human beings or human nature, but what do real, live, concrete individuals do? And on page 150, first full paragraph, he tells us what we do as a species that is distinctive is produce our means of subsistence. Okay, so let's just read this. Men can be distinguished from animals by consciousness, religion, anything else you like. They begin to distinguish themselves from animals. The way we are distinguished from other animals is as soon as we begin to produce their means of subsistence, hunting, gathering, building houses, all those things that we associate with human capacities to live. A step, he adds, which is conditioned by their physical organization. So. We already have our capacity to produce our means of subsistence. We're productive animals by nature. That's who we are by nature. We produce our subsistence. We don't just find it. We don't just hang out. We don't just go kill something and then go lie around and wait until our stomachs get small again. We, we produce our subsistence. We build for ourselves. We sow. We reap. We make auditoriums, we produce education, we do all kinds of things, but at the most minimal level, we produce for ourselves. That's the kind of animals we are. But as soon as we begin to produce our subsistence, we note, he says, that this is conditioned by our physical organization. We'll do it really differently here, at this time in this place, than we would in some other time and place with a different physical organization, a different organization of who we are as humans. Then he adds, by producing their means of subsistence, men are indirectly producing their actual material life. What could it mean? By producing our, our, our means of subsistence, by, by doing what we have to do to survive, we're actually beginning to produce our whole material existence, the way we relate and associate, the tools we need, the family forms we have, and so forth. There's a whole bunch of things that fall out from producing our subsistence, or he just puts it, etches it lightly here, producing our actual material life, our material existence, our existence in the material world. Okay, so what do we know so far? What we do as a species that's distinctive is produce for ourselves. We don't just live, we make our existence. And this, in turn, makes our actual material life. This is our species' uniqueness. And it will turn out this is the basis of human history. This is what's going to move human history forward. So it's not language, morality, intelligence, etc., that distinguishes us, but this really banal, so far, very boring, very unspecified thing. So let's go to the next premise. Top of second full paragraph. The way in which men produce their means of subsistence 
depends, first of all, on the nature of the actual means of subsistence they find in existence and have to reproduce. What's he telling us? How we produce for ourselves depends upon what's there already, what, what mode of production we're born into, what economic order is already in place when we arrive. We don't start from scratch every time. Quite literally, we don't reinvent the wheel every time we produce our subsistence. We work with the, the, the technologies, the resources, and above all, the divisions of labor and modes of production already in place. So it's a historically conditioned matter, this, this thing we do by nature. We don't miscellaneously invent a mode of production. We don't produce microchips in 12th century France. We don't engage in large-scale peasant farming in Berkeley. So, although we're doing some other things these days. So this thing that distinguishes us, but it's not large-scale peasant farming. We're doing things with our backyards. So this thing that distinguishes us, it's not in our hands. It's, it, this is really important. It's a, it's, it's, we are already historical animals in a way that no other animal is. It's not that there's not natural history. It's not that there's not evolution elsewhere. We're not talking about evolution here. We're talking about history making. This thing that distinguishes us, which is that we produce for our subsistence, always occurs within history and in turn is what generates history. What we do, what we are, depends on the historical time and place we're born into. So what we humans do and what we humans are is always historical. It's always historical. It's not just transcendental. It's not transhistorical. It's not like there's one constant human activity or human nature that goes through the ages. More about this in a second. Let's get through the rest of the premises. Now, Marx says, this mode of production, I'm still in that second full paragraph, must not be considered simply as being the reproduction of the physical existence of the individuals. However, production is organized, isn't just making us survive. Rather, it's a definite form of activity of these individuals. It's a form of expressing their life. It's a mode of life on their part. Peasant farming makes peasants and makes a whole peasant way of life. Of one probably far richer than most of us can imagine. It makes forms of subjectivity, it makes forms of family, it makes forms of relationality, it probably makes forms, very specific forms of sexuality, it probably makes very specific forms of language and literacies, and um, just as contemporary modes of production, what we also often call the informatic or post-Fordist age, makes those as well. Okay, so what we know now is that this form, this thing we do, which is producing our subsistence, makes a whole mode of production, makes a whole material life, and also is something we in turn become. We express it. We are that. As individuals express their life, he continues, so they are. So, so what we do, how we produce our life, how we produce our subsistence, the era we're born into, the, the things we're making, the way that labor is organized, the way that family forms fall out of this, this produces particular kinds of individuals. As we express our life, that's who we are. He continues, he's trying to find the right way to say this, what they are therefore, what individuals are therefore, coincides with their production, both with what they produce and how they produce. The nature of individuals, this is the bottom line, the nature of individuals thus depends on the material conditions determining their production. So, peasant farming in feudal France or information processing in a globalized economy doesn't just pay the rent. It produces particular kinds of human beings who will express their humanness as human beings born out of this particular mode of relations will have particular social, cultural, religious, and political forms, a mode of production, a particular mode of production then, amounts to how we produce and what we produce, including who owns, who controls, who labors, 
what the division of labor is. In other words, Marx is talking about an economy here. He is talking about economics. But he's talking about economy in the biggest, broadest sense. It's never just about making stuff. Making stuff is what human beings do. We make for our existence. But as we make, the way we make, the organization that goes into that making, the development of technologies and relations, and all that comes out of it is a whole mode of life. It's a life form. It produces us. We don't just produce it. So, to answer the question I postponed about 30 minutes ago, what we call human nature, for Marx, is unfixed because it's historically shaped. There's no constant human nature except for one constant. We produce for our subsistence. And you know what? Even that constant, by the end of our work, is going to go out the door because he's going to find that we can reach a point in history where we have developed forces of production and technologies of production so spectacularly that we no longer fundamentally have to do that. And our freedom and our creativity can go elsewhere. But what he's saying at this point is that what we call human nature is absolutely unfixed because it's always historically shaped by the mode of production and that means the how, the what, and the order of production. There's no constant human nature because different modes of production make different creatures out of us. Not simply what we do or what we eat, but what we are, how we feel, how we think, how we relate to one another. All these are historical and mode of production specific. What kind of familial forms we have, what other forms of association we have, what form of state we have. We're creeping up on the answer that, to that question. Why did we get this state now? Why did we get this weird political life form now in which we're declared free and equal and universal, but we're actually not? Marx is beginning to be able to answer this, but I get ahead of myself. Let's finish uh, materialism. So, Marx concludes, if we go to the last line of the second paragraph, as I said, the nature of individuals depends on the material conditions determining their production. At the level that we ordinarily call human nature, we humans are the product of, the effect of, the way that we make our world, make our subsistence, and as we make our subsistence, make a whole world. And as we make our subsistence, we are making history. We are generating history because we are generating much more than production. We're generating whole modes and organizations of production that require particular political forms, particular social forms, and so forth. So from little premise number one, way back then, 20 minutes ago, where we simply agreed we were going to start with living human beings. We weren't going to start with any abstract ideas about our good, our evil, our proclivities, our selfishness, our altruism, anything else. We're just going to start with what human beings do. They produce for their subsistence. We've come a very long way because now for Marx, what human beings are, what we are, is conditioned by our mode of production. There's no constant human nature other than the fact that we are always shaped by the mode of producing our world. Sure, he'll, ac he'll accept the idea that human beings need love and to be loving, that we're somewhat, though, imperfectly gregarious. But he will not accept the idea that you can speak of us as fundamentally cooperative, or fundamentally competitive, or fundamentally altruistic or selfish, or compassionate or cruel, and all the other things that psychologists and political theorists and geneticists and New York Times science commentators are always declaring that they have discovered we fundamentally are. Why? Because for Marx, we are fundamentally shaped by our mode of production. And as that mode alters, which it always does, always in a state of historical change, more about that later, will alter too. So we could say that I am more different from my counterpart, whoever she is, 
in 12th century Egypt, then my cat is different from his counterpart in 12th century Egypt. That's not to say there might be some differences we don't know about, about those two cats, but that's what Marx is trying to get at, that I am a very, very, very different human being because of the world that I produce, I join with others in producing, but don't do of my own choosing because I'm born into that world because production is always also a historically conditioned affair. So as the mode of production alters, so do we. And not only does it alter us, it will give shape to states, to family forms, to nations, to every degree of association that human beings have. And that's what you get on the rest of page 150, is that the whole internal structure of the nation, class forms, government, society, a range of social structures, all of those things will, as he puts it, continually evolve out of the life process of individuals. So let me make one last point and I'll stop. Marx says, I'm going to flip now over to page 154, draw your attention to one other passage here. Second full paragraph. The fact is that as Therefore, that definite individuals, productively active in a definite way, enter into definite social and political relations, blah, blah, blah. The social structure and the state are continually evolving out of the life process of definite individuals. So our life process, what we're actually generating by way of our productive relations. But of individuals, not as they may appear in their own or other people's imaginations, but as they really are, okay, it's beginning to draw a distinction between our life process as we might think about it, as we might imagine it, and as it really is. He's starting to be able to make a claim here about material reality that he is going to teach us how to apprehend, which is where we'll go next time. So our life process, as, 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 as they really are, um, definite individuals, as they really are, as they operate, produce materially, and work under definite material limits, presuppositions, and conditions independent of their will. Independent of their will. This is the last point I want to underscore, which is that Marx is describing history as a totally human thing. Human beings produce it according to the ways, the complex ways that we produce our subsistence. It's one thing to scratch together a little food and shelter in a fairly primitive fashion. It's another thing to do the kind of thing we do now, food, shelter, educational institutions, churches, states, um, uh, entertainment forms, all the things that we produce for our subsistence, extremely elaborate now. But what Marx is also telling us is that we individuals are produced by this mode of producing for our existence, and we are produced by conditions and presuppositions independent of our will. We make history, humans make history, through production of our existence, but not according to their will. And I want to emphasize this point because we have a paradox in Marx that's really important to him. History is a fully human thing, but it's not completely under our sway. Precisely because we are historical, because we don't choose the conditions into which we are born. We make our own history, he says, but not just as we please. We don't make it under circumstances chosen by ourselves, but under those transmitted from the past. Now he's going to take us to a place where he thinks human beings finally can make their own history. But we're not there yet. So, and despite the noise outside, and despite the heat, we have seven minutes. You have no more class this week. There's no class on Thursday. I want you to take a moment, ask questions about materialism, because you'll need it in order to get through the rest of the German ideology. Yes, thank you. Quiet, everybody else. Thank you.
So the question is, is materialism just the institutions that man has made over time? No. Materialism is, for Marx, a way of thinking about what dimensions of human existence make human life, make power, make history. So it's contrasted to idealism. Remember the idealist said, maybe we could just close that or, yeah, glare at them. Hegel told us, Human beings make history according to the ideas they have, according to the big ideas that dominate history. And Marx is saying, no, history is made according to the way that human existence is produced by humans. And we don't yet know all the details of that, but it will involve a division of labor. It will involve pretty quickly on and early on a split between those who own and control and those who labor but it will have a different form in slave societies, in feudal societies, in competitive capitalist societies, in monopoly capitalist societies. It will have different forms, but materialism points to, or, 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 or is for Marx, the domain of life that generates history and generates everything else about human life. And it's everything that comes out of the fact that we have to produce for our subsistence. So it's not just institutions, but institutions are part of it. It's not just work, but work is part of it. It's not just ownership and control, but ownership is, and control are part of it. It's the whole business of, of, of what we today call an, an economy and all of its effects. Marx doesn't consider the economy separate from the family form that it generates, you get extended kinship in feudalism. You get families reduced to single parent households in, in late capitalism. The religious forms that it generates, you get less and less religion, more and more secularism or atheism um, in this period. The state form that it generates, why you get monarchy in feudalism, why you get the constitutional um, universal free state here. So it's, it's, it's all of that. Does that come near your question? Okay, great. Yes? So, um, what, what is hard to think about idealism and like ideas? Because you think that they're irrelevant? Great. Great question. So the next thing you're going to read is Marx explaining where ideas come from, why they don't come out straightforwardly. If everything comes out of material life, why don't we just see that? Why don't we just see transparently that everything comes out of material life? Why do you even get crazies, in his view, like Hegel, saying, no, no, ideas make the world go round? And why do you get distortions, like ideology, that says you're free and equal when actually you're not? So the next thing Marx will do is try to explain in this text, just a few pages later, where ideas come from in relationship to material life. And then we have to take on the question you ask, which is, do they matter? Are they just effects? Are they just derivative? Should we not even pay attention to them? Or do they matter? And I'll be arguing that they do matter, that what Marx ultimately will do is, is understand there's a dialectic between ideas, like the idea of our freedom in the state, and material life and a, and a desire to revolutionize or transform it in order to realize those ideas. So we will see that they matter. But our next question is, where do they come from? If material life generates everything about us, where do, what, do they also generate ideas? Marx will say yes. And if that's so, how and in what sense do they matter? Last question.
He doesn't say that life will be determined by it. He sees the ideal of communism, which is circulating in his time. There are plenty of people running around with communist ideas in his time. He's seen the extent to which communism addresses certain contradictions or mm, conflicts in the existing mode of production, capitalist mode of production, and the way that it addresses them. So he's seen it tentatively at this point as a, as a, as a form that promises to resolve the contradictions in the existing state of things. He doesn't, however, say, here's my idea, let's go chase the idea. He will never say that. Except maybe we'll see him say that a little in the manifesto, and then we have to figure out how come. So, no class on Thursday. Read and read and read again if it's unclear. And I'll see you next Tuesday. All right. There's a lot going on on campus right now. Um, so you'll get your next paper topics on Thursday, and they will concern Marx and Mill. Um, and we're just in the process of refining the topic, but I will just give you a heads up that will actually concern what's going on in that plaza right now. <laughs> um, it seems to me that the revival of the debate about affirmative action that is happening right now over uh, proposed legislation and um, the debate that's happening on this campus is just ripe for thinking through Marx and Mill. So that's what we'll be asking you to do, but um, we're working on refining it. So just in case you were feeling a dilemma about whether to stay out in Sproul Plaza or come in here, I want you to know they'll soon come together, but not viscerally, intellectually. OK, today we are continuing in the German ideology. And let me just remind you that what Marx is doing in this text is kind of in between what he was doing in the Jewish question and what he's doing in um, Das Kapital, which we'll get to on Thursday. Namely, he's still working against the Hegelians, but he's also trying to get beyond the terms that they've set for political argument. He's trying to push into his own way of understanding history, development, freedom, consciousness, ideology. He's trying to get at his own method and get his own focus and throw off the method and the focus that he thinks is wrong-headed in Hegel and the Hegelians. And eventually, he's going to leave them behind and especially leave behind some of their preoccupations as he finds himself more and more focused on the order of material life, namely political economy. He's also beginning to identify the Hegelians and the arguments that are going on in his time with a whole structure of power and ideology that he finds problematic. Let me invite the folks who just came in. If you want a real seat, you can have one. But if you're happy where you are, that's fine. But just take your time, climb in. And I'll take this moment to say, I know everybody wants an aisle seat in life. That's like the premium seat. It's like right up there with getting an upgrade. But, um, but the problem is if you come in early and you take an aisle seat, then you're just going to have a lot of people climbing over you. And I guess if you don't mind, that's that. But it, it does make it a little tricky. So. I don't know, you work it out. But it's just a reminder that if you sit on the aisle and there's three seats next to you, probably three people are going to climb over you and feel embarrassed as they do it. But back to Marx. So Marx is trying to get his own focus, his own method. And as he's doing so, he's identifying Hegel and the Hegelians and the problems and the debates around him with a whole structure of power and ideology. He's starting to see the idealists and... German ideology more generally, which is what he's carrying on about in the opening of this text, 
not merely as wrong-headed philosophy, but as representing what he calls the illusions of the epoch, the illusions of the epoch. And he's starting to understand these illusions of the epoch as really crucial in keeping everyone around him from seeing where reality is, what the real elements of power in society are, and where the real struggle lies in society for justice or for freedom or for equality or however you want to put it in modern terms, he's still putting it in terms of the language of emancipation or inclusion or non-alienation. Okay, so that's just a reminder that Marx is in a kind of interim stage. He's, he's still trying to find his own footing. This text is very much about finding that footing. It's very much about trying to develop a materialist account that is counter to the idealist one that he thinks is so wrong-headed. And last time we saw the very beginnings of his account of how to be a materialist. And what we're going to do today is carry that further. Last time we just talked about the premises of materialism that he insists are so important, focusing on real human beings, what they actually do, seeing what they actually do as generating a whole world, what they actually do is produce their subsistence, and as they produce their subsistence, he says they produce a world. The way in which we produce for our subsistence in turn produces us, produces our relationships, produces our family forms, produces state, produces consciousness. Today we're going to take this a little further and focus on some elements of materialist analysis that first have to do with the production for human needs as what Marx calls the basis of all human history, the production for human needs as the basis of all human history. Then Marx will take us from there to understanding how classes are formed out of a division of labor, how the production for human needs produces a division of labor that in turn produces classes and produces a fundamental division that will really matter between what he calls mental and manual labor. I'm just giving you the forecast. We're then going to walk through this more carefully. And from that division of mental and manual labor, Marx is going to explain where ideology comes from, where the mystification of reality comes from. <coughs> I put this a little bit differently, still just introducing our problem for today. Last time, we considered how Marx begins to replace a notion of history as driven by ideas with his understanding of historical development as rooted in the actual existence of human beings, how we produce for ourselves, and hence how we produce the world. And he insisted everything about human societies stems from the fact that we of the animals don't merely live. We don't just survive from day to day. We make our existence, which includes our survival, but it also includes a world beyond survival. And we make our existence in a distinctive way, namely historically. We enter, we're born into a particular development or mode of production, a particular way of producing for our subsistence that already determines how we individuals and collectively will make our subsistence and produce a world as we do so. And we saw Marx argue that who we are and what form of social relations we ha have and again, what families and government and religious beliefs we have, all of these things in his mind issue from our mode of production, the way that production for our survival is organized. But we left with a problem last time, which is that if everything about us, including the way we think, our consciousness, our thoughts, if everything about us issues from how we produce for our subsistence, from how we produce and what we produce, then how do we account for ideology? And it's important to remember that for Marx, <coughs> ideology has a specific meaning. It does not just refer generally to a body of thought or a worldview. 
It refers to the specific distortion of reality. A specific distortion of reality, a specific, specific distortion of material truth or material reality that legitimates the status quo. So just quickly, if I were to say the ideology of the free market today is that we are all free, we are all equal, we all have the same opportunities, we all have the same possibilities. I'm just giving you a really crude version of it. Um, a, a, a counter would be, yeah, but that doesn't actually account for, that doesn't actually get at the truth of material reality who owns, who controls, who has nothing to sell but their labor, who starts where, how the distribution of wealth operates, how it's generated or, or, or sustained um, through kinship or through um, familial bequeathing of property, but also how it's concentrated, how it's, how it's secured by other powers and laws and so forth. So ideology, uh, this is just an example. This is, so, so the idea for Marx is that ideology is not just any body of thought or worldview. It's always a specific distortion of reality. And it's not just something that a few people believe. It refers for him pretty much to the dominant view in the age. So just to go back to something we already studied, if the ideology of the modern constitutional or liberal state is that we're all free and equal, we're all one, we're all the same, but material reality, as Marx suggested, is that we're not all the same and we are not emancipated and we are subject to powers in different ways and we are not in community with one another, then there's an ideology that we all kind of subscribe to or that prevails. Let's say we don't all believe it, but it prevails. It's the dominant view. And then there's something that it's not getting right, something that it's systematically distorting. So what Marx is trying to account for, among other things, in this text is where does ideology come from? How is it generated? If producing our world, producing our subsistence and producing our world also produces consciousness, how come we just don't see the world as it is? Why do we see it ideologically? Why aren't our ideas, why isn't our consciousness directly expressive of our actual condition in life? And put another way, why do ideas emerge and take hold and dominate that mystify reality? Why is social critique necessary at all? Why isn't the world just manifestly obvious? Why isn't, why isn't our material existence just apparent to us? Why aren't we all natural materialists and why aren't we just having the consciousness of how the world is actually organized. Why isn't the world transparent in thought? That is one of the crucial questions Marx is trying to answer in this text. Now, he's trying to answer a bunch of other questions, too, like all of Marx's early texts. This one is just stuffed with various kinds of concerns. And we can't take them all on. The one I'm going to focus on is the one I just described. So we want to know, why does the state, for example, represent us in a way that doesn't correspond to the reality of us? Why do we have that problem we learned about in the Jewish question? Where does that ideology come from? If all consciousness, as Marx puts it, is determined by life, and if life refers to how we produce our subsistence, if life is the mode of production. So the first keys to the answer to this question um, emerge on pages 154 and 5 and 6 and so forth. And so we're going to start there. I'll give you a moment if you want to take your text out. And I know that for some of you it's, it's easier actually to listen to things being read and take notes rather than working between the text. Plus you don't have a table in front of you. Our conditions aren't perfect, but do as you wish. Okay. So on the third full paragraph of page 154, Marx tells us that the production of ideas and conceptions and consciousness is, as he puts it, at first directly interwoven with the material activity of men. It's the language of real life. So he's suggesting that in the historical beginning, whenever that was, there isn't this mystification 
But then, as he proceeds through this paragraph, he introduces what becomes a, a, a quite important notion, the idea of the camera obscura, S-C-U-R-A, sorry. And we need to figure out what that is. Why, why, why consciousness begins to take off and lose its relationship to consciousness of actual existence. So let's take a look at this paragraph. Um, I'm going to start about eight lines from the bottom of it. Marx says, consciousness can never be anything else than conscious existence. And the existence of men is their actual life process. Okay, so far so good. Consciousness is our is, is consciousness of our actual existence. We think about and we reflect our actual existence. That's our actual life process, whatever we're doing. And then he adds, but if in, I added the but, if in all ideology, that distortion of the world, men and their circumstances appear upside down, as in a camera obscura, this phenomenon arises just as much from their historical life process as the inversion of objects on the retina does from their physical life process. Okay, that sentence has a lot packed into it. What is Marx saying? He's saying that if ideology tends to invert things, tends to reverse, for example, the relationship between ideas and material reality, suggesting that material reality is made by ideas rather than the other way around, or if it tends to invert things like freedom and unfreedom, if it, if, it, if it tends to proclaim us free when we're actually not free, that that very tendency, that tendency on the part of ideology to invert things, to distort and to reverse things, is itself something that emerges from our historical life process. It's something that itself can be materially explained. So he's going to do something complicated here. He's going to explain materially why ideology occurs and why ideology reverses reality. That's what we're going to chase down today. So he's also saying in this passage that there's something, as it were, almost natural about this. And he, of course, the natural part of it is the part that says, we know, he's excited by this knowledge, it appears in a lot of his different writings, that the retina doesn't actually take the world in right side up, it takes it in upside down. Remember when you learned that fascinating fact, whenever it was, physiology in sixth grade or something like that. And then the brain has to go through this project, this arduous project of writing the image. And Marx is suggesting that just as the brain has to write this upside down image that the retina has of the world, critique is going to have to write the upside down image that ideology gives us of the world. So critique is going to be just as systematic in getting at this upside down image and getting it to be right side up as the brain is in correcting for the retina's inversion of reality, the world. So we have to figure out why does consciousness apprehend the world in this upside down way, or why does rather ideology apprehend the world in this upside down way? What's Marx's materialist account of the ideological inversion of the world? That's the headache producing question that we are chasing down today. Now before we get the answer, we have to go through a little bit more development of materialism itself. For this, we turn to page 155, 6, and 7, because Marx has given us premises of materialism, but now he's going to add to these premises what he calls three moments in the development of history itself that are each important for us to digest. So the first one starts at the very bottom of 155, top of 156. He says the first historical act is the production of the means to satisfy human needs, the production of material life itself. 
What he's referring to here is that since human beings have needs, eating, sleeping, staying warm, cooling, etc., and these are not, as they are for some other animals, simply available to them in the wild, since we have to produce for these things, the first historical act is the production of means, that is, tools and processes, to take care of ourselves. Whether that's for hunting and gathering, or agriculture, or converting skins into warmth, or whatever else you can imagine as a first or initial set of human activities devoted to taking care of ourselves as humans. Things that keep us alive. So the first historical act, <clears throat> and the reason he calls it an historical act is that it's literally starting to initiate the making of a world, that thing that human beings do that's unique. The first historical act is the production of means, tools, processes, even relations, to satisfy our needs. But then he tells us, in the second full paragraph, the satisfaction of the first need, the action of satisfying, the instrument of satisfaction which has been acquired, leads to new needs. And this production of new needs is the first historical act. It's going to tell us everything's the first historical act because what he's trying to actually get at is the extent to which human history is itself always a project of bringing a world into being and is always a dynamic. It never stops. It doesn't, it's not like you just satisfy the need and then you're done. You've got a stick, you can, poke a piece of, you can poke a salmon in the river and now you've got a way to get food and that's done and history stops and it's over. Never. For Marx, Marx understands that's not the nature of human history. Human history is precisely continually developing processes. So this first need, producing tools to satisfy our needs, produces a plethora of new needs. Like what? Well, if you are trying to get a stick to stab the salmon, it would be easier if you had something that could sharpen that stick. You could just use any available rock, but if you find the right kind of rock and the right kind of rock to use on that rock to make it something like a primitive knife, in turn, you, you've now got a set of tool-making needs that you've produced. The same with everything else. The need for tools produces the need for the material for tools and more tools to make the tools, but also at the other end. So there's, I've given you the back, the, 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 the regressive dimension of producing new needs, that each need you have generates more. Like when I was your age, I didn't have to think about where my power cords were because that wasn't what we did, but now that's a definite need. You have to think about where they are. I'm probably making you anxious right now if you've forgotten yours or don't know where it is. But the point is that there's regressive needs, but there's also needs that generate more needs. Every human need, Marx is saying, leads to a new set of possible needs and a new set of possible relations. We have to make materials of tools, mine the earth, devise tools for these things. Another way of putting it is that for Marx, we never simply satisfy our needs. And he's not talking about insatiability. He's talking about the dynamic of history in which we produce an order of needs which is itself infinite. It just keeps generating possibilities backwards and forwards from the need we're focused on at the time. Then he says, the third historical act, or the third circumstance, as he puts it at the bottom, from which the very outset enters into historical development, is that men who daily remake their own life begin to make other men to propagate their kind. This is one of the places where the generic man really gets us into a bit of a bind. But what Marx is getting at is that human beings don't just provide for their subsistence, they also reproduce themselves, remake themselves. We reproduce ourselves literally as in making more humans, but we also reproduce our labor and our, our capacity to live. And this production and reproduction of life, he puts it, appears initially as both a natural and a social relation. A natural and a social relation. Indeed, Marx is saying that it's both but he's giving a peculiar meaning to both. What he's really getting at here is that it is our nature 
to produce social relations any time we are taking care of ourselves. It is our nature to produce the social, to take care of what we take to be our natural necessity. It's our nature to produce social relations in what he calls, for example, initially the family, larger orders of kinship, other levels of association, division of labor, and so forth. Put a different way, <clears throat> through making for ourselves and through remaking ourselves, we're always producing a very specific order of social and interdependent and cooperative relations. We're always producing a very specific order, one that is different in different times and places, something we know kind of intuitively, but Marx is reminding us that these different social um, and interdependent relationships are themselves generated out of the way that we are producing for our subsistence. And then he adds that a particular mode of production always bears a very particular combination of productive and reproductive relations, or of what we would call today economy and family. But Marx is trying to stay away from that language here as he talks about, for example, how slave economies or feudal economies or tribal economies or various stages of capitalism each have their own attendant kinship forms, association forms, forms of living together. You don't have tiny villages in, in advanced 21st century capitalism. You don't have big cities in the 8th century. You don't have primarily agricultural economies in this time and so forth, but you also have different family forms, different social forms, different state forms. And what Marx is also getting at here is that the mode of production, therefore, always expresses a very particular kind of interdependence or cooperation among human beings as well as a different order of family, society, and so forth. And you can see this very clearly. Um, I think I won't read it, but I'll just identify it for you. The, the last lines of the bottom of 157, he, he kind of ties all of this together, where he says, this connection of men with one another is ever taking on new forms and thus presents a history independently of the existence of any political or religious nonsense that would hold men together. So his point there is that what holds us together are these, uh, is the mode of production that generates particular forms of association and particular forms of state, society, including religion and so forth, and that we're not held together by beliefs. We're not held together by ideas. We're held together by this order of production that produces a world in which we all have some place. Now, so far, I've described it in fairly benign terms. It's not benign for Marx, but we're just trying to get at the basic precepts of materialism. OK, so to begin to get at the non-benign features of it, <clears throat> this mode of production that is so fundamental to history, to human beings, always involves, for Marx, a division of labor. So always a division of labor. We don't all do the same things. We don't all get up every morning and take care of every aspect of our existence, produce for all of our particular needs. We, we, we get up and we, we do a particular thing. We have a particular place in the larger order of a division of labor. And divisions of labor historically go through lots of phases. But the one that's really significant for Marx in chasing down the question we're trying to chase down today, which is where does ideology come from, the one that's really significant for Marx is the division of what he calls mental and material labor, or mental and manual labor. And you see this at the top of 159, the first full sentence. He says, division of labor only becomes truly, oops, only becomes truly such from the moment when a division of material and mental labor appears. Okay, so we have to ask 
why this is important. Marx is not concerned just with the question of the fact that you get a moment when some people are laboring and others are telling them what to do. That is significant, the bossing-bossed relation. But he's also trying to get at something else, something beyond just the, the moment when the act of conceiving something and the act of doing something are separated. He's also trying to get at the moment when mental labor is quite literally separated off from physical labor in the form of things like what we're doing here, scholarship, or religion, priests, a priestly class, or, or a shaman class, or uh, a, a, a pundit class, and so forth. What happens at this moment when mental labor, the practice of thinking, is separated off from the, from the order, is, is, is separate from, uh, in a division of labor, the order of actually producing for subsistence. Three important things happen at this point in the text. First, Marx says, mental laborers, who, like everybody else, see the world, have consciousness of the world as conscious existence, as consciousness of their existence, they will see the world or apprehend the world from a perspective in which they are conceptualizing while others toil. And that means, first of all, that things like religion and philosophy and politics and punditry, scholarship, will be elevated as the highest value for humankind. Aristotelian thought Marx takes to be a good example of this. Aristotle sees that the polis in the politics requires the work of slaves and laborers, but instead of conceiving that work as primary or fundamental, Aristotle formulates those who are free from toil, not women, not slaves, not medics, not the majority of the population, those who are free from toil as expressing the truth of humankind, the epitome of what humans are meant to be representing the real aims of humans and being that upon which everything else depends. So this kind of reversal is for Marx a perfect expression of this world that's inverted. Aristotle will make contemplative and political man first in the order of things and formulate thought that is free from necessity as the highest form of thinking. Okay, so the first implication of mental and manual labor being separated into division of labor is the elevation of uh, the effects of or the issue of mental labor um, as the highest form of humanity. But secondly, and perhaps most importantly for Marx, at this point, consciousness will flatter itself about its independence, his words. Consciousness flatters itself about its independence. Mental laborers imagine that they are freely thinking about the nature of the world, the nature of man, the nature of nature, everything else, rather than reflecting the specific historical circumstances in which they find themselves. And this point is really crucial for Marx. That when mental labor is separated from manual labor, what you get is mental labor, and this is all for him likely to be true across mental laborers, priests, intellectuals, and so forth, they will flatter themselves that they are getting at the truth of human existence or metaphysical existence or any other existence rather than simply reflecting the world, consciousness of the world that they are in, the mode of production that they are in, even if it's a distorted and inverted reflection. They will imagine themselves that consciousness and thought is independent of material reality. That it's something other than consciousness of existence. Precisely because it's undertaken by people who do nothing other than think, who are priests, scholars, statesmen, etc., and are sustained by the labor of others. And at this point, Marx says, ideas begin to emancipate themselves from the world. Not really. They're still reflecting the world. Marx will explain this is why you get liberal thought emerging at the time that capitalism is emerging and beginning to posit that all individuals are by nature um, competitive and self-interested and 
um, isolated from one another and so forth. This is why you get this kind of thinking. But the ideas will be presented as if they are transcendently true and not tethered to a particular historical moment because that's how they're thought by these mental laborers. So consciousness itself here begins to conceive of itself as free, universal, and independent, which is how Marx understands Hegel and the Hegelians. So idealism, with its premise that consciousness and thought and ideas create the world rather than the other way around, is a perfect expression of this. It, it combines the first and the second problem. The idea that consciousness, or that, that thought, is the highest form of humanity, and the idea that it's independent of any particular existence, both have the effect in, both, both take shape in German idealism as, as, as the conceit that thought itself produces the world rather than the other way around. But we need one more point to make this argument complete. Marx also says that the division between mental and manual labor corresponds with a division between rulers and ruled, between dominant and subordinate. So the upside down ideas of the mental laborers, the, the, the idea that um, ideas themselves are independent of material existence, <coughs> And the idea that ideas themselves are um, the highest form of humanity. These upside down ideas will become the ruling ideas of the age. They will become the ruling ideas of the age. They will become dominant. So here we're beginning to see just how ideology is starting to take shape. When the economically dominant class is also the politically dominant class. And is also the class that features mental laborers generating their ideas about the world. This combination means that the ruling ideas of the age will always be from the perspective of the dominant. Now, on some level, that sounds absolutely trite and obvious. Of course the ruling ideas will be from the dominant. But Marx is trying to say something less trite than the, than the phraseology suggests. He's trying to explain why you're going to get a systematic distortion in the representation of material reality as the ruling ideas of our age. Why it's not easy to see clearly what material reality consists of because mental labor has broken away from physical labor. There's been a division of labor there and mental laborers are reflecting on the world in a distorted fashion. As Marx puts it, the ideas of the ruling class are the ruling ideas of every epoch. And these are the ideas that will naturalize and justify the dominance of the rulers. They are ideas that themselves will justify the, the, the dominance of the ruling class as right or fair, or in the case of, of uh, the aristocracy, honorable and natural and religiously true, or in the case of capitalists, as simply being good for all of us as producing the greatest wealth and the greatest freedom and uh, the greatest benefit for all. So Marx says at the bottom of 172, skipping forward, leaving you on your own with a lot of difficult text, and I'm, your GSIs are going to help you with. Marx says at the bottom of 172, the ideas of the ruling class are in every epoch, the ruling ideas, that is, the class which is the ruling material force of society is at the same time its ruling intellectual force. And Marx adds at the top of 173, if you don't see the way that this phenomena has been generated, if you don't see that ruling ideas have been 
generated by the separation of mental from manual labor and that they are the reflection of the ruling class on society, on a historically specific society, but from their particular position. If you don't see that, you'll simply believe different ideas happen to dominate at different times, like once upon a time, people believed in kings and aristocrats and knights and so forth, but then somehow in the 17th, 18th century, people started believing in equality and um, competitive individualism. And what Marx is saying is that if you don't see the way that idea generation is itself materially produced and is itself a material reflection of the mode of production of a particular time, then you'll just imagine that you just have different ideas at different times or the world's just getting better because better ideas are emerging and so forth. Now, Marx adds one more important point here that we need. I keep saying there's one more, but now there's really just one more, um, which is that as history develops, ruling ideas grow increasingly abstract and general. Ruling ideas grow increasingly abstract and general. Why? Because, Marx says, the class that's dominating grows larger. If once you had a small class of masters or a small class of feudal lords, what you get as capitalism takes hold is a class that is larger than that. It's a class of capitalists, a class of those who own and control the means of production. And Marx understands this as a necessary feature of history as it's progressing, something I can't actually, don't have time to go into today, but which produces, as it were, a more and more general set of ideas about humanity. So there's no pretense in aristocratic ideology that everybody's equal and that everybody participates in the same notion of the human, as there is, for example, in the ideology that you get under capitalism, the ideology that you get in the last couple of centuries. Another way he has of putting this is that the nature of the revolutions that overthrow each mode of production, and each mode of production is overthrown by some kind of revolution, even if we don't always mark it as such. The nature of the revolutions that overthrow each mode of production, leading to the next one, happen on the basis of a broader and broader representative of society. So when an emerging capitalist class overthrew the political and economic order of feudalism, it was overthrowing the concentration of wealth and control and power and honor in the few for a larger bourgeois class. And Marx's anticipation is that at the moment that Europe, as he sees it, is now divided into two great classes, working class and capitalists, the final revolution will be the one in which what he calls the truly universal class, the proletariat, will overthrow the power of capitalism on the basis of the broadest idea of humanity yet offered, and the idea of humanity that is true. True why? Because it apprehends that human beings must produce for their subsistence. But finally, what he understands the proletarian revolution to do is to apprehend the idea that we can produce for our subsistence in a way that exploits no class that does not have a divided society, and that does not have a division between mental and manual labor, and doesn't have a division of labor in which some are exploited and some are exploiters, but finally anticipates a world in which we own and control together our mode of production, so that, in Marx's understanding, we can all be free together and each be free individually. So I packed a lot into that last little bit. 
but the point in terms of ideology <clears throat> is that Marx believes that this distortion of the world, this inversion of the world, the camera obscura that has prevailed until now, this idea that we see the world upside down because it's always seen by ideologues who are always the rulers, who are always justifying their rule, naturalizing their rule, explaining why the world is fair and free and equal or natural or true or whatever it is that they're explaining. Marx is always it, it understands that that order of things in which there's always that distortion, always that inversion, can come to an end when there is no longer any dominance to justify. And there's no longer any dominance to justify <clears throat> when there is no longer one class dominating another, when we all own and control together what it takes to produce our subsistence. And at that point, in a sense, We've returned at the end to what Marx said we were at the very beginning, which was a, 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 a people capable of simply having conscious existence of our world, only now we have it on a much more elaborated scale. In order to get to this place, Marx does believe there are some conditions that are essential. And one of the conditions that's essential is that what he calls the productive forces, the productive forces, the forces of production, have to be pretty highly developed. It has to be possible for us, finally, on a worldwide basis, in his view, to stop slaving for our existence. So he's really talking about a level of technological development and also a level of development of productive capacity at the level of um, Mm, we might call it, uh, we wouldn't call it information at that point, but we might call it uh, technological savvy and comprehension of how to produce for our subsistence. So there has to be a certain level of, of, of development of productive forces such that we can provide for ourselves without being completely enslaved to the business of providing for ourselves. So the picture Marx has is not one in which we are all slaving away together to subsist, but precisely the opposite, that we are able finally to conquer the problem of subsistence, requiring very little work, very little survival um, labor, and instead produce an order in which we are all free. You can get a picture of that freedom, just a little glimpse of it, on page 160. Here Marx says, he's describing how in the current division of labor, we are each forced, big paragraph on 160, to be a particular thing, to engage in a particular activity for our whole life. He uses a simple example in which you are forced to be, for example, a hunter, a fisherman, a shepherd, a critic, that is, a thinker, um, and you have to remain so in order to not lose your livelihood. And then he contrasts it to communist society, where he says nobody has any particular exclusive uh, sphere of activity. You can do them all. You can do any of them. It's up to you. You finally have not just collective equality and control and so forth, you also have that individual freedom, that ability to live beyond the question of subsistence and a mode of production that uh, requires your constant labor. Okay, let's see where we are, because I'm about to wrap up this account of the German ideology. What have we learned? Why do we think ideas govern history? Marx thinks he can answer this. Why do we think ideas govern history? Why do the Hegelians believe we're free, we're, we're made free or emancipated through ideas? Why, why is the modern constitutional state a state that frees us only at the level of ideas by proclaiming us free, by declaring that we are free? Marx thinks he can answer these questions because at this point he's explained that a ruling class will conceive of society based on its place in society, its stake in society, its perception of society. And it is essentially that ruling class perception, the perception of the bourgeoisie or the capitalist class, that becomes the dominant ideology of the age. 
So the philosophy of the state, as it appears in Hegel as Marx criticized it, and the actual proclamations of the state, you hereby are free and equal because I declare you so, because I see you all as equal, because I'm colorblind or gender blind or class blind or whatever else I am. These things that depend upon the conceit that ideas make us free have issued from the place of the dominant, the perspective of the dominant, where the bourgeois state really does embody freedom and equality, their freedom and equality. It's not the highest form of freedom, but it's the highest form for that class. And what Marx is saying is it's that camera obscura effect, that inversion of material reality that the dominant class is expressing in its ideology and that the state is also expressing in its ideology. The real side of freedom, civil society, is set aside in favor of the idea that the state makes you free because indeed the state has secured the rights, the freedom, the equality of the bourgeois class. It has essentially secured their power. That's the power that, that, that the, that the uh, bourgeois revolutions brought the state into being to secure. All right, so what Marx is suggesting is that the idealism of German philosophy is also an essential aspect of the modern constitutional state, this emphasis on ideas, this emphasis on belief. But if you start from material life rather than political and ideal realms, you'll find contradictions to this proclamation by the state and by ideology. You'll find unfreedom. You'll find inequality. Okay, let me just see if there's anything else I want to say here. I think that's I think that's where I want to end um, the discussion of the German ideology. I want to be able to go on to capital. So let me take your questions at this point, and then we'll go on to an introduction to capital. Let me just see what questions you have about what I've said or what I didn't talk about. Yes? What did you refer to when he says the central world? When he... Nature, because he basically nature and the central world are the same thing. Okay. The question is, what does he mean by the by sensuous existence or the sensual world? He's actually talking. He's he's using language that he got from somebody else, Feuerbach and Hegel, and he's really trying to refer to the world as we live it, embodied sensuously. And by that, he's not referring to sexuality. He's referring to our actual material existence as opposed to the world of consciousness, the world of ideas, which he thinks are split at this point. And he's really trying to figure out how do you, how do you pull them back together? So that's what he's talking about there. Other questions? Confusions? Yeah. So um, I'm a little confused because he explains it in this ideal communist future uh, where there's kind of a freedom from necessity Mm-hmm. Um, consciousness of one's own existence can be true, but then how does he like reconcile this with the like he's fighting against Aristotle's idea that like the politeia or or these other individuals that have a freedom from necessity can't be fully conscious of, of material existence? Okay, so try to do this. The diagram, which is always risky. No, I'm not. I'm going to try to do it with words. The picture that Marx has of history is one in which, for all of human history until his time, life has been a struggle to meet need and necessity. But what he is already beginning to understand about capitalism and what he will elaborate in a much richer fashion when we read the manifesto is that we have just about solved that problem. Because, and it's part of his admiration for capitalism, we have developed what he calls the productive forces to such an extraordinary degree. So while human history is the story of the struggle to master necessity or 
meet necessity. It has finally arrived at the, the moment in history when it can do that without so much struggle and toil. But there's a problem, which is that the current order of things, capitalism, has developed that capacity. It's developed those abilities in, in, in productive forces, in technology and in relations of production and in production processes. It's developed that capacity, but it hasn't developed it to meet human needs. It's developed it to generate profit. And so what remains to be done is to conquer that productive force, to take that extraordinary development of productive force and finally lasso it, as it were, for the collective good of human beings, not just so that we can produce fairness and equality <coughs> and equal distribution, but so that we can begin to live beyond simply toiling for our existence. So where are we? We've, we've, we start out with a, with a story in which Marx says, the materialist premise of human history is that we are by nature creatures who produce our subsistence. And at the end of that story, Marx says, but now we're ready to spring free from that nature. We don't have to spend all our time that way anymore. We don't have to do that. We have finally developed the capacity to make a world in which producing for our subsistence is a relatively small amount of our time. And we can begin to live, as it were, apart from that drive, apart from that nature, but only <coughs> if we reorganize the way in which the production for our needs is currently organized. So to answer your question in terms of Aristotle, he is on one level saying, you know, Aristotle got it right but upside down. He understood that there's the oikos and there's, you know, the need for labor and there's the need for producing for human existence and then there's politics and contemplative life and all of that. But what he got upside down is that he imagined that the polis was the, as it were, the presupposition of the whole and actually it's, it's, it's the realm of production that's the presupposition of the whole. But where he then parts ways, or where, where, let me put it another way, where he then comes back to the Aristotelian conclusion is that contemplation or realizing or, or, or actualizing human excellence in a free way is the ultimate good in, in human life. It's the ultimate value of human life. And for two, and, and for, for, for thousands of years, humans have been yoked to necessity and have been yoked to class society that has developed various forces of production to take care of necessity. But there is, as it were, and maybe this is your question, a kind of return to the Aristotelian conclusion, but through a different door. Ar Aristotle arrived at his conclusion by, by essentially concluding, hmm, slavery is necessary so that some human beings can be free. And Marx says, mm -mm, slavery is not necessary. We've produced, and neither is capitalism, and neither is any form of class exploitation. What we just need to do is harness these amazing forces of production for collective control and to produce for human need rather than for profit, and we're there. Does that answer your question? Okay. But to go to that ideal from where we are now, into production defining us and spring into that, where we're free of that, you believe that like, in revolution bringing that about, right? Not reform? So the question was Does Marx believe in revolution bringing about that ideal rather than reform? So the reason he can't see it as something that we simply evolve to is that there's, for him, that fundamental contradiction in capitalism is that you have an exploiter class and an exploited class. And there is um, no way that the exploiter class is simply going to say, oh, I see. We could live like that instead of like this. It's not going to give up its first class seat. Well, and we, Yeah, go ahead. But in terms of like seeing how, oh, maybe revolution is a brewing, so in order to accommodate some form of dissent so we can hold on to our power. Yeah. Maybe we give them some rights. Maybe they're ostensible rights, but they're some sort of Okay. Rights. So two things. One, there's no argument here about violent versus nonviolent revolution. Revolution can take lots of forms. And secondly, 
what Marx is also doing is looking back historically and seeing that all moves from one mode of production to another have been a kind of revolutionary upheaval. That is, they've always involved a new class supplanting the place of the dominant class in the previous um, mode. And the difference, he says, in this one is that everybody can be part of this new class. This is the first time in history that we can all be members of this class. It's the truly, he says in this text, it's the truly universal class because it's the class that um, has no exploited as its other. It's the class that simply reveals where we are with human history, which is that the, the, the human beings do labor to produce their subsistence, but now we can all be part of that, which means we all can own and control the conditions of our existence. So maybe rather than thinking about this as reform or revolution, think about sort of whether there has to be an excluded class, whether there has to be an other to it. Lots of questions now. So I'm going to go way to the back and then just come here. And let me just see what time it is, because I also want to introduce you to capital. So I just have to find a watch. OK, somebody tell me what time it is. OK, thank you. All right, so yeah, we'll, we'll take the question in the back. Thanks. No, according to, so you all could hear that, I assume, because I could. Um, so will the exploited class have to bring down the standard of living? Sorry? No, um, and, you know, it's not something that Marx talks about in detail, but what, he, what he's working out as a historical method here is the idea that this, if these forces of production are sufficiently developed, and if it is the case that you finally have um, the capacity to reduce the amount of time and attention that goes into simply subsisting, um, there's no reason at all for the as you're putting it, standard of living to drop quite the contrary. It would be a time when all of us could presumably, you know, do all kinds of things with our time and our inventiveness and our um, imaginations and our lives that have to do with other than going to work. So I know by standard of living you're probably referring to income, but for Marx the measure is... Um, whether or not you have to slave away, whether it's in Wall Street or in, um, in McDonald's, uh, for, for your existence. And what he's saying is, you know, this is finally freedom. So sure, you could, I mean, he's not, he's not so much adjudicating the question of income. He's, he's more interested in the question of whether a society could, in fact, free us all to do what we want in life. You don't get a lot of specificity in Marx about that question. Um, but I would say, uh, for Marx, the need to lower the standard of living simply wouldn't be there, because for him, uh, it's all about using those productive forces to generate things for our needs rather than simply for profit. OK, I'll take a couple more questions. And there's one right there in the back, and then we'll just swoop forward. So you, yes, the one who just looked behind you. Yes. Um, so um, so the that you need your level of has their production that is uh-huh yeah so Marx doesn't talk about that um, you know you're asking you're asking him now to be a modern economist and he's trying to give you a theory of history about class struggle and so forth and he just doesn't talk about that what he doesn't rule out is the idea of invention in fact it's quite the contrary he's 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 trying to imagine a world in which human inventive energies are released for all kinds of things, solving problems, creating art, um, do, you know, uh, whatever they're released for um, that aren't bound to one particular end, which is growth and profit. Yeah. Okay. Um, but he he. Yeah. Okay. So now I see what you're saying. Don't the uh, don't doesn't the that capacity to generate productive forces come from that separation? So what Marx does he doesn't say that because he's actually interested in the in the German ideology in the specific separation that has to do with 
a priestly class, an intellectual class, a political class, and so forth. He's not so much talking about a research class or, a, or a, uh, an entrepreneurial class. Um, he's really talking about these others that, that, have, that circulate the dominant ideas. That said, um, you know, Marx is not against a division of labor. He, he's, he's against, I mean, what he's, what he's against is class exploitation. So he's not even arguing that in communist society you would bring an end to the division of labor. You would in, bring an end to private ownership and concentration of wealth in a class that um, extracts that wealth, as we'll see from Das Kapital in his view, view obtains that wealth through the exploitation of labor. So he's not, he's not actually arguing that there should be nobody sitting around just thinking up new ways to, I don't know, produce better computers or um, better speakers or um, you know, whatever it is. He's not, he's not against that. Or, or better ways to, um, to, to stem global warming. He's absolutely not against that, but he, he is trying to figure out the relationship between the division of mental and manual labor and its production of ideology that in turn keeps us from being able to see the world clearly, that keeps us from being able to apprehend how material reality works, how history actually produces us, how we are actually made out of the world of, of production that we ourselves also make. So that's, that's what he's after there. Right here. Green shirt. Yes, you. Um, how about uh, an idea of emancipation of women from uh, the relationship with men and uh, their sort of enslavement by men? I mean, he kind of admits that there's an ultimate division of labor that can't be yeah. divided, but ultimately, doesn't he not exclude that women may be emancipated from that relationship? Okay, so this is really complicated territory. I'm trying to think. I might postpone this question until Thursday. Um, yeah, I'm going to postpone it till Thursday because we're reading the manifesto and he, he, he offers his account of how to, um, of, of why women will be emancipated by communism in a way they can't be prior to communism there. And, and I want you to just bring your question right back then and remind me that I said I would answer it. OK, last question. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay, um, I know a question about one of Marx's claims. He says that the ideas of the ruling class right now can popular ruling ideas. So how would you respond to a comment from someone like Toto who describes like a situation where sometimes there is a division between the forces Yeah, great. Uh, like, when you're talking about the Native Americans, he mentions how when the things like the Mizrahs take over Rome, or when the Mongols take over the Chinese, there's still a difference between individuals who are in charge of productive forces and political forces and individuals who are in charge of creation. That's great. So, Marx just doesn't give you an answer to that question. And it's a really important criticism that he doesn't have an account of a division, in this text certainly, of a division between different so-called components of the ruling class, and he doesn't have an account of, of intellectual differences um, across, say, the political orbit, the economically dominant orbit, and so forth. He's, he, he, it's too, it's, his account is too crude for that. He just doesn't, he doesn't help you. OK, there was one last question up there I'll take. Where did it go? Somebody who I said I wouldn't. Yes, you. Sorry, this is um, this might be like off topic from other questions, but how, what's Marx's take on other countries in general? Because it feels like if ruling class or is trying to hold on to their first citizenship status, and if that arises from material reality, it probably does not explain any form of algorithm on the part of ruling class. Okay, so he doesn't have anything to say about altruism, but I'm going to convert your question a little bit, okay? And I hope that I don't take it too far from what, what you're saying. It's not that Marx can't conceive of somebody intellectually apprehending that justice is where, that justice lies somewhere other than their own material location. He can conceive that. He is that. He's, he has a bourgeois background. He's not rich, but he has a bourgeois background. He himself and Engels 
and, and other people he hangs out with are critics who are not simply perceiving reality from their place. So it's not that rigid a formulation. What he is, though, arguing is that a class <coughs> develops both its investments and its attachments for the most part by virtue of its place in the mode of production. That doesn't mean it will hang on to them ferociously. And maybe in some ways this even goes back to your question. There could be right and left versions of hanging on to your class position. You could be terribly guilty about it and terribly philanthropic from it. You could be terribly reactionary about it and say, I got here on my own and everybody else should. You could, be, you could, you could have you know, different takes on it. But what Marx is arguing is that at the level of historical development, what you have never seen in history is a whole class just look around and say, wow, this is unjust. I guess we really shouldn't be aristocrats. Forget it. We're, it just give all the stuff away and get, abolish all the rules that make us into And you've never seen that in the history of capitalism. It's not that you haven't seen moments of give and generosity and what you're calling altruism, but he's interested in understanding what, what makes um, history move, what challenges it, and what representations distort it or more accurately re reflect it. So the, the reason I had to convert your question is he, he can't answer, he doesn't answer it directly. He's not saying there is or there isn't altruism or there is or there isn't selfishness. He understands human affect and human, human subjectivity and human attachments to, them, to be themselves historically produced. So he's never going to say we're by nature selfish or we're by nature altruistic or we're even by nature cooperative. We are made those things through the mode of production in which we find ourselves. And within that, there will be some variation. It's the best I can do. All right, I want to introduce you to Capital because I think it will help your reading of what will otherwise seem like an antiquated economic text. And it's not. It's a, an adventure story. What do we got? Yeah, we've got seven minutes. I can do that introduction. Okay. So Marx begins this work that you're going to be reading for Thursday. Almost apologetically. He begins with a recognition that it's going to strike the reader as somewhat labored and somewhat difficult. Look on page 295. So on page 295, which is the preface to the first German edition, Marx says... That every beginning is difficult holds in all sciences. So he's, he's trying to get you ready for the fact that this is going to be hard going and, and maybe even not so interesting at first or seem that way. To understand the first chapter, the one you're about to read, especially the section that contains the analysis of commodities, will therefore present the greatest difficulty. He says, the value form, whose fully developed shape is the money form, is very elementary and simple. Okay, so there's something elementary and simple here. Nevertheless, the human mind has for more than 2,000 years sought in vain to get to the bottom of it. Whilst on the other hand, to the successful analysis of much more composite and complex forms, there's been at least an approximation. So there's something about the value form, for the question of value, why things have the value they do, that we can't get at. Why? And why is it easier, he's asking, to get at some really complicated scientific things in the natural sciences? He says, because the body, as an organic whole, is more easy of study than are the cells of that body. In the analysis of economic forms, moreover, neither microscopes nor chemical reagents are of use. OK, so we can at least use microscopes, and, and we can use the tools of biology and chemistry to get at difficult to see and complicated things in physiology, biology, and chemistry. But here, it, he says, the force of abstraction must replace microscopes and chemi 
chemistry and so forth. And then he adds, but in bourgeois society, the commodity form of the product of labor or the value form of the commodity is the economic cell form. That's the thing we have to get at. What's he saying? He's going to try to get at the most basic cell units and structure of political economy. And he's going to try to do it in a way that doesn't just parallel nature, or parallel the science of nature, rather, but is going to embark on a specific science of society. Capital, this work, is going to try to explain systematically and at the most basic level the truth about capitalism, just as physicists find the truth of motion and biologists find the truth of organic compositions. But the key tool for this work, he's warning you, will be abstraction. What does he mean by abstraction? Now, crucially, it has two different valences for Marx. Abstraction, remember, appeared very negatively when he talked about the abstract human being in the Jewish question, or abstract man, or abstract concepts. Here, he's really talking about pulling things out of context, and as you do so, losing the very contextual meaning and content of the thing. But now he's speaking more positively of the force of abstraction. And he's doing so to reach for a a way of talking about the necessity of departing from a certain kind of facticity and order of appearance to understand how things really work. Now, we know enough Marx at this point to know why he might have to do this. What does he have to understand? We don't know all that he's going to find in capital, but we know already from the German ideology that we are historical beings and that we enter into a mode of production in a particular moment of history. But that doesn't appear to us, and that doesn't appear on the surface of things. Things don't jump up and announce themselves. I'm in this mode of production and I'm in this moment of history. We have to get there through the abstract conceptualization of that problem. (laughs) Similarly, Marx is going to have to, in order to understand the true workings of things, get beneath their superficial appearance. His repeated critique of the other economists that he's reading, Ricardo, Smith, etc., Malthus, is that they take the world they see of private property, of wages, exchange for labor, of profit, and all that. They take it at utterly face value. They don't ask, where did this stuff come from? Where did, where did labor come from? Where did profit come from? What's their relation? How do they constitute one another? What's the process that through, by, through, by which they come to be? Processes are precisely what you don't see if you just look at the world of things, if you just look at things on the surface. And he is trying to tell us that the answers to these questions will not appear on the surface. We, 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 they won't appear simply by assembling all the facts. The connections, rather, will be in invisible relations that we are going to need theory to apprehend. Now, fortunately, bourgeois economics, neoclassical economics, the economics you learn in the economics department here has to tell you the same thing. They, they tell you, you know, you, you have to do pretty heady economic theory to get at the reality of the economy. Marx is going to have a different kind of theory, but he's reminding you you're not going to see this stuff on the surface. So abstraction from facticity and everyday appearance is going to be the potent tool. Marx is going to begin with the question, what is a commodity? What is a commodity? Why? He starts here. This is the last thing I want to tell you today. He starts here because he knows that commodities are the currency of capitalism, that capitalism's ability to turn everything into a commodity, an object for exchange on the market, is one of its most salient features. And... He begins here because the commodity he most wants to understand, labor power itself, requires that he understand the commodity form first. So 
That's just to get you launched. I'm going to let you go now. But Marx is starting with the question of what is a commodity, what makes a commodity, and what makes the commodity labor power. And we'll pick this up on Thursday. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Okay. Um, heaven knows why it's louder today. Okay. Um, a couple of things before we start. Please note the announcements on this side of the board. Um, there's a speaker a student wanted to call your attention to. I just call your attention to it up there. Um, people have asked me a lot about making announcements in this class. And I, I, if it were a smaller class, I, it would be fine. But what I find is once we start with announcements, um, it just burgeons and takes up more and more of our time. And so you're welcome to write things. Um, announcements up in this corner, and um, this particular talk is by a, a political philosopher, so relevant to our work. I want to call your attention to this. Um, I had your paper assignment ready for today, and then the copier jammed. So uh, it will be on B Space. I'll bring you a hard copy, but I'd like to be able to talk about it on Tuesday. <laughs> Sorry, let me just get this turned down a little more. So um, I'd appreciate it if you would read the topic before you come to class on Tuesday, and then I'll hand out hard copies as well. So just make a note. It'll be up tomorrow. And I believe, is Nina here? The Bentham reading will also be up tomorrow? It's up now. How about that? OK. So that's your reading for um, Tuesday. Um, we move from, Bentham, from Marx to Bentham and Mill. OK. Um, we have a lot to cover to finish Marx today. So I'm, I'm going to be working through a couple of pieces of um, capital and then moving on to the manifesto. Is that too loud? Yeah, a little bit. It's hard to know. It's not just battery power. We have something else going on with the mic. OK. So um, last time, we saw Marx beginning with the problem of the commodity in capital. And I said that he starts here because he knows that commodities are, as, as he puts it, the currency of capitalism. That is, the capacity of capital to turn everything into a commodity for exchange is one of its most salient features. And of course, as I said last time, that's even more true now than in Marx's own time. There's literally nothing that can't be commoditized. Um, and uh, all you have to do is know something about the financial markets these days to know that um, there's no process, no idea, no, no um, human experience, um, not only at the level of knowledges and cares and so forth, but also at the level of debt and risk that can't be turned into a commodity. But Marx also begins with the commodity because of what he wants to get at, which is the relationship between labor and capital. He wants to understand that relationship. And he knows that labor itself is one of the most important commodities for making the whole system of capitalism works. He tells us repeatedly that until labor power can be bought and sold until labor power can be exchanged for a wage. You can't get capitalism going. Put another way, for Marx, capitalism requires the ability to buy labor power freely on the market, have labor power exchange itself for a wage. And that, in turn, requires what he calls a double kind of freedom for labor, a double kind of freedom for labor. And I'm just summarizing what I hope you've read. The double freedom is this. On the one hand, a worker has to be free to sell herself or himself, his labor, her labor, for a wage, which means that that person can't be bound to a feudal lord, can't be bound to a master. The labor can't be an indentured servant, it has to be able to dispose of its own existence, it has to be free in some sense. 
The second kind of freedom that Marx says is required for the whole system to get going is that the laborer has to be free of having any other means of subsistence besides selling its labor for a wage. That is, the laborer has to be free of the capacity to take care of herself or himself unless that person sells their labor for a wage. So there's an irony in here, obviously. He's talking about a freedom to be able to dispose of your labor as you wish, to be able to sell it for a wage, not be bound to a feudal lord, not be bound to a slave master. And on the other hand, you have to be free of any other means of providing for yourself. But the reason he emphasizes these two kinds of freedom is that they are what's at stake in the enormous transformation of Europe that is going on in the transition from feudalism to capitalism. That is, the transformation in European political and economic orders involves both a release of labor from lifelong bonds to a particular feudal lord or sub-lord, and it also involves depriving labor of its own means of subsistence. It also involves things like the enclosure movements, forced migration of labor to cities. So what Marx is getting at here is that the transformation, the social and economic and political transformation of Europe in the 16th, 17th, early 18th centuries is precisely one that produces this double freedom, produces the laborer's ability to sell itself for a wage and produces its freedom from being able to provide for itself. Okay, so Marx wants to get at the specific commodity labor power, the, the, the capacity to sell your labor as a commodity. And to do so, he first has to divide the nature of commodities, get at the nature of commodities, by dividing them into what he calls exchange value and use value. Exchange value and use value, two different kinds of value. He starts with use value. Well, let me, let me first put, put the matter this way. He, he starts with use value and, and, and suggests, look, the use value of a commodity is just literally its use to me. Like a pen is useful for writing. A coat is useful for staying warm. It's direct, it's tangible, it's visible. That's the use value of a commodity. But what Marx says, and shares this with other political economists of his time, is that that use is not the form that things take on the market. They don't take the form of their use value when they appear on the market. Rather, they appear in terms of their exchange value. How much is a thing worth? That's what we ask when we want to go buy something. How much does it cost, or how much is it worth, or does it cost too much for what it's worth, and so forth. So what Marx wants to know is, what's the relationship between use value and exchange value? What's the relationship between use value and exchange value? And he joins other economists in saying, look, they're not related, except for one thing. The labor that it takes to produce the commodity. What gives something its exchange value which as the book goes on, Marx will just call value. So whenever he says value, after he's introduced the distinction, he's talking about exchange value. What gives something its exchange value is the amount of labor required to produce it. Or as he sometimes puts it, the amount of labor congealed in it. Now on some level you know this intrinsically. That is, a silk jacket is not inherently more useful than a polyester one, but costs more. Why? Because of the amount of labor, including growing the silkworms, cultivating them, extracting the stuff from them, etc., than a polyester one. A silk jacket is not intrinsically more useful than a polyester one. Gold, we could even say, is probably not intrinsically more useful than iron, but iron's easier to get at. The labor involved in producing each, Marx says, is quantitatively different. And that's what gives things their exchange value. Something of use that requires no labor at all, and Marx offers air as an example, 
we hope that continues to be true, will have no exchange value. Of course, that's not true in New York where you can buy air rights, but we'll leave that aside for right now. Okay, so what Marx is offering here is the beginnings of what he's going to call the labor theory of value. It's not his invention. It actually comes from Smith and Ricardo. Ricardo is the one who really gives it the name, classical political economist. And what they're all seeing is that labor is that which generates the value of something. And there's a social, what Marx calls a socially necessary amount of labor for any particular product, a socially necessary amount of labor that depends upon how much labor is required given the technological and other productive developments at a particular time. So a lot of labor might go into cultivating potatoes if you have no farm machinery whatsoever, and it might take much less labor if you have a lot. So there's a socially necessary amount of labor at any particular moment in history and development. Now, all the economists of Marx's time, as I said, have a labor theory of value, but Marx is going to push the labor theory of value a little further than the others because he's going to see labor as not just that which generates exchange value, but that which generates capital itself. I'll say it again. For Marx, labor doesn't just generate the exchange value of a commodity. It's going to generate capital itself. Okay. So just to recapitulate, all the political economists, Marx included, he's learning from them, agree that what gives a product its exchange value is the amount of labor involved in making it, or the amount of socially necessary labor in a thing. But Marx wants to go further and say, what what allows labor to actually generate profit, and perhaps what allows profit itself to generate this thing we call capital? In other words, Marx is not going to take capital as a pre-existing thing in the world. He's rather speculating and then eventually trying to prove that labor itself generates capital. So let's see how this goes. What Marx's question here is, is, is what happens in the process of a capitalist employment of labor that ends up generating profit for the capitalist at the same time that it likely impoverishes the worker. That's Marx's real question here. So to get at this, we have to focus on that specific commodity that I said Marx is interested in, the commodity called labor power, the thing you can go and sell for a wage. You go offer it when you go apply for a job somewhere. I'll give you my labor, you give me a wage. Marx says, in one important way, the commodity labor power is different from other commodities. In one important way. It's the only commodity from which value can be extracted while it's being consumed. It's the only, put another way, it's the only commodity whose use value, using it, is a source of exchange value. But in many ways, Marx says, the commodity labor acts just like every other commodity. Its exchange value, how much of a wage you can demand, is roughly determined by what it takes to produce it. Let me say that again. The the exchange value of labor is roughly determined by what it takes to produce it. What does it take to produce it? Food, shelter, provision for children, to replace it, training, etc. In other words, a certain amount of socially necessary labor is necessary to produce the commodity labor power. A certain amount of socially necessary labor is necessary to produce the commodity labor power. And that's what the capitalist has to pay for when he buys labor power. And I'm keeping him a he because Marx does. But we certainly have plenty of female capitalists. Now here's the key. Here's the key point that Marx is going to make about labor power and its relationship to generating capital. So the, the capitalist buys labor power, exchanges a wage for your labor power, 
But key is that the capitalist can extract more labor from the worker than is required to reproduce the worker. The capitalist can extract more labor from the worker than is required to reproduce the worker. Let's say that maintaining and reproducing labor power, feeding, sheltering it, training it, educating it, providing for its children, and so forth, let's say it requires five hours of labor. But the capitalist has the worker work for eight hours. That means the worker is producing more value than the worker actually reaps. And Marx calls that extra value surplus value. That's what the capitalist gets. So the secret of capitalist accumulation and the secret of generating capital in the first place is the extraction of surplus value from labor, essentially requiring more work from the laborer than is needed to reproduce the commodity labor power. That extra work is what becomes the source of profit or capital. Okay, so let's just go over this on a really simple scale so that you just get Marx's basic point. The basic point is, is, is going to be elaborated into a much larger theory, but we need the basic point. Someone's working for you. They're, they're cultivating chickens on your land for you. You tell them to do that. You pay them in chickens. Not only all the chickens they need to eat, it's not an option to be a vegetarian with this example, but all that they need, well, actually it is, all that they need to exchange with others in order to acquire what they actually want to eat, say, vegetarian cuisine, and clothing and shelter and food, possibly education, medical care, etc. So you have them cultivate chickens, you pay them in chickens, but they cultivate more chickens than you pay them, because you just pay them what they need to survive, and you keep the rest. That's the surplus. That's the source of profit, and in Marx's view, the only source of profit. Now, this also means that the more you can get them to work, the longer you can get them to work, and the more productive you can get them to be, let's say through machinery that produces um, the capacity to um, feed the chickens en masse or to clean their coops or something like that, the more surplus value you can extract. But of course, at the same time, the more surplus value you can extract because the more you can get them to work and the more productive you can get them to be, the cheaper will become the commodity, the less socially necessary labor time is required for it, but also the cheaper will become the commodity labor power. Both require less socially necessary labor time. Both have their exchange value reduced. So what Marx sees is that developments in technology and any other developments that increase productivity will be the fundamental drive of capitalism. Because it produces ever greater sources for profit, it ever cheapens the commodity labor power, and it produces ever greater incentives for new possible developments. And here Marx, in addition to having identified what he takes to be the fundamental exploitation of labor that generates surplus value, also identifies what he takes to be the fundamental dynamism of capitalism. It is, as he will say, in capital, but also in the Communist Manifesto, constantly renovating the means of production, constantly developing new technologies and new tools that increase productivity, decrease socially necessary labor time, and produce new possible domains of of profit. This is the dynamic that, in Marx's view, makes capitalism so spectacularly innovative and productive. No previous economic system, in his view, has been so capable of developing the means of production at such a ferocious pace. And for Marx, as I already hinted last time, there will be a great benefit in this. Despite his critique of the system of capitalism as a whole, which we'll get to in a moment, 
he, he's in profound admiration of the capacity to develop productive forces, productivity, innovation, and so forth, all of which he thinks help set the stage for a new order of things, one that is not based on selling yourself for a wage, one that is not based on extracting surplus value from the worker in order to generate capital, one that is not based on alienation, degradation, and producing stuff that human beings or the planet doesn't need, but rather one that is, as he puts it, a more rational economic system. But before we get there, he is, he is in a state of appreciating, admiring, and thinking as, of, of, of capitalism as absolutely historically necessary to generate these fantastic productive capacities. Okay, so what we have so far is Marx's labor theory of value. There's much more to the, to, to, to the argument in capital than this, but I wanted that one front and center that explains how it is the capacity to sell labor power for a wage and convert it into um, a commodity and exploit it for its capacity to generate more value than it is actually provided. What Marx has done, in his view, is shown you how capital is actually composed of the exploitation of labor. So the claim that Marxists make that labor is exploited is not a mere moral claim. It's a systematic economic claim about who's doing the labor, what the labor is generating, and what the capitalist reaps. Now, I know a lot of you have lots of questions about what about the capitalist, capitalist investment and what about land and so on and so forth, but we'll hold those for right now. Because what we need to ask now is, if Marx is right, or if he thinks he's right, why is what he's discovered not obvious to the everyday observer? Why does capitalism appear as a system of exchange in which everybody is simply buying and selling in the marketplace, including their labor, but why isn't it obvious that there is systematic exploitation of labor and labor power to produce capital and that all profit and all capital itself is generated through the exploitation of labor, through the generation of surplus value by labor. Why doesn't capitalism appear on the surface of things as a, as a system of power and exploitation? Why does it appear instead, or commonly get represented as, a, 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 an order of fair exchange and equal opportunity? Why does it so often appear as a system in which Riches and poverty are a matter of mere luck or mere skill, being in the right place at the right time, having the right invention, um, having the good fortune of family or something like that. Put really strongly, why, according to Marx, do we need science and the power of abstraction to get at what he calls the cell form and the truth of a system? Why can't we just see it? So now we want to turn to mystification and why mystification is part of the material order of things. And we're going to look at two different problems. We're going to look at commodity fetishism, and then we're going to look at what Marx calls the, the, the difference between the realm of appearance and um, the, the realm of production, or the realm of exchange and the realm of production. Commodity fetishism I'm going to treat way too briefly. I think some of you are delving into it more deeply in section. Um, it's an extraordinary little piece of what you read uh, for this week and worth going back to. It's just, you know, seven, eight pages, and there's something really amazing going on in there. So let me try to just take you through a little bit. Starting on page 319, and I will be reading a little bit from the text, but it's up to you whether you want to read with me. Starting on page 319, Something in the very feel of the book changes. Here you've been, you know, with MCM and commodities and linen and weed and Mr. Moneybags and this and that, and, you know, you've either been following it or not, but all of a sudden Marx writes the following. A commodity appears at first sight a very trivial thing and easily understood. 
Its analysis shows that in reality it is a very queer thing, abounding in metaphysical subtleties and theological niceties. Now, we know Marx has a hefty critique of metaphysics and theology, so what's going on here? Marx is telling us in this sentence not just that commodities appear metaphysical or religious, but that their reality is that they are metaphysical and religious. So what's Marx saying? Marx believes that the commodity form, so necessary to capitalism, so, so fundamental to it, is also one of the most crucial sites of its mystification. The commodity form is one of the most crucial sites of the mystification of capitalism. It's one of the reasons we can't see what's going on. Why? What are commodities? Let's remember what they are. What Marx just told us, what we just learned, is that they're basically congealed labor. He often uses that phrase. Sometimes he calls them dead labor. You kind of know this if you've ever been concerned with, say, uh, sweatshop products, and many of you have been at one time or another. You kind of know that when you get those incredibly cheap clothes from Sri Lanka or Bangladesh, that you've got on your back, and, it, and you literally sometimes feel like you've got it on your back. Sometimes you can handle it, sometimes you can't. But the sweat, the labor of highly exploited workers. So what Marx is trying to bring to the fore is that all commodities, all commodities, are nothing other than what he calls congealed labor. They are the effect, the result, the, the issue of labor labor converting particular materials into objects. But how commodities appear, remember, how they appear is simply that they have some exchange value relative to other commodities. So whether you're picking through the peaches at the farmer's market trying to find a good one, or whether you're trying to decide whether to get one kind of smartphone or another, and you're just thinking about the prices of them, we see their exchange value as their natural value. Or we see their value as determined by our desire for them or by their scarcity. But we don't see their value as generated by labor. We just don't. It's not how we see them, and Marx knows that. The way he puts this, I'm actually, I think, not going to read it right now, but let me just give it to you in, in, as to look back at it. Page 320, the very bottom of 320 and the very top of 321. It's worth really looking closely at those passages. What Marx says is, when we see commodities, when we encounter commodities, we think about them in relationship to one another or in relationship to money. That's how we think about them. We don't see the source of their value. We don't see labor power in them. What Marx says is, this is a form of fetishism. We fetishize commodities as objects of value unto themselves or as objects of exchange value. Now, let's remember what a fetish is. It's actually really interesting and complicated genealogy, but we won't go into all of that and etymology. A fetish is ordinarily, it comes to us from religious discourse, something thought to have magical powers something we invest with power, and which, therefore, inevitably prevents us from understanding the real source of our investment and experience. So we fetishize commodities, he says. And one reason it's so hard to see commodities and their value as congealed labor in capitalism, one reason that we fetishize them, is that labor in capitalism is social, that is, it's in connection with other human beings. We're not each laboring to produce something on our own. It's interdependent, but it's not directly cooperative. We don't have the experience of directly engaging with one another to produce a particular good and knowing how much time goes into it and therefore, as it were, what it's worth. Rather, Labor in capitalism is everywhere mediated by commodification. So, when commodities are exchanged in the market, 
we don't see our social relations, our interdependent labor, in them. We don't see our labor encountering another's labor. We don't see our wage, our labor, encountering another's labor. We see a thing. We see the thing that we can buy with the wage for which our labor itself was exchanged. We don't see labor everywhere. We see commodities everywhere. Marx calls this fetishism. Now, there's several levels on which fetishism is important here. The most important is that, for Marx, the fetishism of commodities, just seeing commodities in relationship to one another, seeing them in terms of their exchange value, not in terms of their labor congealed labor. Most important is that, is that fetishism hides the actual source of the value of a commodity. It hides the, the congealed labor in it. But Marx also hints at, and it will take others to develop this point at greater length, that commodities capture our desire in capitalism and, in a sense, keep us enslaved as they do so without revealing the source of the enslavement. Now, Marx was only talking here about ordinary commodities. He talks about bricks and pots and things like that, other necessities. But today, of course, we live in a world of commodity fetishism that's extreme beyond anything Marx possibly could have predicted, where not only the object is fetishized, don't you love your new iPhone, but the brand is fetishized. Apple, Nike, those are the easy ones, Gucci, Prada, etc. And and that's how the fetish of the brand works. You you know that on some level jeans are jeans. I mean some fit better than others, but you know that the thousand dollar brand name isn't really better than the two hundred dollar knockoff. You know the Nike swoosh doesn't really make you jump higher on the basketball court. And you know even that Harvard is just a name, dare I say it. But you also know that the real Prada bag, you know the real Prada bag, is not really distinguishable to most people from the knockoff. But it's still the real thing. I have things to say about UC Berkeley as a brand as it's put online in China too, but I'm not going to go there right now. I'm happy to go there later. Okay, the point is that today the function of fetishism is so enlarged, fetishized commodities is so enlarged compared to what Marx identified. What he was trying to identify was just the extent to which fetishism of commodities mystifies the real source of value in a commodity, what really generates value in a commodity, but also enslaves us to its magic. Okay, so that's one reason we don't see capitalism for what it is, because of the fetishism of commodities. And and again, I I emphasize some of the magic brand stuff, but that's not Marx's point. I just added that in so you'd kind of catch it. But what Marx is really trying to get at is just that we fetishize commodities as objects in relationship to one another rather than as labor in relationship to one another. That sentence won't work grammatically. Rather than as as relations of, of dead labor, congealed labor. But the second way that capitalism is mystified, the second reason we don't see it clearly for what it is, according to Marx, has to do with two different orders of, and this is going to be very similar to what we saw in the Jewish question about state and civil society and where reality is. Two different orders of reality, what Marx calls the realm of exchange, or the market, and the realm of production. Call it the factory, call it wherever labor power is actually extracted, and where surplus value is actually generated. Now what Marx says is most economics, all of what he calls classical economics, or bourgeois economics, is entirely occupied with the order of the market. It just hangs out in the order of the market. And Marx literally takes you on an adventure, as he puts it, to go past the sign that says no trespassing and past the place where Mr. Moneybag says you can't come in here because it's private, to go into the realm of production 
And that's where you're going to see that extraction of surplus value. That's where you're going to see the worker working for more hours than the wages actually um, represent in terms of, of remuneration for that labor power. That's where you're going to see the elements in capitalism come to exist in the first place. In other words, as long as you stay where commodities are simply bumping into each other, as they do in the realm of exchange, you won't see the social relations of capital because the social relations of capital happen in this realm of production. So as I said, it's akin to what he's saying about the realm of the state and the realm of civil society. Everything looks free, fair, and as he puts it, in the order of Bentham up here, and everything down here looks rather different. So as long as you just stay in the place where the worker comes to the marketplace and exchanges her or his wage for um, the capitalist ability to use the labor power, it's all going to look free and fair. But you won't see up there what makes capitalism work, what reproduces it, and where its dynamism and power lies. You'll take the capitalist, the laborer, and the merchant as pre-givens rather than understanding how they come to be in the first place. So you have to descend into that other realm, what he calls that hidden realm, to get at this knowledge. Put another way, recall that Labor power, he says, is the only commodity that produces, both, that produces exchange value through its consumption, when it's being used. So what Marx wants to do is follow that commodity from the place where it sells itself for a wage into the place where it's consumed, where it's used. And if you look on page 343, here I think I will just read for a second. <clears throat> you can see him literally describing this process. I'm 343, about six lines down from the top. He says, the consumption of labor power is completed, as is the case of every other commodity, outside the limits of the market or the sphere of circulation. So he also calls the realm of exchange the sphere of circulation. Accompanied by Mr. Moneybags, that's the capitalist, and by the possessor of labor power, that's the worker, we therefore take leave for a time of this noisy sphere. He thinks, I mean, he's literally describing a sphere up here where it's all noisy and market-like and it all looks like everybody's just buying and selling, or as Smith put it, trucking and bartering. We're all doing the same thing. Some are poor, some are rich, but we're all doing the same thing. So we're going to leave this place where everything takes place on the surface and in view of all men. So he's saying this realm of circulation, realm of exchange, realm of the market, that's, that's in view of us all. That's clear. It's on the surface. We're going to follow them into the hidden abode of production on whose threshold there stares us in the face no admittance except on business. And here we shall see not only how capital produces, but how capital is produced. So we're not just going to study the realm of capitalist production. We're going to see how capital itself is generated. As he concludes, we shall at last force the secret of profit making. Now, there's a really important epistemological claim here. And let me remind you, epistemology refers to a theory of knowledge. There's an important claim about how we know what we know. And it is that for Marx, in unequal societies, in unfree societies, in alienated societies, which are all societies up to the point of true equality, true freedom, in unequal, unfree, alienated societies, power will not be manifest on the surface of things. There will only be ideology and mystification up here. Power is always something of a secret. And the truth of human existence is always to be found beneath the realm of appearance, the realm of the everyday. That realm is always going to disguise the truth. That realm is always going to make exploitation look like fair exchange. It's always going to make alienation appear as freedom. 
It's always going to make systematic subordination, someone who has nothing to sell but their labor power, it's always going to make systematic subordination appear as equality. So Marx's argument here is that it's in the very nature of inegalitarian, unfree societies to hide their workings. Is this paranoia? No, it's a systematic theory. I mean, there might be some paranoia in it, but let's see what the systematic theory is. What he's arguing is not that human existence and human power as such are always mystified, but that when power is unequally distributed, when there is class domination, when there is an exploiting and exploiter, exploited class, where there's inequality, it will not appear to the naked eye because ideology and or fetishism, and they're not quite the same thing, ideology and or fetishism will disguise these things. And we already learned from the Jewish question and the German ideology some of why that's true. The ruling class and its ruling ideas are always what prevail. They're always going to invert the true nature of society. They're always going to see things upside down and so forth. But conversely, this means that for Marx, when production, when producing for our existence and the world making that goes with that, is finally collectively owned and controlled, when it's truly shared, when there's not a world of exploiters and exploited, when there's no private property or capital generated out of a surplus value, when there's just production for human needs, when we're just producing for need, not for profit, or put another way, when there's only production for use value, when all of that is the case, at this point, relations will be transparent to us. There will no longer be this mystification and fetishism or ideology. You can see this very clearly if we look... Um, actually, I'm just going to read it to you. It's on 327. It's the middle paragraph. Marx says, the life process of society, based on the process of material production, does not strip off its mystical veil. It does not strip off its mystical veil until it is treated as production by freely associated men, consciously regulated by them in accord with a settled plan. So the picture he has is once we all are really in production together, once we are not exploiters and exploited, once we are really deciding also what to make, how to make it, and um, what we need, and so forth, when it's a settled plan, then there's no more need for mystification. So when we take the process of production fully into our own hands, when it's not organized by a system that is out of everyone's hands, and Marx is clear about this, it's not like the capitalists have much control. They're driven by that imperative to keep cheapening the process, of, uh, the, the process of production, to keep looking for new markets, to keep searching out new sources of profit. They're as driven by the system as everyone else is. But when the process of production is finally fully taken into human hands, when we own it and control it and direct it according to our deliberative capacities, then the mystery dissolves. It's over. There's no more, there's no more occasion for the kind of mystification that we have just been studying. So let me put this another way and finish the point. Marx is saying history has always been driven by the human capacity for production, to produce a world, produce for ourselves, and as we produce for ourselves, produce a world. And there's lots of different kinds of production, modes of production. But this capacity, up until it's seized by us, has always dominated us. We've never been in control of it. We've always produced for ourselves, but it's dominated us in various systems. And the task, the challenge, he believes, in the middle of the 19th century is finally to figure out how we can dominate it, how we can control it, how we can decide um, how human beings should live on the planet rather than being run by systems that are humanly generated but not in human control. 
Okay, that sets the stage for our final point in thinking about capital, which is the question of freedom. What does Marx mean by freedom and capital? What is freedom for Marx? I know I'm pushing fast, but I want to get through Marx so that we can get on to the excitement of Bentham. So, as we get ready to turn to the Communist Manifesto, which will literally urge us to reach for our freedom, concluding with the idea that we have nothing to lose but our chains, we need to ask, what is freedom for Marx? What is true human emancipation now that he's become a political economist, now that he thinks he understands what material life really consists of? Well, one answer, the one we've just been working on, is that it pertains to the realm of production. It has to do with producing a world with others in a way that we control. Getting rid of the subordination, the alienation, and the exploitation in a mode of production, and instead finding a way to produce that allows us collective freedom and deliberation as what Marx calls rational beings, rationally producing for ourselves together. So it's about sharing and owning and controlling together, abolishing the privatization of the, the, the um, benefits of production or the wealth generated by production and the socialization, as Marx puts it, of labor. So he believes labor is already socialized. It's already massified. There's already mass amounts of, of interdependence in labor. And then there's a private appropriation of wealth. So it's abolishing that and socializing ownership. Now, in a small way, this notion of freedom, freedom as collective ownership and control, being in control of the conditions of our life, in a small way it relates to Tocqueville's understanding of freedom. How? Well, remember, Tocqueville did not simply have an idea of liberty as doing what you want. It was rather, in some degree, about the capacity to control your life or govern your life with others. So both Marx and Tocqueville, to a degree, seem to have a notion of freedom at odds with a kind of conventional liberal notion of doing what you want on your own as your own private individual thing. It's not just private or individual liberty. It's freedom as control over existence, as, 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 as sharing with others in the experience of power. So freedom is always exercised with others. It always requires others. It always involves a certain interdependence with others, because that's who we are. That's how power works in human things. We're free together, or we're not free at all. OK, so that's one, one dimension of freedom in Marx. But in your reading for today, little section from volume three of Capital, there's something else. Marx draws out something else. And it appears on page 441. Marx here has been talking about how it's important for something I already mentioned, productivity to develop in society. He's been even praising capitalism's, what he calls, civilizing effect in producing ever higher rates of productivity achieving more and more in less and less time, making it less and less necessary for us to work all day long just to survive. Why is this so important to him? Why is he carrying on about it? Why, if it's our nature, according to Marx, to be beings who produce for our subsistence, why don't we just find a form through which we produce our subsistence freely, and then even if it takes all day, we're free, if we, if we can find a form in which we do it with one another rather than exploited. And exploiters. What's the big deal? Why is Marx making such a big deal about re reducing the amount of work time necessary for meeting our needs? Why does that matter to him so much? Well, now let's turn to 441 and see the answer. Marx says about 10 lines up from the section that starts classes, and it's about 10 lines down from the top of the page. Freedom in this field, that is the field of addressing necessity, we're, we're addressing needs, we're addressing human existence, 
can only consist in socialized man, the associated producers, rationally regulating their interchange with nature, bringing it under their common control, instead of being ruled by it as by the blind forces of nature. Okay, so far, this is just what we've already said. This is, freedom is going to involve um, bringing into our common control, instead of having it rule us, we're going to rule it, our, our interchange with nature, our production for our necessity. And then he adds, and achieving this with the least expenditure of energy and condi- under conditions most favorable to and worthy of their human nature. So he wants us now to do this with as little energy, sounds like my teenager, as possible. I think, I'm just thinking about every day I say, why don't you take your shoes upstairs? Why should I? I'm just going to come back downstairs and use them. And they're you know, always on the stairs where I'm tripping over them. Okay. You all had the same way of torturing your parents. Okay. <laughs> Achieving this with the least expenditure of energy. That's always his claim. Why, why use that energy that way? I could use it for sleeping. Okay, let's get back to the point. But <laughs> it, he says at the conclusion of this section, it nonetheless still remains a realm of necessity. Beyond it begins that development of human energy, which is an end in itself the true realm of freedom, which, however, can blossom forth only with the realm of necessity as its basis. The shortening of the working day is its basic prerequisite. So what's Marx saying here? There's freedom in collectivizing ownership and control of production. That's a prerequisite, but so also is producing our subsistence with as little work time as, necess- as, as possible. Because true freedom exists beyond necessity. Why? Because that's where human individuality, human energy, human creativity, human blossoming happens. So here we have in Marx two dimensions of freedom. Both necessary. You can't get rid of either one. Neither is possible without the other. Humans can't be free unless you get rid of alienation and exploitation and, and, and systems, economic systems that dominate us instead of us dominating them. You have to get rid of the ways in which we are controlled by systems like capitalism. But That's not the end point of our freedom. We have to control the conditions of our existence, but there's a free way to organize the meeting of necessity. That much he's making very clear. But that free way to organize the meeting of necessity is still bound by necessity. And you can think about this in a very simple way. If you're just taking care of yourself and your fellow campers on a backpacking trip or something else. You're taking care of the food, the sleeping, the this and the that. You're still taking care of necessity. You can do it by sharing equally, by having a great time, et cetera, et cetera, but you're still taking care of necessity. What Marx is saying is only beyond necessi- the necessity, <laughs> the only beyond necessity are we then doing the truly human thing, the truly human thing, which is to express our creative capacity. Presumably this would be the world of arts, of sciences, of inventions, whatever miraculous, uniquely human things human beings do. And he's not, I think, just talking about sleeping. I think he's talking about um, all the ways that we invent and create and have capacity um, to do things like no other animal does that's beyond simply taking care of ourselves. So here there would appear to be a different kind of human history than, 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 than one that is simply bound to need or bound to our crafting of the world through our productive capacities. A world after necessity, a freedom from necessity. Okay, this makes our transition to the Communist Manifesto because what Marx is really doing is making a brief for communism that is several fold. The brief for communism, the case for communism, is first of all that it's non-exploitative, it's egalitarian, and it's rational. And all three are important to him. 
It's non-exploitative, egalitarian, and rational. It produces for human need, for human beings, not for profit. Secondly, it signals the end of humans being dominated by their need, by productive capacity. That's what we just saw in this passage. It signals the beginning of our mastery over our, our production for ourselves, our subsistence, and the release of us for other things, all of us, not just the few. Put another way, thirdly, it emancipates human beings for the first time in history from the realm of necessity to pursue other things. Now, to see this really richly elaborated, we're now going to turn to the Communist Manifesto. So I'm going to take the last hmm, 10, 15 minutes here um, to, to just work through a bit of the manifesto. I know I'm taxing you today, but we're going to finish Marx. Okay, obviously the manifesto is in many ways the easiest of Marx's writings to read. It was written for a public. But it's also easy to misunderstand. You need, in a way, the backstory of everything else that we've done in order to see what Marx is saying in the manifesto. He's, he's condensed and popularized a good deal of what he's done at much greater length in the other texts that you've looked at. How does he begin? He begins with the sentence, a specter is haunting Europe. The specter of communism. A specter is haunting Europe. It's an interesting beginning because with it, Marx and Engels, they wrote it together, are suggesting that the presence of communism, this, this taking of the productive forces of capitalism and now genuinely collectivizing and sharing them, the presence of communism, they're saying, is a ghostly one that's already occupying the present. And on some level, they're literally referring to all the communist agitation and, and socialist parties and so forth that are beginning to develop. But what Marx is also getting at is this theme that we've seen before where a revolutionary force is a harbinger of a, of a yet unrealized potential in the material world. A potential that has to be brought into being, but it's also somewhat inevitable. It's already pressing on the present and the future. A specter, remember, is not the work of an individual or a party or an idea. It's a presence. It's an existence. It's a condition as well as a promise. It's a present as well as a future. So what makes this specter? Well, in four pages, the first four pages, Marx outlines his whole theory of history in a very synoptic fashion. What makes this era unique? What makes this moment in time unique, that it, at the moment at which he and Engels are writing? He says, first of all, that while there's always been class, and the his, history of all hitherto society is the history of class struggle. Class antagonism in his time is simplified into two great hostile camps. So from all the complicated classes of feudalism and other societies, we now simply have capital and labor, or as, however you want to put it, bourgeoisie and proletariat, capitalists and the working class. None of the complex stratification of previous ages. Just owners on the one hand and laborers on the other. And then Marx moves into what he takes to be the extraordinary achievements of capital. And here, you cannot fail to appreciate in the Communist Manifesto what Marx is offering in the way of his sheer admiration for what capitalism and what he calls the bourgeois revolutions have accomplished. First, they have, and I'm just summarizing from 474 through 478, so I'm just going to kind of dot this through. They've established what he calls a worldwide market with immense development of navigation, communication, and, and networks of commerce. Secondly, capitalism has, in what he calls its scarce 100 years on Earth, 
destroyed every class handed down from the Middle Ages. It's destroyed every class handed down from the Middle Ages. The same thing Tocqueville's lamenting or kind of commenting on and kind of celebrating about the, the destruction of the aristocracy, but also all the guilds and the rest of it. There's barely a trace left of those old classes, merely 100 years after their political defeat. Moreover, he says, capitalism has put an end to all feudal patriarchal idyllic relations. That is, there's nothing left of the sentimental sensibility and sentimentality of the old regimes, what he calls the ties that bound man to his natural superiors. And you can see this accounted in a very lyrical fashion on page 475. Okay, so that's some of what capitalism has accomplished with regard to the very recent past, but there's, but there's much more. On page 476, let's just take a brief look at some of the language that Marx offers here. We're going to go to paragraph four. Marx says, the bourgeoisie cannot exist without constantly revolutionizing the instruments of production and thereby the relations of production and with them the whole relations of society. So what he's getting at is this way in which capitalism constantly transforms the way production occurs and with that the relations that it produces and with that all social relations and we know this we know that we're this generation is barely recognizable given what's developed technologically commercially financially it's barely recognizable to its grandparents era that's that's what marx is getting at that constant revolutionizing of production that in turn revolutionizes all social relations he goes on conservation of the old modes of production in unaltered form was the first condition of existence for all earlier industrial classes. So, so it used to be just things were conserved in their old form. Now they're being undone all the time. Constant revolutionizing of production, uninterrupted disturbance of all social conditions, everlasting uncertainty and agitation distinguish the bourgeois epoch from all earlier ones. And then this is one of the most oft-quoted passages from the manifesto. All fixed, fast frozen relations with their train of ancient and venerable prejudices and opinions are swept away. All new formed ones become antiquated before they can ossify. It's the idea that just as fast as new relations and new, uh, n- new forms of production take shape, they'll be uh, revolutionized again and sent packing. And I don't need to tell you all this because you know this about capitalism. And then he concludes. All that is solid melts into air, all that is holy is profane, and man is at last compelled to face with his sober senses his real conditions of life and relations with his kind. So the bourgeoisie, capitalism, never stays still. It's on the move. It's transforming the world all the time. It leaves nothing untouched. It's uninflected. Nothing's uninflected by its force. And it essentially produces for us all the time the reality that economic life drives us. We know that. We know that's what's transforming the world as fast as it's being transformed. And that we are constantly in a relationship with, as it were, the marketplace. That that's, that, that's what our dominant form and attention goes to. In the next paragraph, he emphasizes something that's also become familiar to us, but it's important to remember this is 150 years ago, namely globalization. So not only is capitalism constantly um, changing relations, changing forms of production and so forth, it also nestles everywhere, settles everywhere. It's not not even that globalization is, is limited to economic relations. It also affects culture. As Marx says, there's no possibility anymore of local culture or local literature or local production. There's world literature and world production. So he's emphasizing the integration of economic life as that which then integrates peoples and cultures. Moreover, Marx is not critical of this. He calls all this civilization. At the top of 477, he says, capital draws all, even the most barbarian nations, into civilization. What's its power to do this? Why? How does it move like this? Well, Marx says, the cheap prices of its commodities are the heavy artillery with which it batters down Chinese walls. 
the cheap prices of its commodities are the heavy artillery with which it batters down all Chinese walls. Here's Marx recognizing capitalism has become more important than any other force on earth, including artillery, um, in, in knocking down borders and boundaries between peoples, nations, etc. Not only is capitalism a wall mover, a boundary crasher, it's also a people mover. He says it gathers up the dispersed and it homogenizes populations. Above all, Marx sees it as an engine unparalleled in raw power. Now note, in addition to Marx's absolute awe at the accomplishment of capitalism, what he's attributing to its power. It's not just a mode of economic production. Economics never is that for him. It is economic production, but it's making a whole world. It's creating all social, political, cultural, and personal relations. It's making everything. It's creating global order. It's reorganizing the population. It's producing forms of government and value and family and so forth. So that's what a materialist history reveals. It reveals that what's made this last hundred years, as he puts it, is not ideas about equality or liberty or universality or democracy, but the unleashing of unparalleled, unprecedented productive forces, a capitalist mode of production. Okay, so we got all this amazement at this power and appreciation of its extent, what's his objection? Why doesn't he like capitalism? Well, we know there's some exploitation, but let's try to get clear now what the brief is for communism. First, it's important to say that one of the things he makes clear on 478 is that he just thinks capitalism is not sustainable. And when I said capital, the book, the, the, uh, the, the text that we were reading, is both a treatise on how capitalism works and also how it doesn't work. We didn't look much at that second point, but a lot of what Marx is doing in the three volumes of Capital is also explaining what the contradictions are in capitalism that will make it blow up of its own accord. And you also see this put in a very synoptic form in the manifesto itself. Like all class-based economies, he thinks capitalism contains contradictions an imperative to expand that turns against it and will do it in at a certain point. He names these things overproduction, underconsumption, various kinds of realization crises. You don't need to know all of those. What we need to know is that Marx believes all class societies finally have contradictions in them that will make them give way to new forms. It's summed up in the phrase on 478, the conditions of capitalist society are too narrow to comprise the wealth created by them. So that's point one. But that's not really a, a political or moral objection to capitalism. He just thinks it's going to come into crisis. Secondly, capitalism for Marx, as powerful as it is, sacrifices all human beings and all human endeavor to the imperative of capital, which is to profit. Now, he doesn't think that's a mean-spiritedness on the part of capitalism or capitalists, but that's just the way the system works. That's what makes it work. That's its imperative. You can't step off the train. Capital can't cultivate things that won't advance survival in a competitive marketplace. And that also means, for Marx, it can't protect non-commodified things. It will commodify everything. There's nothing it will leave alone. There is nothing it won't package and sell. And we know this, as we today have ethical anxieties about um, human organs that are extracted from people so desperate that they have nothing left to sell other than their livers, or rhinoceros horns in Africa that are valued for their supposed healing abilities that are making the rhinoceros extinct. What Marx 
objects to here is not that capitalists are mean or bad or greedy, but that capitalism by nature is a system driven by profit, for profit. Its imperative is profit or die. And that it can't protect things that perhaps we would say can't or ought not to be commodified, and it can't do things on behalf of people or the planet that are incompatible with that imperative. So Marx's complaints against capitalism, and I really want to underscore this point, are not that capitalism is simply a system of unequal distribution of wealth, that there's rich and poor. He he does have that (coughs) problem with it. But above all, he refers to man on page 479 as an appendage of the machine, reduced to a commodity bought and sold in the workplace, and everything that capitalism touches as reduced to a commodity bought and sold in the workplace. There is nothing about human work in Marx's view in capitalism that can finally be, that, that, that allow the worker especially to be treated in terms of values that have to do with dignity, humanity, and treating yourself as your own end. As he puts it, there's no other nexus between man and man than naked self-interest, than callous cash payment. Capital, I'm quoting him, resolves all personal worth into exchange value. And it's important to see that for Marx, this isn't just true for workers. He's particularly attentive to the exploitation of workers, manual laborers, factory workers, workers of his time. They're going to experience the extremes of capital's construction of destitution and alienation, But for Marx, all work, all endeavor is constructed in a way that has to do with alienation and ultimately degradation of the task. Why? How does this go? For Marx, the working class, and I'm drawing from the top of 479. This is the last real point I want to make, I think. The working class is defined as, and I'm quoting him, a class of laborers who live only so long as they find work, and find work only so long as their labor increases capital. So the working class is a class of laborers who live only as long as they find work, and find work only so long as their labor increases capital. These laborers are a commodity like every other article of commerce, and consequently are exposed to all vicissitudes of competition, all fluctuations of the market. That's from 479. So the key to being what Marx calls proletarianized under capitalism is the need to sell your labor to capital in order to live. Key to it is asking the question, what have I got that I can sell? Now what you can sell might have nothing to do with what you value, whether you're producing widgets in a factory or designing marketing plans for a billion dollar corporation. The point, Marx says, is that in capitalism, you work to live and you work under conditions and producing a product that capital needs, not according to whether what you or others really value. Moreover, Marx reminds us, what you can sell here today might vanish, might not be needed by capital tomorrow. So a changing market can leave you out in the cold, whether you're a Detroit auto worker or a Wall Street banker or a PhD in philosophy. If one of these industries transforms or just casts you off when downsizing requires it or globalization relocates, you have your job only to help capital accumulate more capital. You will lose it when when that ceases to be the case. So to be a worker in capitalism, according to Marx, means that your job never has intrinsic value. We may say that it does, but its value is determined in relation to capital. It's developed by it. It's shaped by it. It's potentially destroyed by it. And if I had three more minutes, which I don't, I would explain why even a job that looks like it has intrinsic value, that looks like I got off the train, is in danger right now of being put online precisely because the university is being privatized and corporatized. I can't go there. So think more generally of HMOs today that employ doctors, 
corporations that employ scientists, even doctors and scientists have less and less and less control over their work, its character, its permanence, its future than any previous epoch in history. Okay, I see that we must go. We won't get the grand conclusion. We'll just leave it there. I'll see you Tuesday for Bentham. Please take note of this and please read the paper assignment before you come on Tuesday.